trial or the day before trial, but basically the night before trial, saying that Mr. Bruno intends to provide his mental health experts with additional materials. We find that very troubling and inappropriate because the, the expert's opinions have been given literally almost four years ago in their reports and to have them review and consider other matters at this late date would result in them, we would be entitled to a report, a supplemental report, and we would be entitled to, if necessary, if felt it necessary, to obtain the services of our own expert. We have not done that, and that should have been apparent over the many years this case has been pending. That was a decision made based upon the law and the reports that we received. And to cut to the chase, we have never meant to, nor do we intend to contest that Mr. Ryan King suffers from what is determined to be a severe mental illness. It's the second part of the 501 TCA 3911501, the insanity defense, the wrongfulness. And one of the reasons we gave your honor the report so you could review it and see what was coming, but it was just a, a brief excerpt. We intend, expect, and intend whether the defense calls him or the state does. One just for a young little thing, Dr. Kobach, on October the 2nd, 2018, in his written report, says his mental state at the time of his charges, i.e. at the time of the commission of the offenses, is looking more and more like he had an appreciation of the wrongfulness of his criminal actions, but was acting out of revenge. And there is not a compelling basis for lacking appreciation of the wrongfulness, so on and so on. With that, state's position is defense cannot prove by clear and convincing evidence, so on and so on. But if we are here at the morning of trial with experts being allowed to be provided additional materials, then the trial essentially cannot go forward if your honor allows that to be done. And I will say we met, we, all six attorneys, I guess I should say six out of the seven attorneys, met with Dr. Wood on January 11th. The six of us got together, met with her, discussed. January 11th. January 11th of this year. This year. Yeah, 2022. Out at her office. Dr. Brown was also there, Dr. Kimberly Brown. And it was discussed at that time with counsel, we thought, agreed, that no experts would be provided any additional materials without the agreement of both parties. And that was done, that has been done. And we found that with Dr. Eisen had not reviewed all of the materials that had been sent to her some years ago. And again, we agreed that that was fine, it was between the parties, that she could go ahead and review the ones that she omitted or did not consider prior to giving her report, doing her written report. None of which are on this list? Correct. They're referred to as they're going to, intended to be provided to Dr. Wood. I believe that's referenced the journal. That's what we call it, the journal. But there are quite a few entries there. General Norman and I met with Dr. Kovach January the 12th at his office for a couple of hours. So apparently they do not intend to ask Dr. Kovach to review anything else and certainly understand why. But that creates a significant problem. And as you can see from General Norman's email, once she and I discussed this last night, it's like, Mr. Bruno, please hold off until we can present this matter to the court. We want this trial to go forward more than anyone can imagine. 
I'm sure the court does as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And <clears throat> we want it to go forward, but it being a fair trial for the state of Tennessee and a fair trial for Mr. Ryan King, we feel like we have done everything in our power as required by law to give Mr. Ryan King a fair trial. But here at the last minute, bringing this up, and this was something that could have been discussed, I submit, last Monday when we filed the motion in limine, which was directed essentially to this area or a couple of motions in limine up to get anything out of the way that could be a problem, you know, the Wise case, which says, you know, be a good idea to meet with the judge and go over everything. Well, we were here. And counsel stood up and says, we have no problem, we have no objections, we intend to follow the law and don't have a problem with it. So we forge on ahead, pick the jury, and there's no mention until last night. The defense saying the following videos may be played. That, I submit, is perhaps another issue which goes into Rule 703, if the experts have viewed them, then we get into all of the, whether it's admissible, uh, the court would have to do a screening process about that. If they intend to just play these, I guess we'll have to see how that works out, but they would have to be relevant in the statement by a party opponent, if that's what we get into, there's all sorts of evidentiary issues before we get to that of them just saying, well, Judge, we're popping, you know, popping in another video. And it has to be relevant to a contested issue. And we're talking about, I, think it, I don't know if you can correct me, but my impression is that all of these <coughs> videos were created prior to the commission of the offense and not on the date of the commission of the offense. So they have been in existence for years. They have been known to counsel, I would submit, for years. Uh, this is, uh, you know, as far as being a non-contested issue, to the extent that, that would go towards whether he was suffering from a severe mental illness, it may require the jury out here when we get to that point. But more concerning is that when he says Dr. Wood and Dr. Eisen will be provided copies in the morning. I would ask that if the defense feels that this is something that is so important to their case to have the doctors review these when they've had years of opportunity to do that, that that would result in either or both preparing supplemental reports. And then we get into, like I said, to start with, all of that issues. We needed to bring this to the court's attention, obviously, before the jury is sworn. Because this impinges on the state's right to a fair trial, Smith, and should not be allowed. And with respect to Dr. Wood and again, the contested issue part of the severe mental illness, the schizophrenia, Dr. Wood, and this was also part of the motion in limine, as your honor knows from reviewing the report, deferred the insanity evaluation on June 12, 2018 to MTMHI. So she, I submit, cannot now testify about anything dealing with that. She deferred the opinion on that that's in the record of the documents provided to your honor. And so insofar as giving her any information, we think that would be, again, irrelevant unless they're going to try to have her, again, do a supplemental report to address an issue which she deferred. So for all those reasons, Smith, that none of this should be allowed and we can deal with the playing of the GoPro things as that comes up because the state's not gonna do that in our case in chief. But uh, just to be on notice that we would object to any of that 
coming in. Uh, obviously, they have to lay a foundation, so on and so on. But the more concerning part at this moment is, are the experts going to be allowed to supplement their knowledge and or information? And if so, the state's entitled to a supplemental report and review of that and not swear the jury until that is done, however many days, months, weeks that might take. May I have a moment, Your Thank you, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Bruno. So, Your Honor, I appreciate Mr. Moore's position. But there was one thing that was never mentioned in his statement, and that is anything dealing with the law. So I'd like to start mine out with the law. Rule 703, basis of opinion, testimony by experts, says the facts or data in the particular case upon which an expert bases an opinion or inference may be those perceived by or made known to the expert at or before the hearing, which would be the trial. So the expert can testify about anything at or before the hearing. The expert can come in here, watch this entire trial, and anything that comes up in the middle of this trial can be used if it's relevant to their opinions when they take the stand, they can discuss it. There is no rule that says that there is a direct cutoff of when an expert can be supplied with information and except until they basically finish their testimony. Quite frankly, an expert can be on the stand and can be shown something that they've never seen before uh, and ask them if that would affect their opinion one way or the other. So the, the law, that's what I'm basing my argument on, states that we can give them this additional information. The information that we want to provide to the expert is that there's a number of videos that basically come from two sources. There, a majority of them come from electronics that were seized uh, from Mr. Ryan King's uh, apartment. Okay, so it's in discovery. The state's had it, this is not being new. There are some that had, were downloaded off of YouTube by a man named Gene Fletterer, who is, uh, my understanding, Mr. Ryan King's uncle. And so, and he's a witness, uh, and a potential witness in this particular case. The videos, uh, in a nutshell, basically are videos of Mr. Ryan King uh, videoing himself and discussing what's going on in his mind and his head and his paranoia, things along those lines. It's basically delusional type stuff that would support schizophrenia, for lack of a better word. So that's the, sub the subject of it. There's a journal that Mr. Ryan King had typed prior to the arrest, fairly lengthy, that was provided uh, by the state to Dr. Eisen, who's the expert for MTMHI. It was not provided to Dr. Wood. So that's the, the, the journal part of this would go to Dr. Wood. These are items that could directly uh, impact their uh, opinions in this particular case, one way or the other. They can get it by us providing it to them, just like we could provide anything else over the past four years to them for them to consider. Alternatively, and I think it's much more inefficient, they can both sit here in this front row during this entire trial and watch evidence come in, and we can, assuming it's admissible, play videos and stuff along those lines, uh, and they can factor that in. So there's nothing that, that's inappropriate about us continuing to provide something. Quite frankly, I could, if something happened today in this trial that would affect their opinions potentially, I can provide it to them tonight. So I, I don't, there is, the law is on our side with the disclosure. Now, when it comes to um, this agreement, the agreement was not, I will ask the state for permission about what I can give to the experts. The agreement, it, both sides wanted to know everything that the experts had, okay? We didn't wanna, we wanted to know everything that they reviewed. The agreement was if one side sent something to an expert, we would let the state have the copy. Or they, if they sent something to an expert, they would let us have it so that everybody knows what the experts have. There wouldn't be any backdoor 
giving the experts information that the other side's not aware the expert has in the, in the case. So but, at this, but at this stage of the game, and I understand your 703 argument, but at this stage of the game, isn't it sort of backdooring? It's not backdooring because we, we it, as we're prepping this case, and we, as we continue to go through stuff and what might be coming in evidence, what we might want to be putting in evidence, is we click something that thinks we think might be a, a, you know appropriate for them to consider in their in their testimony, then we can give it to them. Just like if we sit here in trial, let's say Wednesday something happens in this trial uh, that is relevant, we're going to send it to them. Why wasn't the material provided earlier since it was available earlier to the experts? We, we hadn't. It, Quite frankly, we hadn't gone, there are so many videos in this case, we hadn't gone through all of the videos and then narrowed it down to what we thought might be most relevant until last week and this weekend. That's why yesterday we finished our discussions over what we thought might be most relevant uh, to their information, to, to what be most relevant to their opinions in the case. The state has had, almost all of them the state has had, so that it's not like they're not aware that they exist or, or the substance of them. But it's, it's an, I mean, what is your position on the state's argument that if this material, and I have no idea what's in it, I mean, you, yeah. you gave me a summation has to deal with uh, possible delusional behaviors or thought processes before this event that brings us here today. That's what I know about them. Uh, what about the state's position that you know, we prepare for trial based on this is what the experts are likely to testify to, and with the addition of this, it may change their arguments, and we may want to get our own rebuttal expert. I, I don't know how the substance of it is. Uh, so let's we'll start with this. All those materials, okay? What Mr. Moore was referring to, and I think made the statement somewhat to the effect, they go to a non-contested issue, in his opinion, which is schizophrenia, okay? If it's a non-contested issue on their end, I don't know why they would need to run out and get another expert. Well, uh, because I don't think the issue in this case is that he has a severe uh, mental disease or defect. It's the concept, it's what, if any, effect that had on his behaviors on this occasion. Yeah. Right, so that's why I don't think there's a need to go out to get a rebuttal expert because those issues would go towards the schizophrenia issues. That's contained. There's a, there's a couple that are in close in time couple of weeks before or so the incident it gets closer in and so but a majority of them are things that happen over a period of time uh, but but, there, but again it goes to uh, it, it's an issue dealing with more more towards the schizophrenia that part of it so if it's a if it's generally a non-contested issue why would they have a need to go get a uh, another expert that, that, there's no need to get a rebuttal expert if they're not in effect, contesting that, that part of the issue. Then what's the need to even bring them up at this stage of the proceeding? Because we have a burden of proof. But if it's... But I, I, it seems like you're talking out both sides of your mouth. It's going to an uncontested issue, but we need it to prove our uh, insanity defense. Okay, I'll give you this example. We're not disputing that Travis Rankin went to Waffle House, shot, killed four people, and injured two other people, okay? Can we just have an agreement the state doesn't put on any proof of that because we're not disputing it? It's uncontested. You know, if we want to go down to if it's not, not contested, then we can get rid of a lot of their proof because it's not contested, and we might be done with this trial in two days. That would but, be wonderful, but that, that's not a reality. But, but the, it's the same thing for us. We have a burden, and even if they're not going to contest it, we have a burden to put on our proof. So are you suggesting that whatever is in these, and again, I have, have no idea, uh, whatever is in these videos, journals, whatever the case may be, will have no bearing whatsoever on the ultimate issue in this case as to whether or not he could appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct? There... I want, to, I want to be real exact about it because... Uh, that's what I'm trying to get to, exact as possible. He thinks, in, in, so in the videos, okay, he thinks that people are after him. He's paranoid of the government. He's paranoid of the police. He's paranoid of certain people, okay? 
that feeds in to the, to the appreciation of wrongfulness because that's generally what's going on. But most of it is going to be, they're going to basically see the video and see this guy's not right, okay? But there is language about people hacking into his phone and, and, and doing things to him, and that, along with other evidence that, this, that the experts have, that might go to you know them saying he was thinking people were after him, uh, and so that might go towards that problem to some extent. Because th there's, there's, uh, and so I couldn't, and, and quite frankly, the experts, uh, there's a couple of videos that that's already been provided to them by Mr. Wing, it's not an issue, but they haven't looked at the other ones. So, but our belief is that the primary thing, because most of this stuff happens substantially before the Waffle House incident. These are things that he's going through in Colorado or, or, or Illinois or, or things like that. But then some of it does get close in time to where he's talking about his paranoid thoughts. Um, I, I don't, don't recall, and they can correct me, if there's anything on there that specifically says people at the Waffle House. There, I don't remember if there's any of that on there. But, so, I mean, I guess it could lead over into this, you know, into this paranoia. Uh, and, and so I guess the experts might say, well, that just further supports their position in the case. All right, thank you. Very briefly, I did reference the law rule 703, but with respect to expert reports that we are entitled to, that comes, of course, from the state of Big Reed. Very familiar with Reed. Yes, yes. My sir. colleague mercilessly went through that for many years. Yes, yes. <clears throat> so that's what a reference supplemental report can't just say, oh, the state's called unawares that when you've been given some other things and this does now enhance or here's why I have a belief even more strongly in opinion that he could not appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct based on these videos that I've viewed. That is, and, and yes, uh, with respect to Rule 703, facts or data otherwise inadmissible should not be disclosed to the jury, so on and so on. We get into that only after if they are allowed to supplement their understanding and their materials we would be entitled under state degree to a supplemental report not be essentially uh, caught unawares or sandbagged by having an expert on the stand who has reviewed materials and is changing perhaps their report their opinions without us having an opportunity pre-trial that's the key before the jury is sworn pre-trial to evaluate that therein lies the problem mm -hmm. you know, i disagree that there is a continuing every time they get something new have to do a supplemental report if that were the case they're, if they're sitting in here and tomorrow these videos come in and they say that would affect our opinion they don't have to go back to the office and do a supplemental report so that's not where we're at with this and it, what if we're on cross-examination they get shown something they've never seen before would that affect your opinion do we stop and they go do a supplemental report no so that's not there's the supplemental report thing is not the issue in the case okay they can consider up until they finish testifying anything that's presented to them that, that the court allows to be presented to them they can consider that but I understand that part of the argument but I'm still a little bit concerned that all this material was has been available for years and was not presented to these experts uh, I mean you know I mean rule 16 on the discovery rules certainly suggests that that is the, the, the pro appropriate procedures to follow during discovery. And I, you know, I understand that an expert can sit in, listen to testimony, and go, I had no idea about that, or I didn't understand the significance of that, or just how, you know, no one ever told me these 
statements were made or conduct uh, exhibited on this particular occasion when this incident occurred that they didn't know and it reasonably would not have been expected to be presented to them. But when you're, you're talking about a significant amount of material that obviously could influence an expert opinion why it wasn't provi uh, provided much earlier under rules of discovery. What they hear during the course of the trial and things that may come up during the course of the trial or immediately leading up to it, I'm not disputing they might be able to, uh, that they could possibly rely on under, under 703, but when you have all of this massive amount of materials that has been in existence forever and wasn't provided to them, I don't think that is the same as what you're arguing here. I agree that things come up during the course of the trial that may influence how an expert looks at things and are not required to go back and type a report. But when they have ample opportunity to review and consider thoroughly, fully, and as a part of their reports that are required under Rule 16, why it wasn't done? Why is it just now coming up? This isn't something that they're sitting in trial and they might hear and they go, oh my gosh, I didn't know about that. I, I need to change my uh, thought process. So I don't know if it's a Rule 16 issue because that's our obligation to give things to the state, uh, that, that, that discovery things to the state. I don't think that's the obligation that goes towards what we have to provide an expert in advance. So let's say the court's going down this road. Then in the middle of the trial, if we get these videos in, in the evidence at that point, uh, then I don't know of any reason why an expert can't look at it at, at that particular time. Now, what that's going to do potentially is they have time to look at it. So what that might do is as they come in and then we tell the court we want to give that to the, to the expert, you know, they have to have time to review it. You know, and what I'm trying to do is cut that off, give it to them today, so that when it comes time for them to testify, they've reviewed it. So I, I don't, I, you know, the, the, I don't think 703 prevents us from giving them additional information of whatever we find. If we continue to go through discovery or files or whatever else, and we find something else that we think is relevant to our issue, we can give it to them because they haven't testified yet, and that's all we're trying to do with it. And it also makes things more efficient. So I think rule seven. Well, it'd been more efficient if they had it three years ago, I rather than the morning of trial. I agree with that, but but they didn't, and so but nevertheless, rule seven hundred three allows us to provide the information. It was a choice the defense made, whether that's by strategy, that this was a plan three years ago to do this or not, and no way of knowing, obviously, other than they said. They can make everything you said is word as they're going through this, but that begs the question of why so late? Well, that's what I was trying to get to. It, absolutely, absolutely. And why now? Why the morning of trial? As opposed to, yes, we'll have Dr. Eisen come sit through all of the testimony and see what is introduced. No, they want to send her things that may well not be introduced for all the other reasons that I've said. That's where the problem lies. And if she has days, weeks to go over that, then we're certainly going to be rather busy to be able to speak with her. And yes, I agree. If something that is, comes out in court, that's not what they're wanting to do. They're wanting to send her a ton of materials after, literally after the jury has been sworn and jeopardy is attached and that's not fair no. anything else that's, I, I just, it, it's, it's not about fair it's about the rules it's about the, it's about the rules and so the 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 other the other way this stuff can happen and, and fine we, we have all the time in the world but the other way this stuff can happen is they could cross-examine an expert and then we can start pulling these out. And, and there's a roughly 250 page journal that's typewritten that might be handed to an expert at that point and she can take whatever time she needs to read it uh, on, on, on a redirect uh, after a cross-examination. So, you know, all of this stuff is relevant to the issue to our burden of proof. We, can, we haven't 
under the rule, we're allowed to do it. And, you know, we, if that's the way we prefer to do it, because that is the way that's going to make this thing most efficient. But we're not, we have all the time in the world. And if we have to do it another way, so be it. But I don't think that we've done anything but follow what the rule provides. And so I think we're in the right place. You may have followed the letter of the rule. I'm not sure that you've followed the spirit of the rule. But uh, give me about 10 minutes and I'll get back with you.
Anything else that either side wishes to say? No, Your Honor. No. Uh, I'm going to allow the experts to review it. They will have to report back to the court with a supplemental report no later uh, than 6 p.m. tomorrow night so that the uh, state will have an opportunity, one, and they'll have to set themselves up at the state's convenient to be interviewed if it changes any of their underlying opinions as to the ultimate issue in this case. And then two, the state will can take whatever means necessary to uh, get a rebuttal expert if they choose this, uh, feel this necessary. I think a lot of this can be dealt with on cross-examination that, you know, showing what their real opinion was at one time and how it's suddenly changed even though the imp, imp, uh, evidence is, uh, been, or the information's been there for four years and why are you just now changing your opinion and cross-examination go a long way to... I mean, if they have a look at it, we certainly don't anticipate a change of opinion. But uh, I, can, I, can, I can certainly tell them that. I'll tell you that the journal is about 250 type pages. They better get busy. I can, I can, uh, they better get busy, and I hope they're speed readers. I'll email right now. All right. Judge, just to be clear, with respect to Dr. Woods, since her opinion is only as to the mental illness, because she deferred the yeah. opinion on. We'll see what she family. says, and then we'll yes. address it. Okay. But, uh, I mean, it's. Again, there's a lot of things that can be dealt with in cross examination because she clearly said that. Uh, clearly brought up that I just now provided this information. She may even say I don't have time to do it uh, and not give an opinion. Uh, but, I mean, the 703 does allow, again, I think the spirit of the rules have certainly not been followed, uh, but it does allow information at, before, during the hearing. Uh, yes. They're on a strict guideline, the uh, timetable. Thank you. State's position, though, is Dr. Wood has deferred an opinion about insanity and that she should not be allowed to go back. And I'll have to read her whole report. I did read that, okay? But let me go back and read her whole report. Does she explain why she deferred to them? Because she didn't have, I mean. Judge, and, I, and, and the state's going to step off in it if they keep this up, because what she's going to say is, number one, she did give an opinion on insanity. It's in a report. She fully gave an opinion. She deferred purely because of the competency issue, because that required inpatient treatment. Okay. I will read so the report. If they want to get into that, we can get into that. And we disagree with that, John. Okay. I'll read it, and we can maybe talk about it more at lunch as to what the opinion, if any, she's going to be allowed to give. Let's get the jury in here.
Sorry for a little bit of the slow start. First day can always be kind of rough because particularly in a situation like this, you got a lot of procedural things you need to address and, and this type of thing. So I appreciate your patience. Uh, I know it's just the first day, but how are the hotel accommodations? Uh, you want to stay an extra week or two just in case? Okay. Oh, well, just, just testing the waters. Um, before we start with anything, uh, Mr. Glenn Funk is back with us. He has gotten a full clearance from his doctor. He is totally healthy, not contagious, not infectious, no problems whatsoever. Uh, and certainly uh, he wanted to be here for the trial of this case and I just asked him to do everything I could to make sure that his doctor felt he was healthy enough to be here. Uh, he went to his doctor this morning and the doctor has given him a full clearance and everything is safe. But he, uh, the doctor did say just continue to wearing a mask, so he's going to be the one person for sure at the council table for the present time to be masked, okay? Please don't think anything about it. Everything's good to go there. The next thing I need to uh, do is ask you to please stand, raise your right hand. We'll swear you in as the jury on the trial of this particular case. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Just a couple other things as this trial unfolds. Uh, when you come into the courtroom, please be seated. You don't have to stand. We're standing for you. You're the judges of the facts in this case, and you're going to ultimately become the judges of the law under my uh, uh, direction. But uh, you are pretty much the judges. You're the ones that are wearing the robes, and we're standing in respect to you. So when you come in, please just be seated. You don't have to stand uh, and wait for everybody to be seated, all right? Before we start the actual trial, I mentioned to you last week that I was going to uh, go over some additional things that are sort of relates to the trial, trial procedure and things of this nature, just so you have some insight as to how this case will actually unfold. As I indicated to you last week, and it was brought to your attention several weeks, this is the state of Tennessee versus Travis Ryan King. Mr. Ryan King is charged with eight counts of first degree murder, four being by premeditated murder and four being by felony murder. Now, also, as I indicated to you last week, these are alternative theories of the same offense. There are alleged to have been four homicide victims. So if when you uh, or when you begin your deliberations, you will be required to render a verdict as to each theory. So, you know, and you can find Mr. Ryan King guilty of all of them, not guilty of all of them, guilty of some, not guilty of others. But the point is, is that you will have to read, I mean, have to render a verdict as to each of those eight counts of uh, first degree homicide or any lesser included offense that I charge you. He is also charged with four counts of attempt to commit first degree murder and four counts of uh, employment of a firearm during the commission of a dangerous felony. I will give you the uh, detailed instructions on each of those at the end of the trial and the elements that we discussed last week, uh, what makes up uh, each of those crimes. Mr. Ryan King is presumed innocent of all the charges against him and that presumption remains with him throughout the trial of the case unless the state proves beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously to the uh, satisfaction of the jury that he is guilty of one or more of the offenses with which he is charged. The indictment charging Mr. Ryan King with these crimes are not evidence against him and cannot be considered or used against him in any manner whatsoever. How that indictment issues is totally different uh, than what brings us here today and for you to ultimately decide different levels of proof, different types of proof, everything is totally different and therefore it cannot be considered under any circumstances as evidence or be used against him in any manner whatsoever. Normally the first thing we do when we start a trial is jury selection. We spent four days last week accomplishing that, so we're uh, beyond that point. Once the trial of this case will start, uh, starts, 
The first thing that will occur is that one of the state's attorneys will get up and read the formal indictment to you that sets forth each of these 16 uh, counts with which he is charged. The indictment basically contains the, uh, the elements that are expected to be, uh, that the state expects to prove during the course of his trial. Mr. Ryan Keene uh, will then enter his formal pleas of not guilty, uh, I assume not guilty as to each of the 16 counts. Once that is done, then this, we will proceed with opening statements. During opening statements, the attorneys will be given an opportunity to basically outline for you what they believe the evidence in this case will be and why that evidence, not arguments, but basically suggesting to you that that is the evidence they will rely on to support their respective positions of guilty or not guilty. It's just to give you a roadmap or some insight as to what this trial is all about so that you can kind of get an idea of where the focus of things will go as they call witnesses and things of this nature. Since the state does have the burden of proving the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt throughout most of these proceedings, the state's attorney will go first uh, and then followed by defense counsel. Once the opening statements are uh, concluded, we will begin the evidentiary portion of the trial. Again, as the state has a burden of proof, they obviously have to go first in putting on their proof to try and establish beyond a reasonable doubt uh, the guilt of Mr. Ryan King for each of these uh, 16 counts that have been uh, placed against him. The way that uh, proceeds is the state will, as it, the state calls each witness, one of the state's attorney will get up and ask that witness whatever they intend to ask that witness in direct examination. One of the defense counsel will be given an opportunity to cross-examine or challenge and confront uh, the testimony of that particular witness. State's attorney will be given an opportunity to redirect if they feel it's necessary to maybe clarify uh, some type of uh, parts of the testimony uh, that may have been challenged on uh, cross-examination. If that happens, then the defense attorney will be given an opportunity to cross-examine. And this process will continue with each witness until both sides have uh, asked and answered any and all questions they intend to ask of that witness. You have been previously one uh, attached to their questionnaire, a list of all the witnesses, and you've indicated that you don't know any of them, but I think there were 62 witnesses. I'm not sure all 62 will be uh, called to testify or not, but be that as it may, there could be a, a long list of uh, witnesses to be called and testified, uh, to testify. As we go through the process, and these witnesses are called, if you cannot hear a question asked by an attorney, or if you cannot hear an answer provided by a witness, please advise us immediately. It is absolutely imperative that you as the sole judges of the facts in this case be able to hear not only the answers given, because that's the evidence, but you have to be able to hear the questions so you can put the answers in context. And sometimes the questions uh, can be, and I will instruct you how, can be considered a part of the evidence if, the, uh, if it's a hypothetical type question, for example, and the, the witness agrees with it, then the question, uh, the contents of that question can become evidence. But the important thing is that you hear both sides so that you fully understand, appreciate, and can evaluate uh, the evidence as it's introduced. You do have uh, notebooks and uh, writing instruments to take down any notes that you wish to do, and uh, please do that. As I said, uh, this process will continue until each and every witness is called uh, by the state. At the conclusion of the state's case in chief, whenever that may be, there will be a recess that will require to be uh, taken, even if it's in the middle of the day. I told you that we would do everything possible to address issues either before trial, during lunch, or after trial so as not to uh, delay or your time here or waste your time here where you're just sitting and twiddling your thumbs or whatever the case may be. Uh, so we will try and deal with those issues. But one we just got to deal with as soon as the state's case in chief is concluded, and those are some motions and some uh, legal issues that the court has to address with the attorneys. Once we have addressed those issues and we come back into the court, then the defense will put on any uh, proof that the defendant intends to put on. Please keep in mind, as I've already told you, it is the state's responsibility to prove the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant has no responsibility to establish his innocence unless he enters a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. 
Okay, that is a clear exception under the law. If he doesn't plead it, then he doesn't have to put on any proof whatsoever. And, but if he does plead not guilty by reason of insanity, then the burden of proof of the issue of insanity must be established by clear and convincing evidence by the defendant. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a different situation uh, where he is uh, pleading insanity as a reason for being found not guilty versus just a general plea of not guilty. In fact, most defenses, the state still has the burden, but insanity is one which by law is placed upon the defendant to establish. So when we come back, if that's his uh, plea, when we come back from that recess after the state's case in chief, then the defense will put on any and all proof the defense intends to put on during the course of this trial. And the procedure is the same as uh, the state's case in chief, except for the roles of the parties will reverse with the defense asking the questions and direct and redirect. The state's uh, attorneys asking the questions and cross and recross. And this process will continue until any and all uh, of the defense witnesses uh, have been called and questioned. At the conclusion of the uh, defense proof, there may be rebuttal proof by the state. In a case like this, certainly that will depend in part on what testimony is presented by the defendant. If that occurs, then we go back to the original process with the state asking the questions first and defense uh, asking uh, questions and cross and uh, recross. Once all of the evidence in this case has been uh, presented, then the attorneys will have an opportunity to address you in closing arguments. During closing arguments, the attorneys will spend time, not only one, to point to what they believe is the most critical evidence in terms of uh, evaluating in order to render verdicts of guilty or not guilty. Obviously, you have to consider all of the evidence that is presented during the trial of this case, but certainly some evidence may, you may ultimately decide carries greater weight than other evidence, and they're going to argue what that evidence is. Also, during closing arguments, they will argue to the, you the law that, that exists in this case or will be presented to you in this case and how that law applies to the evidence in this case to assist you and give you guidance in trying to help you render the verdicts. Obviously, they're going to argue from their respective sides. The state will argue how that evidence, when a, the law is applied to it, supports their position of guilty. And when the defense argues, they will point to the evidence in the law that uh, supports their contention that Mr. Ryan Keene is not guilty. Please keep in mind, what the attorneys say to you in opening statements and what they say to you in closing arguments is not evidence. So when we start this trial, please, on your notebooks, you can take notes about what they say, but anytime the attorney is speaking directly to you, make a note that that's the attorney speaking and don't get it confused with the evidence in this trial because what they say is not evidence. So, and I'll give you a charge on all of that as well, but I just want to make it clear that you need to note when you're taking uh, down anything you say and if it's the attorneys, it's just to help you better understand something and it's not evidence in the trial of this particular case. But during the closing arguments, the state's attorney will argue first. Defense counsel will be given an opportunity to argue their case and the state will be given the, the last opportunity to address you in the closing arguments. Once the arguments have been completed in this case, then it is my duty to read to you all the law that applies to this case, and uh, it, which will be contained in the jury charge. I am required to read that to you in open court in the presence of all the parties. You will have a copy of that jury charge. Can't finalize the jury charge until all the evidence in the case has been submitted, uh, so I don't know exactly how long it'd be. My guesstimate right now is it'll take maybe an hour and a half or so to read to you. Uh, and it's not a uh, necessarily a fun-filled, exciting uh, read, but it is very absolutely vital because you can't render any verdicts without knowing the law that applies to the facts in order to accomplish that. You will have a copy of it. You will be allowed to take that uh, jury charge, each of you, back to the jury room. Uh, for your use during your deliberations. Uh, so 
that you're going to have a lot of law thrown at you in a very short period of time and obviously you'll have the benefit of the written jury charge that you can go through it as you address each count of the indictment all right once the case is submitted to you you take over the responsibility of determining guilt or innocence as to each of the 16 counts as i indicated to you last week if you find that Mr. Ryan King is guilty of one or more of the accounts of first degree murder, then we will have a separate hearing for you to determine whether or not his punishment should be life in the penitentiary with parole or without parole. And so we will have another hear uh, hearing. There will be additional testimony at that time. The procedure is the same as in the trial with uh, the state putting on proof first and the defense putting on proof in the same procedure for direct and cross-examination, so on and so forth. You'll be given a, there'll be additional arguments, open statements, you'll be given additional charge by the, uh, uh, the court as it relates to that phase of the trial. Usually, that phase of the trial is not necessarily that lengthy, oftentimes in a day. Maybe because of the number of alleged victims in this case, it could be more, but usually within a day. But I just, you know, just be prepared for it in the event that we reach, uh, have to get to that phase of the trial. A couple other things I want to go over with you, and some of this was briefly mentioned the other day, and just some uh, other fundamental. Uh, one other thing I do want to mention, regardless of the fact that the defense has the responsibility to establish by clear and convincing evidence if they pursue an insanity defense that they have a, a responsibility established by clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Ryan King was insane at the time of these offenses. Mr. Ryan King himself does not have to testify, okay? Under the law and under our Constitution, if Mr. Ryan King chooses to testify during the course of this trial, he has an absolute right to do so. And his testimony would be evaluated the same as you would the testimony of any other witness in terms of credibility and things of this nature. And I'm going to give you a lengthy in instruction on uh, how you might go about uh, considering uh, and weighing the credibility of witnesses and expert witnesses and things of this nature. But my point is, he has an absolute right to testify if he chooses to. However, he also has an absolute right not to testify if he chooses not to do so. And if Mr. Ryan King does not testify during the course of this trial, the fact that he did not testify cannot be considered by you or used by you in any manner whatsoever on the issue of his guilt or innocence. It can't, it's a non-factor. So for example, if you go back there or during your deliberations in the guilt phase of the trial, and Mr. Ryan King has not testified. You cannot speculate as to why he did not testify. You cannot speculate by his failure to testify. It would, uh, the evidence would have been against him or anything of this nature. It is a non-factor that cannot be brought up, discussed, or otherwise considered by you, even in your own mind privately, on the issue of whether or not he is guilty of any one or more of the offenses with, it, with which he is charged. It is absolutely something that cannot be considered by you for any purpose whatsoever. A few evidentiary matters and other procedural things. During the course of this trial, and this was referenced briefly last week as well, during the course of this trial, you're going to hear both circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. Direct evidence is evidence that proves a fact and issue without any inference or presumption. And I'm going to give you a ex simple example, very elementary example of both of these in a minute. But an issue, uh, fact and issue, usually involves either the elements of the crime or, in the case of the defense, if he pleads insanity, on the issue of insanity. Those are the facts and issues. There's going to be a lot of facts that you may not resolve, uh, such as what he was wearing at the time of these events, things of that nature. Uh, those things do not address the facts of the issue. So it's the direct evidence is things that people see, hear, smell, touch, whatever the case may be. It's the use of their direct sense, uh, senses. It proves something, and you don't need to look anywhere else 
to establish that fact if you believe that fact to be true. Circumstantial evidence is all other evidence that, that does not directly prove a fact in issue, but when considered with all the other facts, you can reasonably conclude that a fact in issue either occurred or did not occur. Again, I'm gonna give you a very elementary type of example of this. Let's assume that you were at your home. You were at your home with your uh, one child or grandchild. There's no one else in the house. The doors are locked. No one can get into the house. The pets have been booted out except for the goldfish. All right? And you were sitting in the kitchen with your child or grandchild and you're baking a batch of cookies and you're having a, just a wonderful conversation with your grandchild about how they still like in their new toys from uh, the hot Christmas. And you know, before we know it, and spring break would be up here. And you, but anyway, you're just having a wonderful conversation with your child or grandchild. You pull the cookies out of the oven and you set them on the counter close to where the child is. You tell the child, do not eat that, any of those cookies. Then you turn around and you start washing the dishes. All of a sudden you notice that the conversation has come to a screeching halt, so you turn around to see what's happening. Lo and behold, there's a child sticking a cookie in his or her mouth. Okay, you seeing the child eat that cookie is direct evidence that the child ate the cookie. If the child were charged with disobeying a lawful order not to eat a cookie and the child was on trial for that and you got on the stand and testified to what you saw, if the jury believed what you saw, they would have not have to look anywhere else for the state to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the lawful order was given and the lawful order was disobeyed. That's direct evidence. You take that same fact scenario, but instead of turning around to wash the dishes, you leave the room. And when you come back into the kitchen, you notice that there's 10 cookies rather than 12. You notice that the child has cookie crumbs on his or her uh, mouth and his or her lap and around his or her feet and a big, huge smile on his or her face. You didn't see the child eat the cookie, but when you take all of these different individual facts and put them together, you can reasonably conclude that what happened is the child must have eaten the cookie because there was no one else in the house, including the pets. The doors were locked. They were still locked when you came back into the kitchen, so on and so forth. The cookie crumbs and everything else, and more importantly, maybe the big smile. Who knows? But whatever the case is, you can take all that evidence together and make that reasonable conclusion. That is circumstantial evidence. The important thing that you need to understand is that both evidence are to be treated however you wish to treat it. One's not better than the other. Direct evidence is not better than circumstantial evidence and the other way around. How you want to weigh that, you have to weigh all of the evidence, direct and circumstantial, but you will decide what weight you want to give any evidence that you hear. Also during this trial, you're likely to hear objections by one side or the other during the course of this particular trial. When an attorney makes an objection, they are basically telling the court, Judge, I do not believe that the evidence that is likely to be uh, given as a result of that question is admissible under our rules of evidence in the state of Tennessee. When that happens, first of all, don't think anything bad about the attorney who made the objection. They are not trying to prevent you from hearing evidence in this case. They are trying to prevent you from hearing evidence that under our laws is not admissible because it's either not uh, relevant, it's not reliable. There's a lot of different reasons evidence may not be admissible. Okay, so the only thing the, uh, the attorney is doing when they make that objection is his or her job. Likewise, don't think anything bad about the attorney who asked the question. That attorney's not trying to pull some, uh, you know, pull some wool over people's eyes and slip in uh, evidence that they know is not admissible. But in reality, while our rules of evidence may only be typewritten 20 to 25 pages long, the interpretation of those rules go into thousands of pages. I mean, books upon books are written about how 
our courts have interpreted those rules over the years. The reason for that is, is that the, the rules of evidence that we have in the state of Tennessee apply in every single court in the state of Tennessee, whether it be a civil case, a criminal case, a domestic case, whatever it may be, in all 95 counties, we use the same rules to best ensure that all court proceedings are fair and uh, considered equally, regardless of where you are in the state or the type of proceeding. So the reality of it is, is that I, uh, we could have a trial going on next door in Judge Watkins court, and certain evidence is attempted to be introduced in his court that would be admissible, which in this case would not be admissible. You have to look at the individual facts, so the rules are written in a manner that are very prophylactic to allow them to be adapted in a manner that guarantees or best guarantees a fairness within the trial that's going on at that particular moment. So don't think anything bad about uh, any objections that are made. Also, you are to place no weight whatsoever on whatever ruling I make. Uh, I am the judge of the law during the course of this trial, so when these legal issues come up, which uh, the uh, objections are, when those issues come up, I will address those issues. And don't think anything about my ruling. Whatever my ruling on a particular matter is does not have any is not any indication of what my feelings about this case are. I will tell you now, and I have no feelings about this case. It's not my responsibility to think one way or the other about this case. If I started doing that, I couldn't do my job and be fair and impartial. I'm going to remain open-minded and deal with things as they come along. So please don't make in, uh, read anything into whatever I say or rule or anything else. You are the ones that are going to have to uh, determine what weight, if any, to give to the evidence that you do here. The, uh, <clears throat> during, you're, you're locked up, so you're kind of under strict uh, rules. We are going to try to start as best as possible every morning at 830 and go until 6 uh, p.m. We will have a mid-morning recess. We'll have a mid-afternoon recess, and we'll have an hour for lunch. Uh, your hour for lunch uh, will be provided to you in the jury deliberation room. If you want to go out and get some fresh air, we will uh, escort you. My staff will escort you uh, out the parking, the garage, the secured garage uh, door to this building, give you an opportunity to look over the beautiful blue waters of the Cumberland River. Uh, but uh, just to get some fresh air, I know, because y'all are going to be locked up a whole lot of the time. During lunch, I will mention to you, I'm gonna, we're trying to put together some things for you to do on Sunday when you don't have anything to do. We're going to have kind of a checklist and see if we can come up with some kind of mutual agreement on what to do, and if not, we'll go by the majority. But it'll give you a little exercise of what ultimately you're going to be dealing with during the course of this trial. Again, I will do everything possible to uh, keep this trial moving so as not to impose any more on your time than is already going to be uh, required in order to try this particular case. Is there anything else from the state? Anything from the defense? All right, in that case, uh, ready to read the indictment? Tennessee, duly a family was sworn upon her oath to present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, <clears throat> unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation, did kill Joe Renee Perez Jr. in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count two. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, unlawfully, intentionally, 
and with premeditation did kill Torian Charles Sonderlin in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count three. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impounded and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee and before the finding of this indictment unlawfully intentionally intentionally and with premeditation did kill Aquila Jamal Da Silva in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count four. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee and before the finding of this indictment unlawfully, intentionally, and with premeditation, did kill Debony Lachey Groves in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count five. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did attempt to commit the offense of first degree murder as defined in Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 in that he, the said Travis J. Ryan King, did intentionally and with premeditation attempt to kill Shantia Wagner and Shantia Wagner suffered serious bodily injury in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-12-101 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Count six, the grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impounded and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did knowingly employ a firearm during the commission of or attempt to commit a dangerous felony to wit, attempt to commit first degree murder of Shantia Wagner in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-17-1324B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count seven. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did attempt to commit the offense of first degree murder as defined in Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 in that he, the said Travis J. Ryan King, did intentionally and with premeditation attempt to kill Sharita Henderson, and Sharita Henderson suffered serious bodily injury in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-12-101 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count eight. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did knowingly employ a firearm during the commission of or attempt to commit a dangerous felony to wit attempt to commit first degree murder of Sharita Henderson in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-17-1324B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count nine. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present the Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee and before the finding of this indictment did attempt to commit the offense of first degree murder as defined in Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 in that he, the said Travis J. Ryan King, did intentionally and with premeditation attempt to kill Kayla Shaw in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-12-101 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count 10. Grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, 
did knowingly employ a firearm during the commission of or attempt to commit a dangerous felony to wit attempt to commit first degree murder of Kayla Shaw in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-17-1324B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee, count 11. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present Ms. Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April, 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did attempt to commit the offense of first degree murder as defined in Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 in that he, the said Travis J. Ryan King, did intentionally and with premeditation attempt to kill James E. Shaw, Jr. in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-12-101 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count 12. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did knowingly employ a firearm during the commission of or attempt to commit a dangerous felony to wit attempt to commit first degree murder of James E. Shaw, Jr. in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-17-1324B and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count 13. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did kill Joe Rene Perez Jr. during the perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate first degree murder in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count 14. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath, present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April 2018 in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did kill Tarian Charles Sonderland during the perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate first degree murder in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Count 15. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April, 2018, in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did, did kill Sakila Jamal De Silva during the perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate first degree murder in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. And lastly, count 16. The grand jurors of Davidson County, Tennessee, duly impaneled and sworn upon their oath, present that Travis J. Ryan King on the 22nd day of April, 2018, in Davidson County, Tennessee, and before the finding of this indictment, did kill Ebony. Lachey Groves during the perpetration of or attempt to perpetrate first degree murder in violation of Tennessee Code Annotated Section 39-13-202 and against the peace and dignity of the state of Tennessee. Signed, Glenn R. Funk, District Attorney General of the 20th Judicial District. Signed as a true bill by the then four person of the grand jury and filed with the Davidson County Criminal Court Clerk on February the 1st, 2019. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And to the 16 counts of the indictment, how does Mr. Ryan King plead? Your Honor, Mr. Ryan King pleads not guilty by reason of insanity. All right. Members, jury, you've heard the indictment read. The formal plea is not guilty by reason of insanity. Entered in this case as a reminder. I will tell you that the indictment is not evidence against Mr. Ryan King and cannot be considered or used against him in any manner whatsoever. It is simply the formal written instrument that brings him into this courtroom and places him on notice as to why he is even in this courtroom. Ready to proceed with opening statements? Yes,
No one was expecting it. None of the 22 people that were in the path of Travis Ryan King at the Waffle House at 3571 Murfreesboro Road, none of those 22 people were expecting the mayhem and destruction that Travis Ryan King had planned for them. Now, about 10, 15 minutes earlier at that Waffle House, there weren't near as many people. There were only 10 people inside just a few minutes before. That Waffle House location was actually new. There was another Waffle House further down Murfreesboro Road that was always extremely busy. Several of those 22 people actually went to that Waffle House first and decided to go to this new location. And in those early hours of 3 a.m. on that Saturday night, early Sunday morning, April 22nd, 2018, there were only six customers that had been in the Waffle House. There was a couple, Lawrence Wells and his girlfriend, Amaya Harris. They're sitting on the far side of the restaurant. This Waffle House was set up just like every other Waffle House. You walked in, there's a long counter with a bar. To the right, there are three booths <coughs> in the bathrooms. You go to the left, there are three booths, and then you could go behind the counter where the cooks and the employees would be. So Lawrence Wells and Amaya Harris, they're over on the left near that kitchen entrance. There's a booth right next to them, a married couple, Brittany and Matthew Cordova. They're sitting there. And all the way across the restaurant, there are two friends that are sitting together. Trayvon and Garth, Mike Garth. They're there just having a good time with their friends and loved ones. And in those early morning hours, more people start to arrive. Aquila De Silva, him and his older brother, Abede De Silva, they show up, they're with their girlfriends. They had been out that night. Akila is with his girlfriend, Shantia Wagner. Abede is with his girlfriend, Alexa Slane. And Abede will testify as well as Shantia, and they'll tell you that they, they actually were tired. They had been out that night. They were tired. They were hungry. They just stopped to get some food because they were ready to go home. And actually, Shantia Wagner will testify, and she'll tell you that she didn't even want to go inside. She was so tired. But she had actually never eaten at a Waffle House before. And so she didn't know what was on the menu, and they said, come inside and find something to order on the menu. The four of them, they sat in chairs with their backs to the parking lot as they were waiting for their food. De'Ebony Rose and her best friend, Sharita Henderson. Sharita was actually older than De'Ebony. They were like sisters. They were actual sorority sisters, but they were so close that they were like sisters. The two of them show up, they walk in, they actually go to the bathroom first, but then they sit in that first booth, kind of right by the front door. The two of them, they've been having fun, there were sorority events that whole weekend, and they're making jokes. And Sharita Henderson will testify and she'll tell you that they were actually singing Jesus Loves Me as they sat down and were looking at the menus. That was just something that they did. DeMarcus Wiggins, he comes in out of the parking lot and he's standing there by the jukebox waiting to order because now it's really getting busy. You'll also hear from Kayla Shaw. She was there with her two cousins, Chelsea Owens and Alexis Peebles. Alexis and Chelsea, they stayed in the car because again, at this point, they're tired. They just want to get some food because everybody's kind of ready to go home, but they were hungry. And they sent Kayla Shaw in to pick up their to-go order. You will see Kayla standing there. She's wearing a pink shirt. She's standing right there at the bar. And she's standing there just waiting for her food. And then you will see there are five employees that were working that night. Douglas Lauderdale, Wanda White, Virginia Stanley, 
and their two cooks, Michael Shaw and Torian Sonderland. You'll see a moment where Torian, he goes to walk out to take his smoke break. And I think it's right before Torian walks around, you'll see Amaya Harris get up from her table and she walks to the bathroom. Travis Ryan King arrived at 319. 319 and 30 seconds, he pulls into that back entrance and drives into the parking lot. He's already there. When Travis Ryan King pulls in, he doesn't park in just any spot. He parks right at the front. He parks in a handicapped spot right at the front door where he has a view of everything. Two walls of the Waffle House are floor to ceiling windows so he can see everything. He sees that moment when Amaya walks to the bathroom. He sees Torian walking. Now he sits and parks in that front handicapped parking spot and you'll see Brennan McMurray pull in in his white Jeep. You'll see his friend James Shaw Jr pull in in his red truck. They park, they get out of the car, and again, they're friends, they're together, they're having fun, they're cracking jokes as they're walking into the Waffle House. And they see Travis Ryan King in the truck sitting there before they go in. The two of them come in and they're seated at the bar. You'll see Amaya walk right past them and you'll see Torian walk out the front door to take his smoke break. And James Shaw Jr. and Brennan Murray will tell you that they were just having a good time. They saw Michael Shaw, the other cook, he kept stacking plates up on a shelf and he was stacking them so high that they were joking because they thought that they were gonna fall. And it's at that moment that outside that another person that wasn't planning to be there that night, Joe Perez Jr., 20 years old. He's from Texas. He had only been in Nashville for four months. And he wasn't there to eat. He wasn't there to have fun. Something was actually wrong with one of his tires. And he pulled in and pulls in right by the Waffle House sign and he's outside of his car trying to figure out what's going on with his car. And it's right at 323 and 50 seconds that Joe Perez Jr. goes to walk into the Waffle House. And as he walks by Travis Ryan King's car, you will see Travis Ryan King grab an assault rifle out of the front seat of his truck and he immediately points it at Joe Perez Jr. He fires at him multiple times, no hesitation at all. He strikes him four times. One of them strikes Joe in the neck, the left side. One strikes him in the left back. One in the right shoulder. And the fourth strike is a devastating head injury that shatters his skull. You will see surveillance video and you will see that Joe Perez Jr., he immediately falls to the ground, immediately, unable to move. And you will see Travis Ryan King fire another round at his body on the ground. Travis Ryan King does not hesitate one second. He takes the rifle and Torian Zonderland, who actually has begun to run towards Travis Ryan King, he aims and begins shooting directly at him. Torian quickly changes course and runs down the sidewalk away from him, running for his life. But he doesn't make it. He is struck seven times. Seven times, twice in the chest. You will hear from the medical examiner in this case and he will describe to you that one of 
the gunshot wounds to Torian's chest had stippling, which indicates he was in close proximity, as if he is running towards the shooter, but that all of his injuries, two gunshot wounds to the chest, two to the back, he struck in his thigh, he's also struck in the neck, and again, he is struck in the head with a devastating gunshot wound to the head, and he immediately falls to the ground. Seven gunshot wounds. Travis Reinking fired 15 rounds in 19 seconds outside. And again, he does not hesitate. He immediately goes inside. Immediately. You will see it 323 in 52 seconds. You will see one of the bullets strikes the window in the front of the Waffle House. Kayla Shaw, the girl in the pink shirt who's standing there at the counter, you will see the glass shatter and come straight at her face. That is the moment where everyone runs for cover. Akila De Silva and Chantia Wagner, they run to the left where the booths are, towards the kitchen. His brother Abede and Alexa Flame, they run to the right. James Brennan, Michael Shaw, James Brennan and James Shaw, Mike Garth, and Trayvon, they all run into the bathrooms where Amaya is. Travis Ryan King, when he walks in that door, Kayla has literally dropped to the floor, injuring her side at the moment that glass blew in. She is laying with her face towards the counter and she is playing dead. Travis Ryan King does not go to the left go to the left around the counter where the employees would be. He does not go that way. He does fire that direction as he sees Akila and Chantia Wagner scrambling on the ground, running for cover, trying to get under a booth around something to get away from him. He sees them and he fires at them both and strikes both of them, but he does not go left. He doesn't go to where the employees would be. Travis Ryan King immediately goes to the first booth where the customers are. He goes to Sharita Henderson. He goes to the Ebony Rose. The two girls, they drop to the ground. They're hiding under the table, lying on the floor. And Sharita Henderson will testify and she will tell you that she looked him in the eye. He looked right at her and he fired at her and shot her. And she was trying to cover her friend, but that was not possible. There is not room for that to happen. Sharita is struck three times, and her friend the Ebony is struck twice. And Travis Reinking makes a choice. He does not stop. Travis Reinking then turns to the right. He's headed to the bathrooms. This is a dead end. There is no space there. There are seven people who are cowering and they have nowhere to go. He does not pause one second after he has shot Sharita, shot the Ebony. He immediately fires into that area and you'll see the bullet hole in the glass in that door. And you will hear from James Shaw Jr. He will tell you that he is on the other side of that door and that a, he hears the whistle of a bullet that goes by him. He's actually struck in his arm. 
But then he hears a pause. And he's looking out that small window. He hears that pause. He looks. And he sees that Travis Reinking has pointed the rifle down. James Shaw Jr., in that moment, he makes a decision to take that opportunity, to take that one moment opportunity and seize it. And he uses the full force of his body and he forces himself through that door, forces himself into Travis Ryan King, knocking him back. And James Shaw Jr., he grabs a hold of that rifle even though it burns his hand because the barrel is hot and he does not let go. He struggles and wrestles with Travis Ryan King. He pushes him back and he overpowers him. He grabs that rifle and throws it over the kitchen counter as far away from Travis Ryan King as he can. And he doesn't stop there. He continues to wrestle with Travis Ryan King and manhandle him to get him out of that Waffle House. And he is able to push him out the door. And you'll see that as he's pushing him out the door, that Travis Ryan King starts to come out of the green jacket that he has on. The two of them struggle together until they get to the corner of the Waffle House. James Shaw Jr. goes right back behind the Waffle House. And Travis Ryan King runs the other direction. The other direction, which just happens to be in the direction where he lives. You'll see that James Shaw Jr. run and then he stops and he goes back. You'll see him get into his truck and he actually drives and pulls up right in front of the Waffle House. And you'll see him standing there with his door open because at that point, no one really knows where he is or if he's coming back. And he'll testify and tell you that he starts yelling his friend's name. Brennan McMurray, his friend's nickname is BJ, and he's yelling for BJ. You'll hear from Abede De Silva. He was in the bathroom with those seven people. He comes out, and he first goes outside, and then he sees his little brother, Akila, inside. So he runs back in. And he sees Shantia Wagner, his brother's girlfriend. And she's screaming. And she's bleeding. She has a devastating gunshot wound to her right leg. There is literally nothing holding her leg together from her ankle to her knee except for a small strip of skin. He finds his brother, Akila, who is still breathing. He's still talking. He has been yelling, calling for his name. And he sees that he has a gunshot wound to his right shoulder. And he's trying to figure out what to do, not understanding that what he doesn't see is that Akila also has a gunshot wound to his right side. And that gunshot has perforated his lung. Abede will describe it at some point and Brother Akila could not talk anymore. And the last thing that he said is, I can't breathe. Dr. Deering will testify and he will explain to you about the injuries that Akila suffered and that his lungs would have been filling up with blood and he would not have been able to breathe. Now, Akila De Silva was transported to the hospital, Abede having no idea how serious his injuries were. But even the life-saving efforts of the doctors he was pronounced deceased at the hospital. Shantia Wagner, she will describe that devastating gunshot wound to her leg, that she is bleeding. She'll 
explaining it. She initially called 911, but the operator just kept asking her for the address, which she didn't know, and she got frustrated, and she decided to call her mom. And she'll describe that excruciating pain that she was in. She'll describe looking at her leg that wasn't there. She'll describe that she got transported to the hospital. And it was actually several days later before she even learned that her boyfriend, Akila, had not survived. And she'll describe to you the months that she was in the hospital. That even today, what she goes through with treatment. And she'll describe that process that the doctors basically had to rebuild a leg for her. Her injury was so devastating, the doctors had to call in a military specialist that was used to dealing with people with IED injuries because it was as if she had stepped on a bomb. You will also hear from Sharita Henderson. She will tell you about lying on that floor. She will tell you about her gunshot wounds. She was also shot in the leg. Her leg was half blown off, breaking both bones in her lower leg. She was also shot in her upper forearm with the bullet exiting out the other side. You will see her scars. Dr. Deering will testify and explain to you what damage this type of high velocity injury does to the human body. But you will actually be able to see it on Sharita's arm. That she's also shot in her right arm near her bicep and that bullet goes into her chest. And as she's lying there on the floor next to her friend, Diebony, who she knows is not alive, that at one point she actually calls out, I'm not dead. And she knows that anyone that saw her would not know that. You will hear from the first responding officers who responded to the scene, the devastation that they found when they got there. You will hear that after they were able to treat all of the victims from inside, that they located Mr. Ryan King's truck because it was still parked there in that parking spot. And they were able to determine his address that was very close by. They went to his apartment and they learned about Mr. Ryan King. That he had just moved to the Antioch area a couple months before in February is when he got that apartment. He was a 29 year old crane operator from Illinois. They learned that he didn't have many friends. He was a loner. He had a family, but didn't have much contact with them. And the apartment, they learned that not only the gun that was used at the Waffle House, but that he owned three other guns. They found two of them, both bolt action rifles, both incapable of firing 30 rounds within 29 seconds. And they found a case to a fourth gun, a Kimber 45 caliber handgun. They found the case, but no gun. Now during all of this, the ID officers that respond to the actual crime scene, they immediately find the green jacket that Travis Ryan King's wearing. It's right there at that intersection, intersection right where you see him on the video run towards. And in the pockets of that green jacket are two 
additional magazines to the Bushmaster's XM-15 assault rifle that Travis Reinking chose to take to the Waffle House that day. Both of those magazines were fully loaded with 30 rounds of hollow point ammunition. The detectives will tell you that they found a third magazine in Travis Reinking's bathroom, that there was some blood on the floor. They also found an empty box of 223 hollow point ammunition in his apartment. They also found his iPhone. That was left there, not taken. You will also hear about the law enforcement response to this incident. Sergeant Polk will describe to you the enormous resources that were employed in an attempt to locate Travis Ryan King, who ran from this crime scene. He was not at his apartment. There's a 45 caliber handgun in the thing, so he was assumed to be armed and dangerous. And he will tell you about the resources from the Metro Nashville Police Department, but not just the Metro Nashville Police Department, that they had assistance from pretty much every agency that exists, from the TBI, the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, there were secret service assisting, there were other local law enforcement outside of the county that were assisting, that they gave a media release to the public with information of be on the lookout for this person. There are hundreds and hundreds of law enforcement officers looking for Travis Ryan King, along with the public is looking for him. They are having to shut down schools and put them on lockdown, and they are searching everywhere. There are wooded areas by that Waffle House, and they are searching everywhere. And you will hear that Travis Ryan King was able to evade them for almost 34 hours. Now when Travis Ryan King showed up to that Waffle House, <clears throat> he chose not to wear any clothing other than that green jacket that carried the two additional magazines, the 60 additional rounds. He fired 30 rounds at the Waffle House, 15 outside, 15 inside. That moment that James Shaw Jr. was able to seize, he was out of ammunition. That empty clip is right there where James Shaw Jr. struggled that rifle away from him. That green jacket held his 60 more rounds. But when officers ultimately located him, Officer Kyle Williams will describe to you that they were in the woods, they got a tip from a citizen that they thought that they saw the person. And he's in the woods, he hears crunching, the team has separated so that they can try to determine if this person is the suspect they're looking for. They will describe to you that in those scenarios that they have a code word that they say so they can call out the code word and if they are going to encounter somebody else on the team they would know that it's someone from their team instead of the suspect so he calls out the code word and there's no response and then he sees travis ryan king behind a tree and he has his firearm pulled on him and he tells him to come out and he'll describe that Travis Ryan King made a motion with his arm, but he came out behind that tree and he put his hands up just as Officer Williams had directed him. He told him to put his hands up and to get down on the ground. And Travis Ryan King did exactly what he said. Officer Williams will tell, tell you that he directed him that if you move, I will shoot you. And Travis Reinking responded, I won't. When Officer Williams found Travis Reinking, he was dressed. He had on a t-shirt, jeans, shoes. 
and he had a backpack on. And you'll hear from the officers that located him that they first put him in cuffs, even with the backpack on. They found his wallet and his ID that was on him. In his pocket, he also had a loaded 45 caliber clip to the 45 caliber Kimber firearm. They cut the backpack off of him, and inside that backpack, they immediately see that Kimber firearm. It is loaded with a full clip. There is a round in the chamber. It is ready to fire. Also in that backpack is a holster for that gun, a flashlight, a multi-tool, several bottles of water. And there's also 10 silver bars in that backpack. You will hear a testimony during this trial that those 10 silver bars were purchased on April 10th of 2018. And they were picked up at National Coin and Currency in Rutland on April 20th of 2018. The detective's investigation will also reveal that Travis Reinking purchased those magazines in those days before this shooting. Those three magazines to fit his Bushmaster's XM-15. The one that's on the bathroom countertop and the two that were in his jacket. Those three were new. You will also hear that they located a BMW key fob to a BMW X6 that had been stolen from the Brentwood BMW dealership on April 17th and that they learned that that vehicle had been recovered from his apartment complex. The detectives that were involved in his apprehension will testify, and there were several that were involved in transporting him. They will testify and describe to you his demeanor, how he was acting. And they will describe that he was calm. Officer Williams will say the very first person to encounter him will describe that he was calm and resigned. Ladies and gentlemen, the proof in this case and the evidence that will be presented to you is that Travis Reinking made a choice. He made several choices that led to the shooting. He decided what time to go. He went on a Saturday night at 3.20 a.m. to a Waffle House when it would be at its busiest. He chose not to wear clothes other than a green jacket. He made that choice. He chose which of his four firearms to take with him chose the one that had the highest capacity magazine. He chose to buy additional magazines for that weapon, and he chose to take 90 rounds of ammunition. He chose that parking spot where he could see everything. He chose to fire upon Joe Perez Jr., someone who wasn't inside the Waffle House, who was parked in a parking spot. He chose to fire upon him first. He chose to fire upon Tori and Sonderland as he ran away from him. And he made a very specific choice to not go to the left not go to where the Waffle House employees would be. He chose to go to the right where the customers were. He chose to go to where there were seven more people. He chose not to stop. The evidence presented to you during this trial will be that Travis Ryan King went there 
to take something that couldn't be given back. He went there to take lives. The evidence will be that this was an act of revenge done out of anger. The evidence will be that Travis Ryan King took Joe Perez Jr.'s life in an act of revenge. That Travis Ryan King took Tori and Sanderlin's life in an act of revenge. He took Aquila De Silva's life in an act of revenge. He took the Ebony Grove's life in an act of revenge. Their families cannot get them back. And Travis Ryan King did this to punish them. And at the end of all of the proof, we will ask that you return a verdict that he is guilty of all 16 counts of the indictment. How long is it going to take? But I'm not trying to rush you. I'm just trying to figure out a mid-morning break. I don't have time, Your Honor, but not, I, I don't want to anticipate too long. All right. Let's get that. Try and get it in there. You've got a difficult job. And you're just starting it. Information in the open states and made by the state this morning. And we can agree that it's tragic. It's tragic all around. And I want to say on the front end that nothing we say on our defense team is ever going to be intended to be offensive to the families of the victims. What you're going to see during the, the state's case in chief from the defense may seem awkward because we don't contest what happened at the wall. <clears throat> so if you don't see us getting up and doing a lot of cross examination of witnesses, there's a reason. As they've indicated, are going to show you videos. They're going to have eyewitness accounts. But that's not the only part of the story that's important. And as a jury in this case, it's important that you're able to understand the entire picture. Because when you sit in judgment of Mr. Ryan King and the facts in this case and you apply it to the law of this case, you have to understand Mr. Ryan King. It's the oath you took. It doesn't stop with what happened at the Waffle House and it doesn't start with what happened at the Waffle House. What the proof is going to show is that Travis Reinking is severely mentally ill. He's schizophrenic. And he's battled this for years. And you're going to hear expert testimony to talk about about a three to five year period leading up to that night. You're going to hear that Mr. Reinking was driven by delusions, paranoid thinking, auditory hallucinations. One of those delusions you're going to hear about began with a Taylor Swift concert where he believed that Taylor Swift was talking directly to him. And then he went on to believe he was in a relationship with Taylor Swift that he was her real boyfriend, that he was communicating with her and she communicating with him. And over time, you're going to hear about how that delusion grew and grew to where then it turns almost violent in his mind that she's after him, 
that she's breaking in his house, that she's sexually assaulting him, that others are involved, that the government is involved. You're going to hear that Mr. Ryan King was so convinced of this delusional thinking over years of time that he himself was reaching out to law enforcement, asking for help. People are coming in my home. They're breaking in my house. They're stealing my thoughts. When I go into restaurants, people are repeating phrases they would only know if they had read my, my private journals and my private thoughts. He believed it. He believed it wholeheartedly. He believed it so much, he went to Washington, D.C., thinking that he could get an audience with the President of the United States and get it to stop because he believed the government was involved. And this delusional thinking really rolled into him believing that Taylor Swift herself was a government agent. When he couldn't get relief in his hometown of Illinois, he started, he moved. He moved because he thought if he moved, it would make it stop. What he talked about is the the psychological rape, it would stop. The harassment, it would stop. So he moves. He moves several times. You're going to hear testimony that at one point, earlier on, his family tries to get him some help. It doesn't take. He moves again. He ends up in Nashville. By that time, when he's in Nashville, he is completely untethered from reality. And he is driven by his delusion that people are after him. You're going to hear a testimony that Mr. Ryan King believed that he could communicate with aliens and was regularly communicating with aliens, that Mr. Ryan King believed he could speak directly and to God. That he believed that normal people walking around, his reality was those people. And there was no rhyme or reason that you could put logic to. Those people were out to hurt him and had been hurting him and were continuing to hurt him. And so on the night of April 22nd, 2018, you're going to hear that Mr. Ryan King believed he was commanded by God to go to the Waffle House. in defense of himself and other people, that the people at the Waffle House, in his mind, were government agents, that were responsible for all the torment that he was perceiving over those years. You heard talk about what he was wearing or what he wasn't wearing. He was naked except for a green jacket, not a trench coat, not a long jacket, a waist length green jacket, completely naked, no shoes, no socks, no nothing. Green jacket, magazines, assault rifle. Why? You're going to hear proof because that's what God said. God told him to do it that way. And that's what caused him to go. You're going to hear proof that he believed because they were watching his every move, that he was speaking about going to the Waffle House audibly in his apartment before he went. In his mind saying, I've been ordered by God to do this, but I'm saying this out loud and maybe people won't be there because they'll hear me talk because they're, they're listening. They'll hear me talk. And that will cause it to maybe even be closed. Now, that's not rational thought. But that was his reality. When we talk about choices, 
When you hear the district attorney say choices and choices and choices, what are choices based on? Perception. They're based on perception. What did he perceive? It's not rational. He wasn't in any sort of rational state of mind. But his choices led him to that Waffle House under those strict orders that he perceived to be from God. And he pulls into the parking lot. And you're going to hear proof that even in that moment, he is looking for a sign. He's not sitting outside trying to wait for max capacity in the Waffle House. He's waiting for a sign. Maybe if there's a, if there's a sign, I was wrong. Maybe I won't have to do it. But God's told me to do it. And again, in his sickness, his severe mental illness, he sees the number three on a hat. What he perceives as a walking by his car. It's described by the district attorney. It's a gentleman walking by the car right before Mr. Reinking gets out. And in his mind, that's the sign from God because in his mind, his terribly ill, severe mental illness, schizophrenic mind, three has meaning. And that's his sign. That's his sign. What you're going to hear in this case is that Mr. Ryan King's actions that night, they were a direct result of the delusions he was suffering because of his schizophrenia. He believed that God told him to do that. He believed that the people in that Waffle House were government agents. When you're thinking about choices, when you're considering this case, you have to consider the perception of that person. And we believe that when you do that, and at the conclusion of this case, you will be clearly convinced that Mr. Ryan King suffered from a severe mental illness and that he was insane at the time of these shootings. And you will render a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. Thank you. Statements of the attorneys. I will remind you that the statements of the attorneys are not evidence and they cannot consider it as evidence in, at all. We're going to take a mid morning recess at this point in time. We'll try and get back in here as close to 11 as possible. I know that it kind of may take you a while to relax and get yourself ready for the next round, but as soon as you're all ready, we'll come back. In. All right. Please keep in mind that you cannot discuss anything about what's transpired in this courtroom. Whatever thoughts you have about the case, you must uh, keep them to yourselves. Please remain open-minded, and again, we'll get back in here as quick as we can.
Yes, sir. The state calls Officer Brett Johns. Uh, my name is Officer Brett Johns. And where are you employed? Metro Nashville Police Department. Um, <coughs> could you spell? For the record, uh, please spell your name. Uh, first name B R E T T, last name J O H N S. All right. Officer Johns, how long have you been a police officer? Uh, approximately six and a half years. Okay. Have you always worked with the Metro Nashville Police Department? Yes, sir. All right. Um, and in what, what is your current assignment? I work at uh, West Community Field Intelligence Team as a detective. Okay, so I, Detective Jaws. Yes, sir. Forgive me. It's okay. um, and in April of 2018, what was your assignment at the time? I was working C detail at Hermitage Precinct. Uh, my zone was 535 zone. I was okay. a zone officer. What is C detail? Uh, C detail hours are from 10:30 at night to 7 in the morning. And you said your your zone was what? 535 zone. So it was like Murfreesboro, Nashboro, um, the area that uh, shares a border with South Precinct and Hermitage Precinct. Okay. Um, and at the time, what what was a normal shift like for you back in 2018? Uh, a shift as a normal police officer is very different, just depends on the type of calls that come in that night. Um, you can range from just doing traffic stops or looking for people that have warrants to answering numerous calls to call or, you know, going to high priority calls such as shootings or uh, robberies, break-ins, home invasions, anything of that aspect. Okay. And um, <clears throat> are you ever dispatched to calls? Yes, sir. And what does that mean? So when you're dispatched to a call, a uh, call comes in to our dispatch, which is a separate um, entity than the police department. When they receive the call, they call for a radio sign on the radio. So my call sign was 535. They would raise me. They would say 535. I would answer. And they would read out the call text um, of a call that they needed me to respond to. So if it was a domestic related, it would be a, we coded as a 41. They would let me know the terms of whoever called in, what they're describing to dispatch, so that I can have some kind of knowledge prior to going to the call. Where do you receive, how do you receive a dispatch? 
Um, every officer has a portable radio on their belt. Um, now they have outside vest carriers. Um, we have a portable radio with a handheld mic that comes up. Um, it depends on how the officer wears it. I wear mine over my shoulder that comes right here. But currently I'm in our Class A uniform, so I'm not wearing my mic. Okay. Um, and so you are able to hear it from the radio there? Yes, sir. Okay, and where do you speak into? Where do I speak into? Yeah. Into the handheld mic right here. Um, on, at some point on April 22nd, 2018, did you receive a dispatch, dispatch to respond to a Waffle House? Yes, sir. Um, and about what time did you receive that dispatch? Uh, roughly around 3.20 in the morning. Okay. And where were you? When the call came out, I was at Murfreesboro and Nashboro on a, a vehicle accident with another officer. Okay, you say Murfreesboro, is that Murfreesboro Pike? Murfreesboro and Nashville, uh, Nashboro Boulevard. Okay, um, is that in the Antioch area? Yes. All right. Um, and what did you do in response to receiving the dispatch? I was dispatched to a 52, which is a shooting. Um, originally, the address, they believed it was on Spence and Murfreesboro, which was the opposite direction of the actual uh, Waffle House that had the shooting. Um, I proceeded to head northbound, which is inbound on Murfreesboro, towards that Waffle House when uh, dispatch received more information that it was not that Waffle House. Um, at that time, I proceeded to pull a U-turn in the middle of the road, and at the entire time I'm responding on driving lights and sirens, which is emergency code three for us. Um, I turn around in the middle of the road, and I proceed to head towards the correct direction. However, there was no address listed at the time because it was a brand new Waffle House. So we didn't have an, a physical address, but because it was a high priority call, a South officer that was familiar with the area was able to tell me uh, roughly about where it was. What is a high priority call? High priority calls are code three calls, which uh, we go lights and sirens. Um, so there's gonna be 52s, you know, like bank robberies, 52s are shootings, bank robberies, um, anything where life is in danger, we're gonna go lights and sirens to these calls. Okay. Um, it, how often have you had to respond to a code 52? I've been on numerous shootings throughout my career. Um, I would say that this shooting at the Waffle House is to a different extent, uh, caliber of uh, injuries to the people that were there. Uh, I've seen you know, people shot in the legs and arms and stuff like that and that survived, but the Waffle House was definitely uh, more um, gruesome and uh, deadly. Okay. Um, were you alone in your police vehicle? Yes, sir. Uh, we ride single in our own patrol cars. Unless we're like, have some kind of cars that have uh, mechanical malfunctions, we uh, Metro Police ride single units. And about how long did it take you to arrive? Um, uh, roughly maybe, I guess estimate 10, 10 minutes or so. About 10 minutes? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what, if anything, did you do when you got to the, to the Waffle House? Uh, when I got close to the Waffle House, um, due to not being familiar with the area, um, I turned off my siren but kept my lights on. And I was trying to see if I could hear any gunshots because I did not know if Mr. Uh, Ranking was still inside, actively shooting at the victims inside. Um, and it was a new construction area, so I, I, I didn't know exactly where I was at. Um, as I approached, I had my lights still on and I observed the Waffle House out my passenger window to my right. Um, I proceeded to drive into the parking lot and it was it was very quiet. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear any screaming. I didn't hear anybody or I didn't see anybody running. Um, and then I came around the corner to the front of the Waffle House and exited my vehicle. Okay. And were you uh, approached by anyone when you as you pulled in? Yes. Um, when I exited my vehicle, it was dark, and um, I observed a male limping coming directly towards me. Um, I didn't have my weapon drawn at the time, and I didn't know who was approaching me, but I could tell something was, he was injured. Uh, he, he began to approach me, and I heard him say, I fought him, I fought him. And then at the time, I um, was able to speak with Mr. Shaw, and um, he said, I fought him, I fought him. And I said, I need to know what he looks like. And Mr. Shaw was very um, 
very distraught and emotional. And it was, it was hard at first to try to get him to give me a description. He just kept saying he was naked. And I, I had to guide him and say, I need to know what he looks like. I need you to try to remember something else besides him being naked. And then he said a green jacket. Um, and he said blonde hair, a male white. Okay. Was he able to tell you where the shooter yeah. was? Uh, he said he ran on foot outbound Murfreesboro. So that's away from downtown, which is south. Did you relay that information over to over your radio? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Um, after getting a description of the shooter from Mr. Shaw, what mm -hmm. did you do after that? Uh, after the description, I began to walk towards the front door of the Waffle House. Um, I immediately observed a male Hispanic. Uh, he was laying on his side, and I, I think I touched him or tried to kneel down to see if he was alive or not. And... Um, he was shot, he, he had an obvious shot to the head and um, there was blood and then you could see his brain and you could tell that he was obviously uh, deceased. Um, I proceeded to walk past him and uh, observed a male black uh, laying on his stomach, large amount of blood around his head and uh, I could tell he was deceased at the time. and. Uh, I got on the radio and advised that I had uh, code three and four injuries. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and I relayed that and I said I need uh, code three to four injuries and I need more people out here. What? Um, code three to four injuries is code three is a uh, very um, critical injuries, uh, life threatening injuries. Um, code four means that they're deceased. Okay, so based on what you saw as you approached the Waffle House, yes, could you tell that those two individuals appeared to be deceased to you? Yes, sir. And um, I observed um, the windows to the Waffle House had some damage um, approaching, and um, that's when I entered the Waffle House after relaying the information of the two deceased people outside of the Waffle House. Officer Johns, you you testified that you've seen you responded to a bunch of shootings before yes what what about what you were you saw made you kind of emotional right here as you testify today um their extent of their injuries um the people that i dealt with inside conversations that i had with people that didn't make it um i think about it quite often yeah, yeah. As you went inside the Waffle House, what what if what did you do, or what did um, you see? When I walked inside the Waffle House, there was uh, two females, two female blacks. Uh, when you walk in directly, there was a booth kind of to the left. Um, large amount of blood underneath the table. Um, sorry. Okay, the two female blacks underneath the table. One. She was deceased. Uh, she was underneath the table, a large amount of blood. Uh, she was in a very unnatural position. It wasn't like she was trying to hide. It was apparent that um, she, the per she had no control over her body in the way that she was underneath the table. Um, I knew at that time that she was deceased. And uh, the other female black, I thought she was deceased at first. Um, she was slouched down so the seats like this and the table's kind of up. She fell down and was sitting on her butt and was slouching and was looking up and was not moving. And I thought she was deceased, but then I heard a loud gasp come from her. And I didn't know if that was her body trying to wake her up. When people pass away, their brain, if it's still functioning, will try to wake them up. And I approached her and she blinked. And I didn't know if she was responsive or not, so I was trying to talk to her, and I, she wasn't answering any questions. And I said, I need you to blink if you understand me, and then she blinked. So I knew that she was still alive. Um, I was really concerned about her because she was unable to move and was not very responsive, so she kind of drew a lot of my attention. I uh, began to uh, talk to her, and she, due to her not being able to physically say any words to me, um, we had a actual officer at Metro that got shot and um, she comes to our academy and speaks to us 
and she said when she got shot, she counted to 10 to keep her brain active, and uh, it's the first thing I could think about was trying to get her to count to stay alive. Yeah. So you asked her to count to 10? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, was she able to do that? She would say one, two, but she, she, she could never really make it up to 10. Um, I had another individual there. I asked him to keep her keep in conversation and keep her engaged so I could get her to, you know, try to fight to stay alive. Other than trying to talk her through um, to survive, mm -hmm. what other aid, if any, did you provide to her? Um, I had, there was towels. I remember asking a worker at the Waffle House for towels if they had anything to put pressure on the wounds and uh, the, one of the workers there was able to put towels on the counter. I grabbed some towels and I threw them to Mr. Silva's brother um, because prior to that, he told me there was two people on his side of the Waffle House that were injured, one to the arm and one to the leg. What side of the Waffle House would that have been? Uh, when you come in, when you're facing the Waffle House, uh, the first two were initially by the door and then you go down the counter and it's like an L shape. And then uh, Mr. Silva and his fiance were on the left in the left corner of the Waffle House. Okay. And you said that there was someone that you threw some towels to? Who was that? Yes, I threw that to Mr. Silva's uh, brother. Okay. Um, and what was he doing with the brother? What was Mr. Silva? Uh, Mr. Brother? Silva was telling me that there was two people injured on his side and that he was his brother. Uh, he was concerned about uh, his brother and his fiance. And I said, can you render aid to them until I can get more officers and uh, EMS, which is our emergency medical services and fire department out there to perform life-saving efforts? Okay. Um, as you were rendering aid to um, the first female and Mr. De Silva was rendering aid to the other two individuals, mm -hmm. um, did anyone else, any other police officers or paramedics come into the to the Waffle House? Yes, uh, the second officer that responded is a canine officer, Officer Gilpin. He, uh, while I was rendering aid to the first female black, um, he approached me and said, do you need a tourniquet? And I advised him I did not need a tourniquet at this time to go check on um, the Silva and his fiance on the left side because I didn't know their extent of the injuries. Um, at that time, he proceeded to the left and I think very shortly after the fire department came in and um, that's when I moved over to De Silva's side to render aid. Who did the they Silva. take? Who did the fire department or the paramedics take first? They ended up taking Mr. Silva, De Silva first. Okay. Um, I, they, we didn't know the extent of his injuries until the fire department got there. We, he obviously had a gunshot wound to his uh, right arm. It appeared to be an exit wound. Um, we cut his pants, and cut his shirt and observed a small entry wound to his chest. And that's when the EMS decided that he had to go first, that the, his injuries were going to be pretty extensive. Was Mr. Da Silva alert or, or awake? He was alert. Um, I spoke with him, and he kept saying, it hurts, it hurts, my arm hurts. And I said, I even told his brother, I was like, you know, he's talking. And um, I said, I need you to, I know it hurts, but it hurts means that you're alive and you're aware that, you know, that something's going on. I just, I need you to stay awake for me and stay alert. And then he was loaded on the, the gurney to take out to the ambulance. Okay. Um, and what, a, when the first female when uh, that you were tending to, when, mm -hmm. if at all, did a paramedic come to provide her uh, assistance? Um, there was two ambulances that I think that arrived at the exact same time. So when we were dealing with the Silva, they uh, began to pull her out from underneath and she let out a very grueling and screeching scream when they were pulling her out from underneath that table. Um, and I believe that she was the second one to be transported. What were her injuries? The injuries that I observed on her was a gunshot wound to her arm and her leg. And I couldn't tell if she was struck anywhere else. She wasn't bleeding um, extensively or heavily or anything like that. But uh, I, was, I was very concerned about her because she was having a hard time of staying awake and conscious. Were you able to see any uh, entrance and or exit wounds to her arm? Yes. There was one probably about maybe forearm or elbow area somewhere around here on her and then I think on her like quad 
area is another gunshot wound to her as well. And, and what did that that injury appear like? Um, that appeared as a clear gunshot wound, and it appeared to be. Um, it didn't look like an entry wound. It appeared to be an exit wound on her. And um, you you talked about Mr. De Silva's wounds. What it, there was a you mentioned a, a, another female who had an yes. injury, a gunshot wound. Um, that was uh, uh, Mr. De Silva's fiance. She was uh, laying back in between the counter and the entranceway to the chef cook area. Um, she was on the phone with her mother, and I could hear her mother because she was on speakerphone and she was talking to her mom. And uh, her left leg, underneath by her calf, underneath her knee, it was just gone. It was it was a really big, big wound hole. I mean, there was really nothing left of her leg. It was being held on by. Um, very small amounts of skin and maybe some muscle. Um, her leg was, uh, it would, it's equivalent to, you know, a very combat wound you would sustain in combat um, out at, you know, the troops out in uh, Iraq and stuff like that. Um, were you able to provide her with any aid or assistance? Yes. Um, when they took the Silva out on the gurney, I immediately began to render aid to her. I had a towel and I, I was trying to hold her her leg in place, like the, the ankle and the foot where the calf is supposed to be was dangling. So I was trying to keep that as secure as possible and was hoping that you know they could save that leg. And I was holding it with a towel. And then EMS, another uh, EMS personnel arrived and we placed her wound in like a it's like a makeshift air cast that would keep the wound stable and we we placed her leg in that and um, I was trying to speak with her and make sure that she was staying awake and she was very concerned about her fiance um, and I was just trying to tell her you know everything's okay we got fire and police here now and you're gonna be you're okay and we're gonna take care of you and make sure you get home okay um, where was Officer Gilpin at that time? Um, at that time when the EMS arrived and he knew that I was okay and I had enough backup, Officer Gilpin asked me one more time if I needed anything and I told him I did not need assistance and I told him to go find Mr. Ranking. I told him to go get him. Um, okay. Were there any other victims that were in need of emergency treatment inside the Waffle House at that time? Uh, no, sir. It was just those individuals. Okay. Your Honor, um, this time I'd like to pass up a uh, group of pictures. These, uh, a copy of these have already been provided to defense. Officer Johns, do you uh, recognize those uh, images? Uh, yes, I do. And, um, and what I've handed you is a composite of, a, of about 11 photos which have been pre-marked uh, A through K. Um, are those images a fair and accurate depiction of the Waffle House at uh, 3517 Murfreesboro Pike uh, in Antioch, Tennessee, as it appeared on April 22, 2018? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. I'd ask that these be made the state's first exhibit. Okay. Do you need them back? And, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, publish them to the jury through uh, digital, a digital copy published to the jury.
Um, Officer Johns, I'm showing you Exhibit 1A. Would you, um, what is this picture, a picture of? This is a picture of the Waffle House. Um, that gold truck in the handicapped spot is a truck that Mr. Ranking drove to the Waffle House in and committed a assault on the people out there. Okay. And this is Exhibit 1B. Um, I believe you said this is the Waffle House that you responded to. Is that located in Nashville, Davidson County? Yes, sir. All right. Um, this is Exhibit 1C. What does this show? This is the entranceway to the Waffle House, and um, these are the first two victims right there by the door. Um, we had to put up the black thing to shield it from the media at the time, so we didn't want them to see the bodies that were outside of the Waffle House. Those are the first two victims that were obviously shot in the um, in the head and were deceased. Okay. Um, this is Exhibit 1D. What is this? This is the entranceway to the Waffle House. Um, this is the door that I had to walk into, and um, and you can see Mr. Ranking's truck right there in the parking handicap parking spot right there, the front of it. Uh, are you to the right side of the image? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> This is Exhibit 1D. Um, yes, this is the entranceway again, and you can see blood on the on the glass, and I believe that is a bullet hole in the glass above the American flag as well. Okay, and I'm gonna show one F. With That's a blood stain, and it appears to be a handprint of some type um, okay. above the American flag. That is it the entrance exit to the Waffle House. All right. 1G, what is this, what does 1G show? Um, on the ground where the white towel, that's where the first two victims are, were located in that booth. Um, the glass that is shattered is from when Mr. Ranking shot into the business from outside. Um, I do believe that some of that glass when it initially came through uh, was projectiled toward one of the workers that was behind the counter at the time. Okay. Um, she did, I'm sorry. I don't think she sustained any life-threatening injuries at the time from that. The the white towel, is there it, is there any blood or any other matter right there? Yes, there's. you can obviously see a large pool of blood to the left of the towel. The towel is stained in blood, and that is the towel that I use to perform life-saving efforts on uh, the first victim. Okay. I'm going to show you um, one one H one H. Sorry, this is one H. Could All you right. please tell me what this shows? Yes, um, one H shows. Um, so this is once you enter the Waffle House, you turn left. The counter is to the right, where you would receive your food if you're sitting next to the counter. And this is going towards uh, Mr. De Silva and his fiance, which are on the right side of this counter. You wouldn't be able to see them in this picture. But this is where that bullet that came through the glass and the glass project out toward the worker on the other side of that counter. Okay. Um, now I'm gonna show you one eye. What does one eye show? Those are the, so this counter right here is where um, uh, Mr. De Silva and his fiance, they were right in between. You see that shoe right there. I believe that's Ms. De Silva, or Mr. De Silva's fiance's shoe. And she was kind of in, in between the counter and the entranceway to the kitchen uh, laying down. And Mr. De Silva was laying right there on the ground. That's where I was attempting to save Mr. De Silva's life right there. Okay. And on this, on this picture, obviously the screen shows a little blue menu box. That's not the image, but... Uh, right next to that, are you able to see anything that, uh, I guess, related to the victims or their injuries uh, as you saw that day? Um, just right next to the menu, you can see where there's blood right there, and that's going to be consistent where you Miss. Can circle the screen with I can paper. circle it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, like right here. The menu kind of blocks it, but there's, there's blood right there, and this is a. Uh, that's going to be Mr. De Silva's fiance's shoe, I believe. All right. Now I'm going to show you one J. And this is a firearm that was used 
to commit uh, the assaults on the victims. Um, while I was, when I first went in there, um, one of the workers brought to my attention that the rifle was still there. He didn't say it was rifle, he just said the gun was here. And I said, what kind of gun is it? He said it's the big gun. And um, through my training, I knew that there was no mag in it. And based off of what Shaw told me, and I could tell that the bolt was locked to the rear, that means the gun did not have any bullets in it and it was inoperable. Um, I had, when other officers arrived, I had another officer standing with that weapon to make sure nobody would uh, touch it or tamper with it. But that's where the gun was when you, when you found it? Yes, it was directly behind the counter where the chefs uh, were. And that's what Mr. Shaw stated, that he threw the gun. Okay. And lastly, I'm gonna show you exhibit 1K. What is this area? This is the, the cook area. Um, to the right, roughly around this area, is where the first two female victims were sitting. And that is where I was rendering aid to them. Um, and this counter right here where the basket is, is roughly about where I was able to grab the towels from the worker and uh, place them on the victims and throw them to Mr. De Silva as well. And do you see the, the bathroom area in this picture? Yes. Um, this is the bathroom area. Um, I believe that the window is shattered. Uh, this is where Mr. Shaw stated that he told me he ran to the bathroom area. Um, he stated that he, he, what he thought was the gun went dry. I don't remember the exact words that he told me, but he said at that time, he said to save his life, he went out there and um, fought Mr. Ranking and was able to gain control of the gun and throw the gun and push him out the store. Uh, he said, I pushed him out the store. I fought him, I pushed him out the store, I threw the gun. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So now, Officer Johns, or Detective Johns, my apologies. It's okay. Detective Johns, after all the victims uh, who were in need of emergency care were taken away by yes. ambulance, what, if anything, did you do next? I got my vehicle and I accessed a system that officers have access to. I ran the plate of the truck that, um, that was in the handicapped spot that Mr. Shaw told me was his truck. Um, at the time, it came back, I believe it was Illinois, and I called the department where the license plate came back to. I spoke to somebody over there at dispatch. Um, she said, I asked if they had a photo of him because I didn't have any photo on our computer system at the time of him. And he had no, uh, at the time, I don't think he had any kind of record with us. Um, she was unable to provide me with a picture of Mr. Ranking at first. Um, she put me in touch with the Illinois State Police that had a sergeant on uh, duty. At this time, I spoke with the sergeant over there I described what was going on. We gave our ORI, which is specific to show that you know we're police officers and that we're not just a, a civilian calling in asking for critical information. Um, the sergeant at the Illinois was able to give me the picture of Mr. Ranking. Um, I gave that to Sergeant LaChance, a de South detective at the scene, and I think that was disseminated between all the officers out there that had access to their phones. Um, and through the system, I was able to find an NES statement that had an apartment location for Mr. Ranking, which was not far from the Waffle House. Um, I mean, I, maybe less than a mile or so from the Waffle House. And I do believe he was found in the woods between the Waffle House and the apartment complex. Do you remember what the, that address was? I think it was in the 3000 block of Mountain Spring or something like that. I'm not really sure. Um, when did, <clears throat> did you document that in your, in a supplement report? Yes, it's in my supplement. And would re, uh, reviewing your supplemental report help refresh your recollection as to what the address was? Yes, it would help re refresh my recollection. Now, Detective Johns, just look at it and see when, once your recollection is refreshed, mm -hmm. and then please put the report down and then let us know what, what it is. All right, um, the address is gonna be 5000 Mountain Spring, Antioch, Tennessee. Okay, and was there an apartment number? Yes, sir, it's uh, apartment 409. 
Um, and did you provide the address to the other officers? Yes, I gave it to Sergeant Lachance and uh, the South Detective. Uh, once I was able to retrieve that information, I was actually part of the, the officers that were not only looking in the neighborhoods, but I was securing the area of the apartment complex until our SWAT team arrived. Um, when our SWAT team arrived, I stood on the perimeter until it was breached and um, Mr. Rankin was not inside the apartment. And how long did you participate in the search? It was uh, hours. Um, I think I worked maybe, I mean, it felt like close to two days straight working. It was roughly 16, 18 hours straight. Uh, it was my night shift, normal shift from 1030 to 7, and I think I got off the next day at like maybe 5 in the afternoon or something like that. Um, Detective Johns, were there, just to be clear, were there any other police officers inside on the scene at the Waffle House before you arrived? There was no other officers on scene. I was the first first responder to arrive on scene. All right. Detective Johns, thank you for your service that night. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, officer. Would you please state and spell your name for the record? Officer John Gilpin, and that's J-O-H-N-G-I-L-P as in Paul, I-N. Officer Gilpin, where are you employed? Uh, here at the Metro National Police Department. And how long have you been an, an officer with the Metro Nashville Police Department? Uh, since March 1st, 2011, so it'll be 11 years in about a month. Okay. And uh, what is your current assignment? I'm currently assigned to the K-9 unit. What is the K-9 unit? Uh, we have a couple of different functions. The particular function that I do is I have a cross-train apprehension and narcotics detection dog. So we do street uh, level work as well in terms of um, tracking for suspects, locating, doing searches of that nature. And then we also do like narcotic searches upon request and things like that. So you have, you work with a dog? Yes, sir. And is he your partner? Yes, sir. Sounds pretty cool. Um, how long have you been doing that? Uh, I transferred to K-9, I believe it was June of 2017, so approximately four years. And, and you said that your K-9 partner, do you mind sharing his name? Brax. Sorry, I should have already said that, but yes. That Brax is cross-trained in apprehension and detection, what does that mean? Uh, so our primary function is to be a support unit for patrol. Uh, anytime a call comes out where there's a shooting, a robbery, any type of violent felony that takes place, and the suspect, if we have a good description of the suspect, and they flee on foot in an area that we can use the dog because the dog is capable of scent tracking much better 
than humans are, and we will utilize the canine partner to try to track a subject from the scene of a crime and get a direction of flight and track them until we either make an apprehension or at least try to help gather information for investigators later as in terms of a direction of flight. And what kind of dog is Brex? He is a solid black German Shepherd. How does Brex let you know whether or not he's detected something that you're looking for? Uh, in terms to uh, like suspect apprehension uh, or for narcotics. Apprehension, yes. Um, when he's when we're tracking a suspect, typically we will try to get a description of where the last known direction of flight was for that subject, and I'll bring my dog to that part, and we'll try to get him what we call in the scent. And what he will do is he will take his nose and he'll put it down to the ground for the you know. And as he tracks, he will follow that scent. He follows the scent of the the freshest scent. We don't do like on TV where we hand an article of clothing and he smells that and then start tracking. That's not how we do it. Uh, we do it in based off kind of the freshest scent for that, uh, for that scene, that area. So we will deploy him in that area until he picks up that scent and then he will follow that scent until we either get to the source of it or until we lose it. Um, it and that could be because they got in a car. A lot of times it's because they've crossed a hard surface like a parking lot or road things that are much more difficult for the dog to be able to track scent wise that way. But for the most part, when he is tracking, he, he has his head down and you can hear his nose kind of popping because he's really smelling and he can smell those. Um, and it's it tends to be skin cells, um, different, um, you know, things like that. The, the, the chemicals that the person's releasing and as they're, in fear or in that fight or flight kind of mentality, the pheromones that they're dropping, um, skin cells, things like that, are what he's actually smelling and detecting, and we use utilize that to try to f track to the source of that. So, um, were you working with Brax on the, I guess, the early morning hours of April twenty second, two thousand eighteen? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. And did you receive the dispatch to respond to a Waffle House located at thirty five seven thirty five seventy one Murfreesboro Pike? Yes, sir. Um, and about what time did you receive the call? I believe the call came in at approximately uh, 3.30 in the morning. Okay. And what, what was the dispatch that you received? Uh, I believe the call came out as an active shooter. I don't remember if they used the 10 code, which is, we have different codes assigned to different calls. Um, I don't remember if they put out the 10 code, the code 9000 for active shooter, or if they said over the air plain text that it was an active shooter, but it was an active shooter dispatch. Okay. About what time did you arrive on the scene? I arrived on scene at approximately 3.35. Okay. Um, and what did you, what, as you were driving there, were you, were you driving in emergency mode? Yes, sir. With, with lights and sirens? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what did you do when, what did you observe, if anything, when you arrived on the scene? Uh, when I first started pulling up, I wasn't really familiar with that location in particular. As I got closer, I saw uh, Officer Johns' patrol car, who was first on scene, already in the parking lot. And that's when I turned off all of my equipment and turned into the Waffle House parking lot myself and uh, got out of my car to see, to kind of establish what we had in terms of the immediate response to the call. And I went inside uh, to assist Officer Johns, and I saw two uh, two person, two people laying in the parking lot, or one right by the door and one on the sidewalk close to the door. Um, did they appear to be alive to you? Uh, no. Um, the The first male that I encountered was near the door, and it was very apparent that he was deceased. Um, he had a very traumatic head injury. His uh, skull was crowned out towards the front. And it appeared to have, you know, brain matter material coming out, and there was a pool of blood under his head, uh, right there by the door. A little bit further down the sidewalk, um, where there were some other cars parked, there was another person laying deceased, or uh, presumed to be deceased at the time, because they were motionless, and the way that their body was kind of laying was not a natural position. It looked like somebody had been shot while they were running and fell. Um, and based on what I was seeing and hearing from inside, I didn't check 
for any kind of vital signs on either of those people. I went straight inside to um, help s to start stabilizing that scene. Okay. And uh, when, when you went inside to help stabilize the scene, what did you do? Uh, the first thing that I did is I asked Officer Johns what he needed. I asked him if he needed a tourniquet with the person that he uh, was helping. He said no. Um, but uh, there was another gentleman around the corner that he said he needed some help. So I started towards him. Um, I noticed when I came in the front door that there was um, a woman that appeared to be uh, deceased underneath a booth. Uh, she was turned in a very awkward position. The only way I know how to describe it is kind of like when you have a small child that's at a booth at a restaurant and they're trying to get out to go to the bathroom and nobody wants to get, they like climbed down underneath the booth and was turned uh, backwards and kind of bent backwards and there was a lot of blood there. And then there was another female there as well that was also in the booth and slid down, but face up. And um, I knew one of them was prob probably deceased as well. Um, but I passed towards him, passed them to went towards um, the gentleman that Officer John said needed some uh, needed some help because he was injured. As you as you were walking through the restaurant, did you see any spent rifle cases? Yes, there was lot of ammunition shell casings, 223, 556 rifle rounds that were on the ground. Uh, there was a very distinct smell of, you know, freshly spent gunpowder um, was in the was in the Waffle House as well. Um, now, as you go over to the to help the other two individuals you were just talking about, what 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 did you do when you got to them? Um, so there was, as soon as you go in, there's a few booths, and then there's kind of the counter with the bar stools, and then it kind of goes around a corner to where there's more seating and goes kind of behind the, the counter, I presume, where the cooks uh, were. As I went around the corner of the bar, um, I observed there was a female laying on the ground, or not laying, she was sitting on the ground, but she was on the phone with someone. Um, and she had a devastating leg injury. Um, and then she was beside another male who kept saying, my arm hurts, my arm hurts really bad. My arm is killing me. That was just over and over. It was apparent that something had happened to his arm. And there was some blood, if my memory serves, on the sweater or the shirt that he was wearing, but it wasn't pooling but it was apparent that there was an injury to his arm the the lady who you described as having a devastating leg injury um what what do you mean by that uh, it was apparent that she had been shot in the leg if my memory serves just below the knee um it was all but severed uh, there was a little bit of uh, tissue, I presumed skin, maybe a little bit of, you know, muscle mass there, but for the most part, the leg appeared to be severed. Uh, it and the thing that stood out to me was how calm she was, and she was on the phone with someone. I don't know who she was on the phone with, but um, she was very calm and coherent, and she wasn't bleeding a lot. The wound wasn't, you know, she wasn't uh, spewing blood by any means, and she was coherent. So I went towards the, the gentleman that was talking about having been his arm being hurt and applied a tourniquet to him. And what is a tourniquet? Uh, it's basically a device that we use that we can wrap legs and arms with that cuts off the blood flow to that extremity. So if you have some type of devastating injury to your arm or your leg, we'll apply a tourniquet up higher than that wound and that will quit that will stop the body from pumping blood to that wound and trying to keep um, a person from bleeding to death. Um, at some point, uh, <clears throat> were you able to, were, were any of the paramedics able to come inside the Waffle House to assist you? Uh, after a few minutes on scene, um, 
like we we applied the tourniquet, um, and then Officer Johns was working on another uh, person as well that needed medical attention. We we tried to make a quick triage of how many uh, confirmed dead we had versus how many critical injuries versus how many what we we have a code system for the level of injury. Code four being deceased, code three being. Uh, life-threatening injuries, code two being severe but not necessarily life-threatening, and then code one being lesser minor injuries. So we were trying to make that assessment of how many code four, code three, code two victims we had so we could start establishing our EMS response. And then uh, while we were doing that, the first uh, ambulance, the first group of uh, fire department personnel started arriving. Okay. Um, once they arrived, what did you, what if anything did you do? Uh, once they came inside, I made contact with uh, Officer Johns again, asked him if he needed me for anything else inside. He said no, he had it, and at that point I went outside to get ready to start trying to deploy my canine partner to begin a track. Um, as soon as I went outside, there was a witness that was talking to another officer, and he was giving a description at that time to that officer. And I, interrupted basically stopped their inter their conversation said repeat everything you just said for in terms of description so that way i could have a first-hand account of the description of the suspect before i began tracking what was the description uh it was a male white with uh orangish red hair and that was completely nude okay. and i had a direction of flight going outbound on murfreesboro on the south side of murfreesboro road Okay, um, and what did you do once you got the direction of flight and the description? Uh, I immediately went over to my patrol car, uh, got my tracking harness and lead out, and deployed my canine partner Brax, and we began tracking. Okay, um, and so what did you, as you begin tracking, where do you go? So from the parking lot, going uh, outbound Murfreesboro is going away from downtown Nashville. It's going um, just out towards the county line. So we were on the south side of that and we started tracking out of that parking lot and we're going in a straight line. Um, about the time that we got out of the parking lot, dispatch came over the radio and updated that another victim from the scene had fled in a vehicle and had just called in and had saw him running um, further down Murfreesboro. So given the kind of uh, time delay I was already on, uh, I put I was still very close to my car, so I put Brax back in my car, and then we drove closer to where the sighting of him was, and then I redeployed from a closer uh, location trying to make up some time there. Okay. Um, and so rede when you say redeploy, what does that mean? Uh, got my canine partner back out of the car, and we resumed the track from a closer location than by trying, instead of trying to do it all on foot and catch up to somebody on foot, we got we drove, got back out of the car, and then reinitiated the track from a closer position. Was Did Brax give any indication that he was able to pick up a scent? Yes, we were, uh, we were tracking um, as we were coming down the south side of Murfreesboro, running parallel. Uh, we, we tracked, f I hesitate to give an exact distance, but we tracked for a good little ways, uh, a couple of minutes until we got to um, an oversized, like a driveway or a street that led up to an apartment complex um, or a development in, off the south side of Murfreesboro Road. And we, we lost that trackable scent at about that road. Okay. Um, well, did did the weather change at any point while you were conducting your track? Not at that time. It rained later in the day, but that was after sunrise. That was that was hours after the incident had happened. Okay, understood. But so, were you able to complete track? Use uh, Brax to locate the uh, the suspect you were looking for? No, sir. I was. We did not successfully find anyone. Uh, once we lost the track, we started doing what we called a grid, kind of a grid search or a sweep, where we went out, we went past that road going towards um, the old Starwood Amphitheater, which was further down the street, 
trying to see if we could pick it back up. We broke off and trying to find different areas where it might have picked back up, and we weren't able to pick that back up. How long did you participate in the search to find? Uh, uh, the overall search or yes. just on the truck itself? The overall search. Uh, I was relieved at 6.15 p.m. the following evening. What shift did you work? Uh, midnights the previous night. So I came in at 10.30 at night uh, the previous night, and then I was there until 6.15 at the next evening. Okay. Um, Officer Gilpin, I'd like to show you the map if I can on, on the overhead projection. Yes, that's Murfreesboro Pike. Okay. And are you able to, de to determine where the Waffle House approximately is located? I believe so. Can I touch the screen? Yeah, you can touch it. Absolutely. It's right in here. And what I'm going to do is, it's okay, I'll make that circle on the actual map. And okay. Red. You said about here? Yes, sir. In which direction did you go uh, on Murfreesboro Pike as you followed? Um, as we traveled, we started, like I said, out of that parking lot, and we were on the south side of Murfreesboro, and we tracked. Um, I apologize, it's not letting me mark on the screen. Okay, I can indicate it. Right. 33 degrees To clear it on that screen there. Oh. There we go. Um, we began tracking this direction on the on that south side of Murfreesboro, paralleling Murfreesboro Pike. Okay. I'm gonna mark with a black marker this time and do the same arrow you just did. Is this this correct like this? Yes, sir. Um, and you said that you, at some point, tracked him to the opening or the driveway into a, an apartment complex. About where was that? Okay. Uh, that would be this road here. Okay. So we tracked up until this point because that is just before that uh, TVA power line access road. All right. And I'm going to make that same circle on the Center right here? Yes, sir. Um, I'd ask this be made. Make it with it. Exhibit two. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. Wrong. Can you see that picture, Officer Gilpin? Yes, sir. Okay. Just a, a few things. Um, this overhead um, picture, did you make this or do you, did somebody no, else just make it show it to you? Yes, sir. Do you have any idea if this overhead picture is what it was, the, the area was like at the time of the incident back in 18 or if this is a more recent picture? Do you have any idea? I couldn't tell you, sir. Okay. Is it fair to say that Murfreesboro Pike um, is, a, is a major road with, with quite a bit of traffic? 
it is a busier road um, in terms of being a main thoroughfare of non-interstate or non-kind of parkway uh, traffic. Okay. And my understanding is I heard what you said about going to the Waffle House and then um, someone told you that the suspect was a completely naked white male. Yes. Okay. And so you were looking for that person if you could if you could spot a completely naked white male outside there. Yes. Sir. You were also using your dog to try to track them. Yes, sir. Okay. And so when you said that you when you initially deployed the dog, was that at the Waffle House? Itself? Yes, that was from the Waffle House parking lot. And you weren't getting, uh, I guess, a track that's good enough? We, we started. Uh, the only reason that I repositioned to redeploy was just based off of the time delay that I was on, uh, knowing that a suspect was on foot, which typically means running at as a high rate of speed as fast as I can. Mm -hmm. I was already several minutes behind. Right. So when... Had the dispatch not came in for an updated sighting further out Murfreesboro Pike, I would have just continued on that track on foot. But based on time and the urgency to try to find the suspect before something else might happen, um, I felt it was urgent to kind of reposition my vehicle because I can drive faster than I can run, obviously. So I went a little ways down the road to closer to where the sighting was and then redeployed and we picked the track right back up. Okay. And just so that we're clear, you never saw any naked white males running or anything like that? No, okay. sir. And when you said you picked up the, the trail again, um, can you just, you can point to this image, just make a dot on it roughly where you you redeployed and picked up the, the trail? I can only kind of give a general idea. I believe that it's right in this area kind of in that either parking lot right there or that other little side street because it was a small little pull off okay. where I where I pulled into and you were able then to track the trail from that dot down to where the second red circle is right yes sir and did the trail go on Murfreesboro Road or a sidewalk on Murfreesboro Road no sir it was in the grass kind of paralleling Murfreesboro Pike um, okay. it was there wasn't to my not Recollection: There wasn't a sidewalk there. I think it's just the shoulder, um, and okay. it would it kind of paralleled uh, down Murfreesboro. And that's what I'm getting at. The track was very close to the street. Yes. Is that fair to say that? It, it yes. might not have been a sidewalk, but the track was very close to the street. Yes, sir. And from the time you picked it up here, now it, you just happened to start right there where that dot is, uh, picking up the trail again. But you could have possibly picked it up closer to the Waffle House, would you agree? Yes. Okay, but in any event, you, from there, from that dot that you put on there, which looks like roughly halfway between the Waffle House and the entrance to the apartment complex, um, you could pick up the scent in the grass near the street all the way into the entrance of the apartment complex. Yes, sir. Where it appeared to be the, the driveway that would go into the apartment complex. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it was a driveway into an apartment complex at that time. I thought it was a road, okay. but that's that's where. Okay. And did you uh, did you say you lost the scent at that point, or you just stopped? Tracking? We lost, like, the area where I knew he was tracking, because when he's tracking, he's very focused. He's head down. He's pulling. He's very driven in what he's doing. When he loses that track, he tends to... You know, his head comes up and he starts searching around and he gives indicators that he's not positively tracking the scent that he was. And that's where he started doing that, where he started looking around and started right. trying to sniff around to see if he could pick it back up. But he was not actively tracking and pulling me anymore once we got to that road. Okay. All right. Just one second, Your Honor, please. All right. Thank you. Thanks, sir. 
I mean, Jerry, we're going to recess for lunch at this point in time when it ends, and I will do this every time you leave the courtroom. Please keep in mind you cannot discuss anything about the trial. In this case, you must keep the cost to yourself, remain open minded. Go back and enjoy uh, your lunch, relax, and then, like I said, if you want to go outside, they'll escort you outside to get some fresh air or something.
Today's next witness is Investigator Daniel Connor. Investigator Connor, could you please state your full name for the record? Danielle Connor, first name D A N I E L L E, last name C O N N O R. And Investigator Connor, could you please describe where you're employed and what your position is? I am employed with the Metro Nashville Police Department as a crime scene investigator. And what is a crime scene investigator? A crime scene investigator responds to any scene or um, that detectives or patrol sergeants or officers uh, dispatch us to. We respond to process the scenes for evidence. Um, the processing includes photography, uh, note taking, diagramming. We also do ferro scans, which is an electronic device that will create a 3D view of the scene. And how long have you worked for the police department in that capacity? Um, as of today, approximately five and a half years. And did you respond to 3571 Murfreesboro Road on April 22nd of 2018? I did, yes. And can you describe when you got to the scene what you found? When I arrived on scene, uh, patrol officers were already there. The scene had already been put up with crime scene tape around the perimeter of the parking lot. Uh, there were multiple different units still responding when I responded. When um, my first initial view of the crime scene itself, I noted that there were three deceased individuals at the scene. I was also notified that several victims had been transported to hospitals. There were numerous cartridge casings in the parking lot and the interior of the business, as well as a firearm. And the parking lot contained several vehicles still. 
And for this particular scene, were you the only crime scene investigator that was working or did you work with a team? I worked with a team. When I responded initially, three partners responded with me. We all work the midnight shift and then we had two additional individuals meet us there later in the morning from the day shift team. Were you the lead investigator in that team? That's correct. And take us through kind of your process of leading that investigation. I know you've described the scene as, it, as you found it, but what were the first steps that you took? So when we first arrived on scene, I met with Detective Patton and the vice president of the Waffle House. It was imperative of, to me to view the surveillance video first off to get an accurate description of the suspect as well as an understanding of what took place, what the incident was. And were you able to do that? Yes. And have portions of that surveillance video been kind of put together to give an accurate depiction of what happened that night? As far as I know. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, at this time, there's no objection with defense. We have agreed that the surveillance video would be entered, but I would ask that this disc that has five separate videos on it be introduced as the next numbered exhibit. And Investigator Connor, you said that you viewed the surveillance video, is that correct? Yes, it is. And then what were your next steps? After viewing the surveillance video, I had established the back door to the restaurant as our what we deem like the working, uh, working entrance. That way we aren't going through the front door where I had viewed the suspect entering and exiting. That eliminates any additional evidence being introduced to that area as well as taking away any evidence. Um, after establishing that, uh, we had put up these black screens um, for the two victims outside the restaurant. Um, we do that to maintain their privacy and to keep the view of any additional people driving down the road from viewing the victims. After putting up the scene screens, we kind of had to take a step back out of the scene. There was some concern about the truck, so we had to wait for bomb squad to arrive and clear the truck. While they were doing that, from my view of the surveillance video, I had seen the suspect taking his jacket off as he exited, so my thought was, where is the jacket? Was it still with him, or had he maybe lost it or dropped it during his flight? So I had started to walk his path a flight south down Murfreesboro and located the jacket. And as part of that process, I know that you were describing photography and note taking mm -hmm. and Pharaoh scans. Did they use Pharaoh scans at this particular scene? Yes, we did. And can you describe what a Pharaoh scan is generally? So a Pharaoh scan is an electronic device. It uses a laser beam and mirrors to collect millions of data points. The data points are then put into a point cloud and using associated software that point cloud is then rendered into 3D imaging of the scene. We're not talking like a model. It'll be almost like a video. It'll allow anybody viewing it to view the scene as I saw it when I was processing it. So it'll be almost as though you're there walking through the scene with me when you view it. And is it Obviously, it's more complicated than this, mm -hmm. but is it kind of like taking a picture and wrapping it around so that you can move around that picture image? Yes, it's a 360 view. So you can rotate with the software. You can rotate the image you're looking at to look all around you up at the sky. Mm -hmm. And the Pharaoh scans that were done at this scene, I guess, are there a lot of them? Yes. And were they done of the exterior anterior of that scene? Yes, so we scanned both the exterior and the interior of the scene using two scanners, and then the scans from the two were stitched together to create an overall um, Faro viewing. Mm -hmm. And were photographs taken of that scene? Yes. And I, I would assume that there are a large number of photographs taken. We took almost 900 photographs. Um, including the overall of the exterior and interior, all evidence, the victims. 
Mm -hmm. And have certain photographs been linked into the Pharaoh scans for purposes of showing the Pharaoh to the jury at this trial? Yes, they have. And at this time, I would ask that the Pharaoh scan, which is on a thumb drive that we have, just be marked as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe would be number four. Sure. And I will ask to submit it once we are finished publishing it, but I would also ask to publish that to the jury. Well. Investigator Connors, can you kind of just describe what is being shown on the screen right here. So this is an overall, like what's termed as a bird's eye view of the scene itself. The little purple or blue or red little numbered markers are where each of the Pharaoh scanners have been set up and collected each individual scan. Now I am going to begin by going to the scan that is labeled 100-100. And you, can you describe what is seen here? And I am going to pan towards the south, or I'm sorry, towards the north no. of Murfreesboro Road. Yes, so here we have Murfreesboro Road. Across the street was a shopping complex where media and a lot of people were arriving for the scene. This is one of the entrances into the Waffle House off Murfreesboro Road from the north side. We had brought out our large crime scene truck out to the scene. Inside there's workbenches and all of our processing stuff that we can use to process evidence right inside the truck as well as to keep it safe and secure once it's collected. So here we have, you can see two sets of crime scene tapes. So we have the interior crime scene tape and the exterior. The interior maintains the scene itself. That uh, sidewalk in between we use as our area to like liaison with detectives and anybody else arriving to the scene and the exterior disallows anybody not allowed into the scene from coming even onto the sidewalk. And I'm going to go to scan 10101. And can you just describe what is seen here? So this scan has moved south down the sidewalk. Usually, the scanners are usually placed about 20 steps, 15 to 20 steps from each other um, so that there is some overlapping data. This is the Waffle House at 3571 Murfreesboro Pike. And there appears to be, I think you've already identified the beige truck. Yes. Can you describe what's next to it? Uh, so to the right of it, right here, is that black scene screen that I have been describing. So behind that, it was put up to block the view of one of the victims lying on the sidewalk. And it appears that the doors to that vehicle are open. Correct. Is that how the vehicle was found, or can you describe when I originally arrived on scene, the doors were shut. Um, they were open when bomb squad had cleared the vehicle. And did you determine anything about the other vehicles that were in the parking lot that day? So most of the vehicles were, they belonged to either patrons that were there at the time of the incident or workers. I had been later informed that the Honda at the front of the um, scan right here it what belonged to the victim, Mr. Perez, and that the car at to the right of the truck, this one right here, um, had belonged to, I believe, Sharita Henderson. And going to scan 100-102, can you describe what is shown here? This is also a view of the Waffle House, more of a direct view of the front door. Um, the Waffle House is located on the west side of Murfreesboro Pike, so this would be the east side of the restaurant. 
And moving to scan 004, can you describe what is shown here? Yes, so this is just another angle of that parking lot and the Waffle House. Moving down on the scan, you can see that the parking lot continued along the west side of the building, which also led to an exit um, over back over here that came out onto Summer Crest Boulevard. As you can also see, the little spots, um, it had started raining while we were out there. And the next scan is 003. Can you describe what is seen here? This is the northwest corner. Well, where the Waffle House is, is the northwest corner of this intersection. Yep. So on the streets here, we have this street right here is going to be Murfreesboro Pike. South is the farther away view, and it runs north. Going this way is Summercrest Boulevard. And then if you cross the intersection, it turned into Pinhook. And moving to scan 002, can you describe what is shown here? So this is a closer view of that intersection. Those trucks are parked on Summercrest Boulevard into the entrance of that neighborhood. And moving to scan 001. Yes, so in this view, you can see that more crime scene tape has been put up over here at the corner of the intersection. Um, that is where I had located the green jacket believed to have been Mr. Rankings when he had fled southbound on Murfreesboro Pike. And it appears that there are two people that are standing there. Yes, the two individuals here are officers. Anytime we find any evidence in an exterior part of the scene, um, we always make sure that an officer stands by it to ensure that it is not removed or tampered with. And moving to scan 000, can you describe what is shown here? So this is Closer to where that jacket had been found, this is the intersection of Murfreesboro. If you look up the hill in the view we have here, that is going to be southbound on Murfreesboro Pike. And where you have, right, right there, with the number one is the jacket I had been describing. It was green in color and labeled evidence marker one. And is that how the jacket was found? Yes, it is. And I am going to click on the evidence marker one. And this will be photograph. There are actually a set of 41 photographs that are included in the Pharaoh scan. Those will be marked A through Z O O. And those will be submitted as a collective exhibit with the actual Pharaoh scan. So the scan itself was going to mark it as exhibit four and the photos contained in presented four five. Four dash one A through double L. How do you want to do it? Which way do you want to do it? If we can do the thumb drive is four and then the photographs is five A through O O so that they're separated. And so this first photograph is exhibit five A. Could you describe what is shown in this photo? This is a, a photograph of that jacket marked as evidence one. That ruler placed up at the top corner of the photo, we placed for the Pharaoh scans. It helps to keep the Pharaoh scans accurate because we can use the Pharaoh scans to create a diagram later based on measurements. But that is the jacket that I had located at the southwest corner of the intersection. And this is Exhibit 5B. So within the jacket, in each of the front pockets, I had located a rifle magazine, each containing 30 cartridges. And can you mark those two mag yeah, magazines? Yeah, so here is one of the them that have been removed from the one pocket and then the other one's in, still inside that pocket. And this image is 5C. Could you describe what's shown here? Here I we are demonstrating with the photo the cartridges that were still inside the magazine. 
And Investigator Connor, did you collect those items as part of processing this scene? Yes, we did. And Your Honor, I'm going to ask the witness to hand over the item. Thank you. Do you recognize the item that's just been handed to you? Yes, it contains a ripped green jacket with possible blood stains. And is that the jacket that you collected from this scene that you've just described? Yes, it is. And Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that that be entered as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe would be number six. Do you recognize the item that was just handed to you? Yes, it contains two TAM rifle magazines from pocket of green jacket. And these items of evidence, do they have labels that have a complaint number and other identifiers where you're easily able to tell what the item is? Yes, so all of our packaging will have the complaint number associated with the incident, the time and date it was collected, as well as the location, and then the evidence seals will have my date and time, or my initials and the date. And Your Honor, I would ask that that item be introduced as the next numbered exhibit. Thank you. And I have a third item to hand this witness. Do you recognize the item that was just handed to you? Yes, it's 60 RP223 Remington cartridges from the magazines. And those were collected from the actual magazine and removed and packaged separately, is that correct? Correct, yes, so 30 each came from each of the two magazines. And Your Honor, at this time, I ask that that item be introduced as the next number exhibit, which I believe is number eight. And so I am going back to scan 001, which you have already described, and going back to scan 002, and now going to scan 006. Can you describe what is shown here? This is the parking lot that is located on the south side of the resident or restaurant. Um, here you can see we also still have the two layers of crime scene tape put up. And over, kind of by that, I believe by the blue tent over, somewhere over here, um, was the a second entrance exit to the restaurant off Summercrest Boulevard. And can you describe what is shown here? This is a view of the south side of the restaurant. The windows towards the bottom, the bottom middle squares, two of them appeared to have bullet strikes to them. And I am moving to the photograph that is actually labeled broken glass window. Can you describe what is shown here? So this is a close-up photograph of those two windows on the south side of the business. There appear to be at least two, if not more, uh, bullet strikes through that window, those two windows. And this is exhibit 5D. Can you mark on this screen what you're referring to as the at least three strikes to this window? Yes. So. There's one right there, there, 
and possibly a third one here. It's hard to tell with how the window had fractured and broken out because um, there could be additional in that missing glass. But for sure, the two at the bottom, we had clearly identified as bullet strikes through those windows. And I am moving now to scan 005. Could you describe what is shown here? This is the parking lot more towards the front of the business. The truck you see, the tan or gold truck, um, what is the suspect's vehicle. The little yellow markers uh, in the parking lot are marking the evidence or cartridge cases that we had located. You also can see in this view um, one of those black screens right here. This is where um, Mr. Perez had been located. And I am moving out to scan 009. Can you describe what is shown here? Yes, so this is, scans a little closer to that truck and the evidence. You can see that we marked the evidence starting with evidence marker two because the jacket had been one. Um, so you can clearly see two, three, four, five, and six, which were all cartridge casings. They were all RP223 Remington. And I am moving to what is marked in the Pharaoh's EM2 through six, which is exhibit 5E. Could you describe what is shown in this photograph? So this is a photo of that same view you had, had seen previously on the Pharaoh scan. Here you can clearly see that two is marking a cartridge case, three is marking a cartridge case. Um, and then there are more up by the door of his vehicle as well as near the sidewalk. Um, from this view, you can also see that the truck had an Illinois license plate on it. And did you collect all of those cartridge casings at, with the evidence markers two, three, four, five, and six? After all processing was done, yes. And I am moving to EM7 through 11, which is exhibit 5F. Could you describe what is shown here? This is a closer photograph of those markers 7 through 11 near the driver door of the truck. They also are all marking cartridge cases. All were also the same brand, RP223 Remington. And I am moving to what is marked in the Pharaoh as EM17. And this is also exhibit 5G. Could you describe what is shown in this photograph? When searching the scene, we also searched the bed of the truck and 17 is also marking an RP223 Remington cartridge case. And moving in the Pharaoh to what is marked as D2, and this is exhibit 5H. Can you describe what is shown here? This is the front of the truck. Um, this device back here behind the truck is that Pharaoh scanner that I've been referencing. Um, the top part of it, this part, will spin around to collect that 3D point scan. Evidence marker 12 on the hood, down past the hood near where the windshield wipers were was also a cartridge casing. And then right here is a bullet defect to the hood of the vehicle. And we had determined that it had gone from the driver's side towards the passenger side of the vehicle and you refer to that as a bullet defect, but does that appear to be a bullet hole where one of the bullets struck the hood of that vehicle? Yeah, bullet hole strike defect. Mm -hmm. And moving to what is marked in the Pharaoh as EM12. And this image is exhibit 5I. Could you describe what is shown here? This is a photograph of that cartridge casing I've been talking to that had been down um, within the hood by the windshield wipers. It's right here. So that was marked with evidence marker 12. 
And was that collected along with the other shell casings that you have testified about up to this point? Yes, it was. And moving to Theroscan 10016, could you describe what is shown here? The scanner is placed near the sidewalk or on the sidewalk near the entrance to the restaurant. To the right, right here, we have a window that also had a bullet defect in it. Um, and then this back parking lot is to the south side. And I am clicking on what is marked as broken <coughs> glass window, which this is also exhibit 5J, could you describe what is shown in this image? This is a photograph of that broken window that I was describing. There appeared to be a bullet defect to the window there. With the amount of glass that had shattered out, there could have also been several others. It was unclear, but we could see one for sure through that window. And still in this scan, kind of going back through the parking lot. Can you describe what is shown here? These black screens are those screens I had talked about, the scene screens that we put up to block the view of anybody on the street from the victim. The victim at the bottom of the screen closer in is Mr. Perez. And then you can see um, Mr. Sanderlin back here on the sidewalk, as well as the suspect's vehicle. And I am going to go to what is marked in the Pharaoh is V2 and what is also exhibit 5K. Can you describe what is shown in this image? That is victim Sanderlin who was found on the sidewalk near the northeast corner of the restaurant. And I am clicking on what is marked in the Pharaoh's EM 13 through 16. It is also exhibit 5L. Could you describe what is shown here? This is a photograph of several cartridge casings that we have marked 13, 14, 15 near on the sidewalk um, in front of the restaurant. That's the suspect's vehicle to the left side of the photo. The scale again is used in our Faro scans to create um, an accurate measurement. And I am moving to what is marked in the Faro as EM16. And this is also exhibit 5M. Could you describe what is shown in this image? This is the victim, Mr. Perez. Evidence marker 16 was marking the hat that was laying next to his body. And this photograph has been redacted in some way, is that correct? Correct, there have been in post-processing some, the little two black squares near the hat have been placed there. And the Pharaoh, can you describe kind of, I've image down and there's a white semicircle. Could you describe what that is? So the white semicircle, or it will be a full circle, but it is where the legs of the stand for the scanner are. It can't scan down around between those legs. So in the base of those triangle legs, there will be a circle that doesn't get scanned. That's why we do multiple so that any additional will cover and then complete that view of that towards the wall of windows on the left side, right here was what appeared to be a bullet strike to those bricks. And I am going to go what is marked as D4 within the Pharaoh. It is also exhibit 5N. Could you describe what is shown in this image? Yes, so here's a view towards the windows from that. Um, here we have marked that defect I was referencing, hold on, referencing with a sticker scale to give a size of the defect. 
and it appears that there was a ricochet mark leading to that defect on the concrete. If I could have just one moment. Your Honor, the parties have agreed to allow this witness to testify more than once, and at this time, I'm going to complete this portion of her testimony. Good afternoon. Hello. So just a, a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. You did extensive uh, pictures and uh, the Faro scanning of the parking lot, correct? Correct. And uh, specifically, there were several scans that dealt with the positioning of the vehicles in the parking lot, correct? Uh, to ca that captured the vehicles, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And. You said that the tan truck is the one you're attributing to being Mr. Ryan King's truck. Is that correct? It, from viewing the surveillance view, that's the vehicle that the suspect had exited out of. Yes. And that parking lot that you were in, it had two handicap spaces, if you recall. I don't Remember recall that? per se, but. It's fair to say from the pictures that you showed, I believe it being Exhibit 5E and the, the Faro scan number was 009 that the scan showed that there was an empty handicap spot in front of the window of of the Waffle House and another handicap spot where Mr. Reinking's truck was situated to the right of that. Would you dispute that? I'd have to see the photo again that you're referring to. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. Um, I mean, you looked at these photos to prepare for today, right? There were almost 900 photos. Right. So I can't say which exact photo you're referencing. Sorry. Right. And the ones that... And I'm just speaking now about the ones that, that you went over with the district attorney during your examination just now. You saw those when you were when right. she was showing them to you, correct? Correct. Do you recall there being a photo of Mr. Ryan King's truck? Yeah, were there you? were several photos of the truck. I can't remember right. the exact positioning. Right. My focus was more on the evidence in the photos. Right. Um, if you could show me the photo again that you're referring to. Do you have a physical copy of 5E? Your Honor, I'm uh, going to publish picture 5E. Mr. Morgan, that is on that table. All right, can you see that, that photograph? Yes, it appears his truck might be in a ha handicapped spot. Yes. All right, and uh, what I'm showing you has been previously marked as uh, the state's exhibit 5E. Okay. Just for clarity of the record. And do you note that there's a empty spot, I guess, to the left of the, the, the yellow lines? Over, are you referring to here? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that's where the actual windows to the Waffle House begin. Is that correct? That's correct. To the right of that is a brick wall. Is that right? To, to to the right of those windows, if you were staring at the Waffle House, kind of the, the same vantage point that this picture's taken, if you're standing at the Waffle House, to the right of those windows is a brick wall that's part of the Waffle House, correct? On the Waffle House or by the parking lot of the Waffle no, House? No, I mean, what you're, the, the Waffle, the building, the building that is the Waffle House, it's yes. brick, right? Yes. Huh? All right. So when you're staring at it, at the Waffle House from this vantage point where this picture was taken, do you see a, you know, if you're looking at the Waffle House, do you see a bunch of windows? To the left of the photo, yes, yes. or windows. To the right of the photo, what do you see? In front of the truck is brick, yes. Right, not glass. Correct. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Ms. Ray. Ms. Ray. 
Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Would you please would you please state your name for the record? Chelsea Owen. And Ms. Owens, can you spell your first and last names? C H E L S E Y um, O W E N S. Great, thank you. Um, back on April 21st, going into April 22nd, 2018, or in the early morning hours of that Sunday morning, April 22nd, who were you with? Um, I was with Alexis Peoples and Kayla Shaw. Okay, and make sure you keep your voice up, please. Oh, sorry. Um, and ma'am, where had y'all been? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Where had y'all been before you? Um, we had went to a party uh, prior to going to the Waffle House. Okay, great. Who was driving? Um, Kayla Shaw was driving. All right, and um, who decided to go to the Waffle House? Um, it was my choice to go to Waffle House um, when we decided to go. All right. And were you planning to eat in the Waffle House or? Um, we had ordered to go to, um, Kayla actually went in to pick up the Waffle House that we ordered to go. Okay. Where did y'all park when you got to the Waffle House? Um, we were parked in the back side of, um, the back part of the parking um, lot, like right in front of the door almost, but not in the parking spot in front, but the second row of parking spaces. The second row of parking spaces. And did you back into that parking space? Yes, sir. All right. Who was driving at that time? Kayla was the one that backed in the parking space and um, went inside a Waffle House. All right. Where did, what did you and Alexis do when uh, Kayla walked in? Um, we were sitting in the car talking. All right. Did you see this goldish brownish truck pull in and park in the handicapped space right in front of the yes sir I did. and was there anything odd about it uh yeah when he pulled in it was very aggressive um was driving just irate when he was pulling in did you notice it at the time yeah i noticed it at the time did y'all talk about it at the time? No, nah, we didn't talk about it. We were talking about something else, but I noticed how he pulled in. Right. Did the driver of that truck get out immediately no. upon parking? How long do you think uh, the driver sat in the car before he got out? Um, I'm really not sure as far as the time frame is, um, how long he sat in the car, but it wasn't immediate that he got out. He sat in the car for a moment before he got out. Could you tell what, if anything, he was doing inside the truck? I couldn't see inside of the vehicle. All right. At some point, did you see that driver of that truck get out of the car? Yes, sir. And what did you see when that happened? I saw him get outside of the vehicle. It looked like he had something in his hand. Might have been a cigarette or something. Not sure. Um, and then I saw him just stand there and lift the gun up and start to shoot. Okay. What was he wearing, if, if anything? Did you notice that? It was just a long coat, that's all I remember. All right. Do you remember anything else about his clothing at all? No, the only thing that I could see from where I was was that he had a coat, like a long trench coat on. I couldn't see anything past the coat. Okay. When, at what point did you notice that he had a gun? When he raised it up after 
Like I saw him raise the gun up and it was he took the shot and I watched the whole thing calm. Okay. Uh, can you describe the gun in any way? Was it a little handgun? Was it a bigger gun? It was gun? just a longer gun. It was like, I don't know what kind of gun. I'm not really familiar with them, but it was a big gun and he raised it up and started shooting. Can you demonstrate for the jury how he raised it up and started shooting? Yeah, it was just a simple, just like casually just raised the gun up. It was just raised it up and the first shot went off. Okay. Did you shoot did you see the direction he was shooting? The way he was standing, he was like at an angle of the door when he raised the gun. Um I'm not sure as far as like where the gunshot went. I was more so paying attention to the gun. All right. Did you see who he was shooting at? Uh, not particularly the person who he was shooting at. All I saw was him shooting. I was paying more attention to him than the people he was shooting at. Okay. Did you see either of the men fall to the ground after yes, he shot them? Yes, I did. Did. Right. did you, were you able to see both men as they yes. fell to the ground? Yes, sir. What did he do after he got done shooting those men? He walked inside of the Waffle House and started shooting the people in the booth. And he continued to walk around um, to shoot people as he walked through the front part of um, where they have the bar. And he walked that way. All right, so he walks in the entryway to the Waffle House. All right, and were you from where y'all were parked? Could you see into in through that glass? Yes, sir. I could see through the glass. All right. Did he start shooting toward his right or toward his left when he walked in there? Um. When he walked in, the booth it was it was people sitting in the booth to the right side of him when he walked in. Okay. After he got done shooting at those folks, what did he do? He continued to walk past. It was. The way that the Waffle House was, he continued to walk past, um, walk past the bar area to shoot, and then he came back. All right, so he shot to his right, and then he took a few steps to his left and was shooting in that direction as well? I wouldn't say to the left. I'm not pretty mm -hmm. sure as far as where his steps were taken. I really wasn't paying attention but to the But toward the bar area? Yes, sir. All right. And then what did he do after he got done shooting in that direction? He came back around towards the, it was like walking towards the entrance area where him and James Shock um, began to fight over okay. the gun. Were you able to see Travis Ryan King and, uh, and James Shaw actually get into their fight? Yes, I did not see the first initial punch where um, he, where he hit him, but I did see them tussling over the gun. Right. and like fighting each other and I watched him run out of the Waffle House. All right. Were you able to see when the two men got the gun over their oh, head? Yes, sir. And did you see when the gun was thrown back toward the Over the area? counter. Yes, yeah. sir. All right. After the gun was thrown over the counter, what did those two men continue to fight? A little bit. They tussled a little before he ran out. Okay. And when you say he ran out, who ran out? Uh, Travis. Okay. So after uh, after that tussle with James Shaw, Travis Ryan King was now back outside of the Waffle House. Is that correct? Correct. And you said when he ran away, what did he do? When he ran, he ran away towards um, the left side of the Waffle House, going towards the left. Um, and we were still sitting there, and um, Kayla, she ran out probably like a few minutes after he ran out, Kayla ran out as well, and she got in the car and we drove off. Um, as we were driving off, we saw him running down the street um, in the grass area, like not too far off off the road. All right, before even, even as he was running down the road and before Kayla was able to run out to you, what did you do? Did you get on the phone with him? I was on the phone the entire time when he made the first shot, I believe. I believe I called the uh, dispatch like as soon as he made the first shot because it was shocking at first. And we, when you say called dispatch, you mean called 911? 911, yes, sorry. Yeah. So you called 911. As soon as you first shot, you're calling 911. Yeah, it was probably like a few seconds after because I was in shock a little bit. But um, once I realized like what was really going on and it was real, I called. I called 911 and I stayed on the phone with 911 until um, the police came at the gas station. Okay. So 
So when Kayla runs out, you're still on the phone with 911. Yes, sir. And what did Kayla do when she got out and got back to the car? She drove off. All right. So now it's still you, Kayla, and Alexis in the car, and Kayla's driving off, and you're still on 911. Yes, sir. All right. As you drove off, what direction did you go? Um, when we came out of the parking lot, we went to the left because we went through the light, headed towards um, the Shell station down the street from the Waffle House. And, and, and did you, from the time you left the parking lot, did you see Travis Ryan King again? Yes. Where did you see him? Um, we saw him probably, um, it was a few yards from the Shell station where I saw him because I remember telling the dispatch lady that he was between uh, the wooded area right before he got to the Shell station. Um, so I saw him running, running in that direction. All right. How far away from the Waffle House was that? Um, to be honest, I'm not really sure. It's not that far. It's probably like a couple of minutes down okay. from the Waffle House. A few hundred yards, maybe? Yeah. And, and, it, and at that point, it was how long from the time that you'd seen him run out of the Waffle House? A minute or two? Longer? Less? To be honest with you, I can't remember. Tom really wasn't, you know... Everything was moving pretty fast at that time. Okay. But it got, wasn't far after, like, we left out. All right. Um, uh, when you got to the gas station, uh, what did y'all do? Um, we waited there for an officer. The lady said that the ambulance and the officer would be coming, and we waited there um, for somebody to eventually come. And did you stay there in the in the parking lot of that gas station until police came? Yes, sir. And then you cooperated with the police at that point and told them everything that you saw? Yes, sir. All right. Was Kayla injured when she got back in the car? Um, we were unsure. That's the only reason we stopped at the gas station is because we didn't know if she had got hit or not. We, um, I did see blood was on her, and she had um, scratches and stuff, but we weren't sure if she had been hit or not. Great. And did all this happen in Nashville, Davidson County? Yes, sir. Okay. Just a second, Judge. You got it. Those are my questions, Judge. Well, looks like you're The state's next witness is Trisha Perez. Hello. Hello, Ms. Perez. Could you please state your full name for the record? It's uh, Patricia Perez, uh, P-A-T-R-I-C-I-A, uh, last name Perez, P-E-R-E-Z. And are you the mother of Joe Perez Jr.? Yes. Is that your only son? No, I have um, two older sons as well. Now I'm gonna ask that this witness be handed an item. Perez, do you recognize the item that's just been handed to you? Yeah. <laughs> and can you describe that photograph? <laughs> this is taken at a, his uh, second cousin's birth. It was a picture that was taken. 
He, uh... <laughs> I used to call him Kim K. He used to love to take photographs. <laughs> he was a selfie king. <laughs> and is that a photograph of your son, Joe Perez Jr.? Yes, it is. And Your Honor, at this time I would ask permission to publish that photograph and also ask that it be introduced as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe is number nine. Correct. Ms. Perez, what is your son's birthday? September 22nd, 1997. And in April of 2018, how old was your son? He was 20 years old. And how, how long had he been living in Nashville? Um, exactly four months. Um, his brother had came up here to open up a business um, his brother's business expanded. Um, he wanted family. So we were all going to make the move to Nashville together. Um, but he asked Joey um, to come down first because the business was getting bigger. So Joey decided to go ahead and, and come with his brother at, the, at that time. So I drove him down here to Nashville on um, December 22nd of uh, 2017. And did your son, did he have a car that he drove when he lived in Nashville? Yeah, he had a uh, 2007 Honda uh, Civic. Um, like I said, I drove him down here just to make sure that he got, got here safe. Um, that was one of the things that we agreed on, and I flew home. And, um, yeah. And after April 22nd of 2018, did you see his car again? Yeah, on, uh, on the day the the incident, my mother called me to inform me that uh, Joey hadn't made it home. And she had witnessed something on the TV and um, she was worried and she wanted me to call Joey because Joey always answered me. I called, he didn't answer, I didn't get anything, and then um, I asked my mo mother to wake up my son and tell my son to go to his cousin's house, but I ended up pinging Joey's phone and it pinged at the Waffle House. That's where we, I sent his brother to, his brother found out. Next, I flew out. Next day, Ms. Perez, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I need to ask you specifically about the car. Okay. So when, when you saw the car again, was there anything wrong with that? Yes. It, um, the flashers were on, and when I went with the key to go and drive the car, we were going to drive the car back to my son's house. He had a flat. So he had a flat tire on it. He had a flat tire on the front driver's side. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Perez. I don't have any other questions. No questions. Thank you, Ms. Perez. You may Blanche Anderson. <clears throat> Ma'am, could you tell us your name, please, and spell your first and last name for us? My name is Blanche Anderson. First name Blanche, B-L-A-N-C-H. Last name Anderson, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Ms. Anderson, did you know 
Victorian Sunderland during his lifetime? Yes, I did. And are you related to him? Yes, I'm his aunt. And on his mother's or father's side? Mother's side. So were you there around knowing him from birth? Known him from the day he was born. I live in Illinois. I came down and spent the first two weeks of his life with her, my sister when he was born. And did you stay in touch with him throughout his lifetime? He lived with me a couple of years at Illinois, so we were very close. Ms. Anderson, I'm gonna ask the uh, court officer to take a photograph up to you that counsel has seen approved. Being handed a photograph, do you recognize the person in that photograph? Yes, I do. And who is that? This is Tarian. And for me, I would ask that be, I believe, exhibit number 10, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. I know it gets a little awkward getting the TV back and forth, but uh, mm -hmm. if we could. My staff can use the exercise. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Anderson, looks like a picture of a very happy young man. He was, he had a beautiful smile. Did you know what he was doing for a living? Tarian loved to cook from a little boy up and he was a chef at, at the Waffle House. Did he enjoy his work? He loved his work. He's always loved cooking and he wanted to be a chef one day. Do you know approximately about how long he had been working at the Waffle House before this incident? Tari started working at the Waffle House February 17th of 2016. And do you know how long he had been at this particular Waffle House? At this particular Waffle House, he had just transferred down there on February of 2018. So it was it a relatively new Waffle House? Relatively new, and he transferred there to be closer to home. He, had, he lived about three blocks from there. When was the last time you saw oh. Torian alive? The last time I saw him, I was, I came down for Thanksgiving and I helped him <laughs> cook a Thanksgiving dinner. That was the Thanksgiving before the year he was killed. And are his mother and father here in the courtroom today? Yes, they are. I ask you though to. Yes, they asked me to this. speak for Tari. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. No
Investigator Connor, we left off kind of right outside the Waffle House with your crime scene processing, yes. which I would ask if we can go back to that same point that we left off at. Okay. Do they? Okay. And you had just described the defect in the sidewalk. Correct. And I am now going to navigate to scan 12. And can you describe what we're seeing here? So the scan is now inside the restaurant. Um, the windows right here to the left are the ones that we were viewing from the exterior of the business. And so as you pan to the left, do you see that broken glass at the front of the building? Correct. As well as you can see the vantage point to the suspect vehicle, correct? Correct. And can you describe what is seen in this direction as we have continued to pan towards the front door? Yes, so the front door consisted of a double entry. There were two doors. So the exterior door is the one here. And then it was kind of a square little entryway. And then this was a secondary door into the business. Again, you see that little ev yellow evidence numbered markers that we put out to mark what we were collecting as evidence. Um, on the floor by the white towels is also apparent blood. And then you had three booths along this north wall of the restaurant um, and then some counter seating. Um, this darker door led into a hallway where the bathrooms were. And just to clarify, this front door area here, there are no strike marks to that door, is that correct? Not that we had seen, no. I think there's a smudge and maybe a glare there, but there's no actual strike marks. Correct. And kind of panning back towards where we began the scan over by the booth. Mm -hmm. I am clicking on what is labeled booth with glass in the Pharaoh, which is exhibit 5-0. Can you describe what is shown in this image? So previously when we were on the exterior of the building, we had seen some windows. This is going to be on the south side that had two to three defects to it. This is that interior view of those same windows. Um, so we had that first broken window here and then the second one is over here behind those booths. Um, Right here on the back side of that booth is another bullet defect that we had labeled. And navigating to what is labeled in the Pharaoh is D1. And there are two photographs. The first photograph, 650, which is introduced as exhibit 5P. Can you describe what is shown there? This is a closer up photo of that defect I was just talking about. And we have this long scale going vertically is to give a height of that defect on the backside of that booth. So we had labeled with the scale it, as defect one. And this was what we had determined to be the entry side of that defect. And navigating to the second photograph, which is labeled 0657 and is introduced as exhibit 5Q, can you describe what is shown here? This is the other side of that same booth. Um, here it's labeled D1A and was what we determined to be the exit side of that defect. And navigating to Pharaoh Skin, 11. Can you describe what is shown here? So these are booth seatings that were along the south side of the restaurant. Um, the defect I was talking to was on the back side of this bench seating. Um, 
37, the little yellow marker, 37 was for a black Nike tennis shoe that was under the table. Um, and then 35 right here was a pile of clothes and some uh, white towels. Over to the right side, there's a little walkway that goes behind the counter into the kitchen service area. And I am navigating to what is labeled EM 35 and 37. Can you describe what is shown here? This is a photograph of those two markers I just mentioned with 37 being the tennis shoe under the table and 35 being a hat and a sweater and then there were some white towels also brought out. And this is exhibit 5R. And I am going to navigate back to scan 12. And again, can you describe what is shown here? Yes, so we have the front entry doors. Um, to the left side behind the counter was the cooking, the kitchen area. We have evidence markers 21, 20, and then towards the back wall, there's some more evidence markers marking additional cartridge casings. And I am navigating to what is marked as EM 20 through 21 and is exhibit 5S. Can you describe what is shown here? This is a photograph of those evidence markers seen in the Faro scan. Here we have evidence marker 20 being a cartridge case as well as 21. And then farther back are additional evidence markers. And were those collected as well? The evidence marked with those, yes. And navigating to what is marked as evident EM22 in the FARO scan and is exhibit 5T, can you describe what is shown here? This is one of those booths um, along that separates the kitchen. This is by the entry door here. Um, the kitchen's on this back side. Evidence marker 18 back here was marking a cartridge case. There was a little metal well with some water and the cartridge case was down in the water. Evidence marker 22 is also a cartridge case on the table. And then we had some cell phones and some personal items. And does this photograph indicate where Miss Grove's body was at the time that she was found at this scene? Yes, so at the lower bottom of the, scene, uh, of the photo, this red checkered item is that of Miss Groves. And that image was exhibit 5T. I am navigating to what is marked in the Faro scan as EM18. And there are two photographs, the first of which is 0582, which is exhibit 5U. Can you describe what is shown in this image? So this is the separation between the patron side of the restaurant and the kitchen side. So here we have the booths that, this is that booth we were just looking at. Um, and this is taken from behind the counter um, with evidence marker 18, referring to a cartridge case down in that well of water and this is 0583 which is exhibit 5b can you describe what is shown here that's a close-up photo of that well with the cartridge case in the water marked evidence 18 and was that case also collected yes it was and i am nav navigating to what is marked as em 24 through 30 in the Faro scan, which this is exhibit 5W. Could you describe what is shown here? So this is a photo of those farther back cart or evidence markers with additional cartridge casings marked 24, 25, 
um, 26 up to 32. As you can see in the photo, there's not a 29. The 29 was off to the right of the photo. Um, and then back here in the corner is that door leading into that back hallway where the bathrooms were, which is along the north side of the seating area. And this photo is also does not show evidence marker 23. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. And navigating to what is marked in the FARO as EM23, could you describe what is shown here? So this is a photograph of a cartridge casing, the one marked 23. This is going to be under that previous table we had looked at where the markers were on top. And as I stated previously, this red and black checkered item was a piece of clothing that Miss Groves had been wearing. And this is also the image that is Exhibit 5X. And navigating to what is marked as EM29, can you describe what is shown here? This photograph shows evidence marker 29 in relation to those previously viewed evidence markers, all being cartridge casings that were RP223 Remington. And this is also Exhibit 5Y. And navigating to what is marked as EM30 through 33. Can you describe what is shown here? This is a closer photograph of several of the cartridge casings that were marked, evidence markers 30, 31, 32, and 33, and that's going to be that this back wall is that north side with the bathroom hallway attached. And this is image is also exhibit 5Z. And Investigator Connor, did you collect all 30 of the shell casings that you have described in your testimony today? Yes, after all our processing was done, that being photographs, creating a diagram or sketch of the scene, and all related ferro scans that we've been viewing, all 30 cartridge casings were collected as evidence. I'm going to ask that this witness be handed an item. Do you recognize the item that was just handed to you? Yes, it's 30 RP223 Remington cartridge casings with the case identifying information and my initials. And Your Honor, at this time I'd ask that that item be introduced as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe is number 11. To the scan. I am navigating to what is marked as D3 in the Pharaoh scan, and there are two photographs. The first photograph, 0669, is exhibit 5AA. Could you describe what is shown here? Yes, so this is the hallway door leading to the bathrooms. Um, D3 is a bullet defect or strike or bullet hole in that pane near, or the trim near that window, which subsequently shattered the window. And are you able to mark where that strike mark is? Yes, so the scale is labeling the strike mark to be right here. It's on the door, not the window. And so that's about in the middle of that area, is that correct? Correct. 
and navigating to image 0675, which is introduced exhibit 5 double B. Can you describe what is shown here? So this is the back side of that same door. Here towards the top, we have the exit side of that defect labeled D3A, and we have a vertical scale marking the height of that defect on the door to be approximately four feet, eight inches up from the ground. And I am nav navigating to what is Ferroscan 017. Can you describe what is shown here? This scan is inside that hallway leading to the bathrooms. So from this view with the scan, that bathroom door is this one here that is now open for the scan. We have the door to the right here is a door leading to the office. Evidence marker 36 at the bottom is marking a lead fragment. There's a, a evidence marker here. That was a rifle magazine that we had located right inside the door in that hallway. And then to the left side, we had the two bathrooms door, the two doors to the bathrooms, the men and then the women's door, which was out of order. And I am navigating to what is marked in the Pharaoh as EM36. This is also exhibit five double C. Can you describe what is shown here? So evidence marker 36 is marking this little piece of lead fragment from the projectile. Um, and that is at the base of the door leading from the hallway into an office. And I am navigating to what is labeled in the Pharaoh as EM34 and 36, which is also exhibit 5 double D. Can you describe what is shown here? This is a photo relating 36 and 34 to that door leading into the hallway. And now navigating to what is marked as EM34 in the Pharaoh, which is introduced exhibit 5 double E. Evidence marker 34 is marking a rifle magazine that is on the hallway side of the door separating the hallway from the restaurant. And did you collect that item as part of processing this scene? Yes. I'm gonna ask that the witness be handed an item. Investigator Connor, do you recognize the item that's just been handed to you? Yes, it is evidence marker 34. It contains one rifle magazine. And Your Honor, at this time I would ask that that be introduced as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe is number 12. <laughs> And I am now navigating to Pharoscan 100114. And can you describe what is shown here? This is a view, the scanner is set behind the counter on the worker or kitchen side. You can see the evidence we had previously talked about labeled 35 and 37. The shoe belonged or matched a shoe I had later received from um, Miss Wagner's clothing and then the scan is now going behind the counter so we're viewing the worker area and then within view is a rifle that we had marked as evidence marker 19 is located on the kitchen side of the counter 
and I am navigating to what is labeled EM19 in the Pharaoh scan. There are three images, the first being 0586, and is also exhibit 5 double F. Can you describe what is shown in this image? So this is a Bushmaster 223 rifle. It was marked as evidence marker 19. When I viewed it, there was apparent blood on it, and we also noticed that there is no magazine located inside the weapon when we had found it on the floor. And navigating to image 0587, which is introduced 5 double G, can you describe what is shown here? So this is a closer up photograph of the barrel of that weapon. It's a little hard to view on the photo, but there was apparent blood on this area of that weapon. And navigating to image 0757, which is also exhibit 5 double H, can you describe what is shown in this image? So this is a photograph of the weapon once we had picked it up off the floor and rendered it safe. This is the evidence box that we would be packaging it in. The scale at the bottom is to show the approximate length of the barrel. And was this item also collected? Yes, it was. Investigator Connor, do you recognize the item that's just been handed to you? Yes, it's a Bushmaster rifle marked as marker 19. And that item is the item that we've just seen in the crime scene that was collected as part of this investigation. Is that correct? Yes, the, photo, or the item in the box should be that same weapon in the photo that we're viewing. And can you describe what steps are taken to ensure that a firearm is not operational prior to it being actually put into evidence? So when we're at scenes, when we originally pick it up and collect it before we or package it into a box and transport it to our facility, we render it safe by making sure there's not a magazine in it, which there was not when we found it. And then we also clear the chamber to make sure that there is not a chambered round. Um, and then upon collection, we'll put a zip tie through it to show and signify that it has been rendered safe. And as the firearm in this particular evidence piece, has it been rendered safe? It was on scene, yes. And Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that the witness be allowed to open that item to display it to the jury. All right. I believe so. I think that they can view it. They want to stand up. Yeah. And that firearm has been rendered safe. Is that correct? Yes. So there's a zip tie here through or around it. That'll sh signify that it was rendered safe. There's also no magazine in it. And I check it to make sure. And there is no round in the chamber. Thank you, Investigator Connor. Mm -hmm. 
And right this time, I would ask that that item be introduced as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe is 13. Exhibit 13. And Investigator Connor, I am navigating to what is scan one zero 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 one two. Okay. Can you describe what is shown here? So this is at the north back end of the restaurant. This is attached. So over on this far side over here is that kitchen area we were just in. This is farther back in the kitchen with the offices and if we pan around Which actually i believe that i am in a separate so scan i'm going to navigate okay. to zero zero one two if you could describe kind of what is shown here so this is in the threshold of the uh that back counter kitchen area that where the weapon had been found you can still see it over here and as we scan around then we'll go into a farther kitchen area that will lead to some offices and a back entrance into the restaurant that was on the north side of the building. And this is, if you can describe, is this the door, other side of that door that we saw in that bathroom area? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that door is locked, is that correct? Yes. And is this the entrance that you said that the crime scene investigators were using so as to try to not disturb the scene as much as possible? Yes. I had. When we came in to watch the surveillance video, that's the door we had entered into, the office is off back in here. Um, and then that's what we deemed the working entrance. So anytime we needed to come in and out to do any processing, we used this door rather than that front entrance glass door. And Your Honor, at this time, I don't have any other questions for Investigator Connor, but we will be calling her one third and final time. No questions, right? Thank you. Ms. Brooks, can you please state your name for the record? Shondell Brooks. And Ms. Brooks, could you please spell your first name for the court reporter? Yeah, Sean, S-H-A-U-N-D-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And Ms. Brooks, do you live here in the Nashville area? I do. And how many children do you have? Four. And Akila De Silva, is he one of your children? He is. And what, when was he born? November 17th. 1994. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that this witness be handed a photograph. Ms. Brooks, do you recognize the photograph that's just been handed to you? I do. And is that your son, Akila? 
De Silva. <laughs> And Your Honor, at this time I would ask that the photograph be introduced as the next numbered exhibit, which I believe would be 14. And if I may have permission to publish it to the jury. Ms. Brooks, in April of 2018, how old was Akila? He was 23. And at that time, was he dating anyone in particular? Yes. Who was he dating? Tia Wagner. And is that Miss Shantia Wagner? I'm sorry? Miss Shantia Wagner? Yes. She goes by Tia, is that yeah. right? Yes. And. You said that you have four children. Is one of them a Bede de Silva? It is. And how old is your other son, a Bede? How old is? How old is a Bede? How much older is he from Akiva? They're like five years apart. And does he have a nickname that he goes by? A Bede? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Tough daddy. <laughs> Do some people call him Ishan? Ishan, his okay. middle name, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Oh. No questions, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, would you please state and spell your name? Abedi De Silva, A B E D E, De Silva, D A S I L V A. Um, Mr. De Silva, did you have a brother named Akila? Yes. And uh, how old was he in relation to you? You said how old was How he? much older were you than him? Uh, like five years and some change. Like almost six years apart. And you, you're the older brother? Yes. Um, were you with him on April 22nd, 2018? Yes, I was. Who else were you with? Um, my girlfriend at the time, Alexis, and um, Shantia, his girlfriend. What, what were the four of you doing? Um, we had went out to a hookah lounge, and we decided we wanted to get something to eat before we went to went in the house. Okay. Um, did you did you guys live in the Antioch area? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, did you live together? No. Were you riding together that evening? Um, to Waffle House, yes. Who was driving? Uh, Kila was. And about what time do you think you got to the Waffle House? I don't know. It had to be like around. It was around three, three, three something, like three thirty, three, three fifteen, something like that. Somewhere around three o'clock. Okay. Well, I guess as you guys are driving to the Waffle House, what if anything are you doing or, or discussing? Um, we're just talking about, um, you know, just life. I was talking to him about, you know, just 
we had seen one of our cousins at the um at the lounge and they they really weren't on speaking terms and you know i was just telling him like you guys need to just put that behind y'all and just get over it, you know life is too short you trying to give him some brotherly advice yeah um when you got to the waffle house what did you what did you guys do um we got out and we went inside and um we sat down at the chairs by the window and we ordered our food um did you recognize any of the other people inside the waffle house um as in did i know them yeah no when as you're sitting down ordering the food what if what if anything is going on um, we were just sitting there waiting. It took a little while, and Nikila was asking us, did we want to stay or did we want to leave? Um, obviously, we're here, so you guys stay. Why Why did you stay? Um, I think we didn't even get the chance to really decide if we really wanted to leave yet. It was When he asked me that, it was probably right before everything happened. Okay. Um, so... You said everything happened. What What do you recall happening? Uh, all of a sudden, I just seen um, glass breaking and bullets flying, like hitting the glasses inside the store. The dishes that was set up over the stove in Waffle House in the kitchen. Okay. What did you do when you started hearing the glass shatter? Um, I ducked down. And I went towards the right, towards the bathroom. Did you know immediately that it was gunshots? Yeah. Um, and you ran to the right. Did anyone go with you? Alexis did, my girlfriend. And what about Akila? Um, he went towards the left. And Shantia? She also went with him. So you guys went in the opposite directions? Yeah. Uh, was that a plan, or did you discuss that or anything? No, I mean, I just think by us sitting in the middle, it was probably directly in the middle of in the restaurant, so I feel like probably him going that way was faster for him because we was like, it was like him sitting right here, I was sitting right here, and they were sitting in between us. So he was more closer to the left, and I was more closer to the right. Okay. Um, so what do you do when you run to the to the right? Um, we ran into the bathroom. Um, where Brendan um, was at the time. There was someone else in the bathroom, and we just went in there, and they locked the door. Um, was there a door before you got to the area where the bathrooms are? It was a, it was a door, that, like a push-in swing door to go into the hallway of the bathroom, and then there was a bathroom door to the right. Okay. And so you said you went inside the bathroom? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And did you... Do you know who else was inside the bathroom with you? Um, uh, Alexis was and Brennan, okay. Jack Shaw's friend. Did you there. did you know Brennan at the time? No. Okay. Well, what's going on while you're inside this bathroom? Um, everything's registering to me what's going on now. So now that I'm thinking my brother's out there, I try to run back out there and they stop me. And before I could even run out there, it was more shots fired inside. Okay. Um, were, were you guys scared at all? Oh uh, yeah, once I tried to run out and I heard the shots sound like it was right beside me, yeah, I just backed up away from the door. Um, did something happen in the bathroom? Anything happen that maybe... Uh, well, Brennan was on by the toilet, so, like, he pressed up against the, um, the flush, and it made a loud noise. So we got kind of nervous about it, thinking like somebody might hear us in the bathroom. Um, before you guys entered the bathroom and locked it, were there other individuals in that back uh, hallway space to, that led to the bathroom? I didn't see anyone at the time, but after we came out, I seen someone come out of the, um, the I think the female bathroom. Okay. And, um, and so when you came out of the bathroom eventually, ooh, how, much, how long did you wait? I guess. Um, I came out of the bathroom and I heard, as soon as I was coming out, I heard everybody saying it's over, he's gone. Um, so I went out there to the hallway. 
I mean, back into the restaurant, and I ran outside. Um, when you heard that it was over and ran outside, why why did you go outside? Um, I was looking for my brother. You didn't know where he was? No. Was he outside? No. Did you see anybody outside? I seen Joe outside. Um, Joe Perez? Yes. And what what did he appear to you? Um, he was laying there. Um, um, I knew he I knew he died. He like I could see his head. Okay. And you didn't know Joe Perez at the time? No. Okay. Um did you see anyone else outside that may have been injured? No. Okay. I just seen, I came back in. Well, I ran down to the end, and from inside, I could see inside, and I could see where my brother and T was laying. So I ran back into the store. So I went back this way, and went in the store. They was on the opposite side. I ran back in there, and when I seen them, well, when I first came out the bathroom, I seen D. Ebony, and I went past there, and I went outside, and I came back in when I seen them from outside, and I went to the slit beside him. I seen him and Tia was still alive, so I ran over there to them. Okay. You said you saw, the first person you saw when you came out of the bathroom was D. Ebony. Yeah, D. Ebony and Sharita, yes. And, of course, uh, you testified that you didn't know D. Ebony and Sharita beforehand. No. I, I guess, how did you learn these names? Well, I mean, I learned the names after everything happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when you went to your brother and where your brother Akila and Shantia were, um, well, describe how they looked. Well, she, um, well, Tia was like on her back, but she had like one foot up and she was on her phone. Um, I think she was talking to her mom at the time, and my brother was laying on his stomach. Um, both of them were kind of, they were both panicking, but my brother was panicking a little bit more. So once I seen the tea, it was okay. She was shining his leg, her leg. Um, I started giving attention to Akila. Okay. Um, what was he saying, if anything? Um, he was just yelling my name. He was um, just telling me he was in pain. Um, I was just laying there with him, just letting him know that everything was going to be okay. Were you able to do anything to actually kind of help him? I just laid there with him. I, I didn't want to hurt him, so I just put my arm like by his back, and I laid there with him. And I just looked him in his eyes, and I was like, you're going to be all right. At some point, did an uh, officer... At some point, did an officer, uh, any officers come into the Waffle House? Yes. Um, and how about any, any paramedics? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. What happened once they arrived at the Waffle House? Well, they came over there. They came to my brother, and they turned him over, and... They said I heard them talking to each other, and they were saying he was shot in the arm. And um, some more paramedics came in, and they started the, uh, I guess they was patching him up. Um, and they was getting a stretcher. Um, and did you did you ask them about his his status, how how he was doing? Yeah, I did. Um, they said he was fine. He just was shot in his arm. So, you know, I just thought he was going to be okay. And did you see them put him on the stretcher? Yes. Um, and did you see them take him to the ambulance? Yes. W was he still alert and speaking as he was, or able to speak as he was on it? Yeah, as, as he was on the stretcher. He kept jumping up off of it like he was panicking. He couldn't breathe. He kept looking at me and telling me he couldn't breathe. 
Mr. De Silva, did you get to go in the ambulance with your brother? No. When's the last time you saw him alive? On the stretcher. Um, so is that, when he told you he couldn't breathe, is that the last words he said to you? Yes. When did you learn that he had deceased? Um, they finally let me leave, and I went to the hospital. Um, and I was on the phone with my mom, and she kept back, because she got there to the scene, and I kept telling her that he was okay. So she, I called her, and she was like, are you sure he's okay? Because they're saying he, that someone's here, and they're in critical condition. And I'm like, yeah, he's okay. He just was shot in his arm. I was talking to him. So we got there, and my mom was still at the emergency room in the front. And um, I probably wasn't even there for five minutes. And they took us to the back to tell him, tell us he didn't make it. Um, Mr. De Silva, uh, you recall this morning when we looked at a, a portion of the surveillance video from inside the Waffle House? Yes. Okay. Um, and did that surveillance video, at least the portion thereof, was that a fair and accurate depiction of what what, what happened inside the Waffle House? Yes. Okay. Um, this portion of the video has already been admitted as Exhibit 3. It contained on Exhibit 3 is, um, it will be listed under video number one. So I'm, I'm going to publish that a version, a copy of that video at this time, with your honor's permission. Um, before, before I hit play, can you, Mr. De Silva, can you tell me what what this image is here? Um, well, right here, this is, it looks like Akila is standing, looking at the menu, talking to the um, employee. You can touch the screen. Okay. So this is Akila right here. This is Tia right here. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to hit play. Just, Mr. De Silva, just there, did it appear that he was smiling to you? Yes. Was he happy that evening? Yeah. We, we just recorded, we just um, did a video the day before. So we were celebrating, and that's why we went out. Is that you? Where, where are you in this video? Right here. And who's, who's the lady? This is Alexis beside me. It's my girlfriend beside me. And, and do you recall what you guys are doing at this time? Oh, uh, we were just ordering our food. Um, and while this this plays, you you were saying, Mr. De Silva, that you and your brother have recorded a video. Yeah, we did a um, music video, um, and we just had released it the day before. And you were celebrating this evening. Yes.
was funny. What what was that that just happened that the, was shown in the video, Mr. De Silva? Um, that's when the shots were fired into the into the restaurant. Um, Mr. De Silva, I think the testimony just before we, uh, we approached the judge was that you said the gunshot had just been fired into the the uh, Waffle House. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to hit play now. Who Do you see your brother over there? On yes. The You get both. Sorry. And what did you just see happen on the video there? Um. He, well, we both dug down, and he went towards the left and crawled around, and I ran towards the bathroom. Okay. All right. Mr. De Silva, you you mentioned uh, Shantia Wagner being next to your brother. We kind of discussed when you were over there by him. Um, could you describe for us what her injury looked like? Well, I I didn't know it was as bad as it was when I first seen it because the angle that she was at from where I was standing, I couldn't see her whole leg. I just knew she was shining her leg and she was bleeding. But because she was still coherent and she was still talking to me, I just assumed that she was okay. And because and she was focused on my brother too. She was like, check on him. So I, I was more focused on what he was doing because she seemed like, you know, she was in, she seemed like she was um, more calm than my brother was. Okay. Did you ever see the the person who killed your brother? No. All right. Those are my questions. Thank you. No questions. No. Just breathe. 
understand fully that there's new enemies for this family members, so we've got to try and keep this as non emotional as possible from the parents. Yes, sir.
some of these pictures and certainly the video. I mean, it calls me to react and I see this type of stuff day in and day out. So I can only imagine the powerful and excruciating impact it can have on your emotions when you see some of the things that you have seen so far in this trial and will see as this trial progresses. But it is absolutely imperative that this trial proceed with as little exhibition of emotion as humanly possible because emotions cannot be the basis for making decisions. Emotions never based on, I mean decisions based on emotion usually are not very good. And I can't allow this jury to be influenced by the emotions that get expressed. Again, I cannot imagine what you're going through and how difficult it must be to withhold emotions, but I must ask you to do so respectfully. If it's going to be difficult for you to do that, I ask you, particularly if it's someone with your family, I ask you to step outside. I think, do y'all have TVs in your office? That you can go, you can watch it downstairs and express any you know, emotions that you may have at that time without it uh, falling on the shoulders of the jury. Their job is difficult enough as it is. And uh, I just uh, have to be very careful not to allow that. I hope you understand the position I'm taking. I certainly understand. Uh, what you must be going through uh, and have no problem with it whatsoever except for when it's in the presence of the jury. I would, would not expect otherwise. And I respectfully ask you to do your best uh, to maintain yourself. And if you don't think you can do that, particularly if it's someone, you know, your son or daughter or whatever the case may be, to watch it from the TV down in the uh, District Attorney General's office on the fourth floor, at least until that testimony is over. Okay. Uh, and thank you again. Anything else on that? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. We ready to bring the jury back in? Who is your next witness? Next witness is Chantia Wagner. Get the jury on there. Yes, sir. Very long enough. Thank you. 
Just let her have her seat and then she can raise her hand. Good afternoon, Ms. Wagner. Would you please state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, Chantil Wagner, uh, S-H-A-N-T-I-A Wagner, W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R. Ms. Wagner, I saw that you were walking with crutches as you walked up to the witness stand. Have you always needed the assistance of crutches to walk? Yes. You Did you need them before April uh, of no. 2018? No. Okay. Um, and so why do you now need crutches to walk? Um, for the gunshot wound to my leg. Did, in April 2018, um, were you a resident of, of Nashville, Davidson County? Yes. Yes. Um, how long have you lived here? Um, probably since forever. Well, I moved to Antioch from East Nashville. Okay. Um, probably since 2011. And who was Aquila Da Silva to you? Uh, my boyfriend. How long have the two of you been dating? Uh, at the time, uh, on and off, like seven years. Okay. Were you with him on April 22nd, 2018? Yes. Who else were you with? Uh, I was with his brother, Abede, and his girlfriend at the time, Alexis. And where were you guys going? Um, we had went to a lounge and then we decided we want something to eat and we ended up going to the Waffle House. Who was driving? Akilai was. And where were you seated? Uh, in the passenger seat. And about what time did you get to the Waffle House? Uh, I don't know the exact time. Three something. In, in the morning? Yes. Um, had you ever been to Waffle House before? No. Did you want to go to the Waffle House? No. It was the only thing that was open at the time. Um, and so, were you going to even go inside the Waffle House? No. I wanted him to order for me, but um, he, ne he ended up telling me to get out the car and go ahead and order because he knew I was picky. Who was he? The key line. But he... He said he knew that you were picky, so come on yeah. inside. <laughs> okay. Um, and was that kind of the, an aspect of your relationship? Yeah, he knew me the best. When you went inside, um, what, did, what did you do once you got there? Um, when we went inside, um, he gave me the menu, and uh, we ended up ordering, and I just picked something and he knew exactly what I was going to pick anyway. Um, and then I went to sit down while we waited for our food to go. Do you know where you sat it, sat at? Um, I, we were sitting towards the door, like in some chairs that were lined up in front of the door. What was the, what was it, what was everybody kind of doing inside the Waffle House? Um, there were some people standing and talking. It was kind of really loud in there. 
So it was kind of hard to pay attention to everyone, but just regular things. Mm -hmm. Some people sitting in the corner and some people up talking. And we were just sitting down waiting for our food. Okay. Um, and as you were sitting to wait for your food, um, did you ever see a gold pickup truck pull into the parking lot? Um, yes. When we first pulled in, um, when I was going to sit in the car instead of going in, I vividly remember looking at the car because um, our car was um, not right next to it, but there's like a handicap space. But in between the handicap space, it's those horizontal lines in between. And um, I remember looking at his car because it was so odd. His um, the tint on his windows was very, very dark. So I just kept staring at it because it was just abnormally dark. Um, and as you were sitting inside, did you, I guess, was there some point in time that you heard some loud noises? Yes. Well, can you describe what they sounded like? Um, the first one was a extremely loud pop to the point to where it, it really hurt my left ear, and then hearing became very, like, um, distant in my left ear. Did you know whether it was a gunshot at the time? Um, the first uh, sound I heard, no, I didn't. But the second one, I knew because that's when glass started to shatter. And what did you do once the glass began to shatter? Um, in a split second, I looked at Akilai, and we both just got on the floor, and um, I ended up crawling on the floor next to him. Did you have a, a verbal agreement that you were going to, did you tell each other, let's go this particular direction? No, we just looked at each other and just ended up getting on the floor together. And what did you do as you got on the floor? Um, just began crawling. I wasn't really, we weren't really paying attention to our surroundings. We just knew that we had to move. Did you hear any more gunshots as you were on the floor? Yes. They just kept, the gunshots just kept coming. And I was just wondering when they were going to stop. Did they get louder at all? Uh, I'm not sure. It was so drowned out. The noises were so loud that after a certain point of the noises keep happening, they all sounded the same. Um, did you see where the gunshots were coming from? No. Did you ever get injured? Yes. What happened? Um, I don't remember the moment that I was shot. I just remember I went to look at Akila, and he was not crawling or moving anymore. So I tried to move forward to get to him to figure out why he wasn't crawling anymore. And when I looked down, I noticed that the that I was shot and the gunshot had um, ripped, ripped my leg away. And I couldn't get to him because my leg was heavy. It was still attached in the back. And what do you mean by that ripped your leg away? Um, it was severed. Like, the only thing I had connecting was a little bit of skin on the back. And that prevented, that prevented me from getting to a key lie because it hurt to drag it. You couldn't move your leg? No. And... But you were still trying to get to a Aquila at the time? Yes. Um, was it... Can you describe uh, anything else about your injury as you were there? Um, I then began to notice that it wasn't just... When I knew it had, you know, was decapitated in a sense, I then noticed that like the my bone was missing, like in the middle, like it just wasn't there anymore. Like there was no bone. I couldn't figure out where it had went to, 
and um, I was just trying to keep calm because I knew Akilah was beside me, and if I panicked, that he was going to panic even more. What did you do once you realized that you'd been shot? Did you try to contact anybody? Um, I believe I saw James Shaw. Um, I'm not sure where he came from or what had happened previously. I saw him come by me, and um, I had asked for help but at the time because of the situation. Um, he said he couldn't help me at the moment. And then after that, that's when the panic set in because I didn't see anyone else. So then I called 911. And what what was your experience like with 911? Um, it was terrible. Um, when I called, the lady was upset that I didn't know the address. And I was trying to explain to her that it was a new location and I just honestly didn't know the address. And she just kept getting frustrated over the fact that I didn't know the address. So how long did you stay on that call? Um, I'm not sure, not very long. I ended up um, hanging up and calling my mother. So when you called your mother, what, what happened? What did, how was that conversation? Um, it was a very hard conversation. I called my dad first before I called my mom and my dad didn't answer the phone. Um, I was just thinking to myself, it will, at least if no one's going to come for me, at least I can say something, you know, to my parents before if anything happens to me if I pass away. And I called my mom, and she was a little bit confused at first, and I was telling her I was shot, and she kept saying, oh, you're taking shots. And I was like, no, I'm not taking shots. And she remember her just making me laugh, and I was really happy because at least, you know, if something were happen, the last thing I remember was my mom making me laugh. And uh, I told her where I was at, and she finally understood. And that's when she said she was on her way with my dad because um, I only live about five minutes away from the Waffle House. Well, they, they only live five minutes away from the Waffle House. Okay. Well, my parents. You're saying you, you used to live five minutes away from the Waffle House? Yes. Well... I did. It's just that I had an apartment, which was five minutes away, and then my parents' house was also five minutes away. Oh, okay. Understood. Understood. Um, and so, is there some point in time that either officers or any paramedics come and give you any assistance? Yes. Um, I hear someone come in the door, and um, at first I get really nervous and scared because I see the police officers and they're armed as well. So I was a little taken back and frightened. And then um, a officer had came over and he was looking at our injuries, trying to figure out what was going on. And um, he, I remember he looked at Akilai and um, Akilai just kept saying his arm was hurting, but he only said, I only heard him say it like two times. And then after that, I didn't hear anything else from Akilai. When the when the paramedics arrived, did, did they uh, what did they do to assist you? Um, well, when they first arrived, they looked at Akilai first because he was right beside me, and uh, they put him on the gurney, and then the paramedic came to me and um, he let me know um, that he would have to shove my leg back on and that it was going to be extremely painful. And uh, I remember him telling me, tell, I remember telling him, please don't touch me because it was just so painful. And um, he told me if I need to scream, scream and to wrap my arms around him. And then I just remember feeling the worst pain in my life and just screaming while I, I held my arms around him. And then I just kept asking them about Akila and where he was going and they just kept telling me to, you know, focus on me right now. And so as you were experiencing the worst pain of your life, did you 
did you get to share any final words with Akila? Um, before they, right before they carried him away, I just told him I love you. If I don't get to say it again, was he ever was he able to say anything back to you? No. Did you see him again? No. The last moment I saw them was, I saw him was when they took him away. Now, after the paramedic, as you described, basically pushes your leg back together, what do they do to you next? Um, they tie a really tight tourniquet around it, and I remember I just wanted it off because it was so painful having it tied on. And then they begin uh, lifting me on the gurney. Um, and then I remember being rolled out, and I remember looking to my left out the gurney, and then that's when um, uh, I saw Joe. You saw Joe Perez? Yes. Where was he? Uh, he was laying down. Do you appear alive to you? No. I asked them. I began asking the ambulance men where they're going to help the man on the ground. And the ambulance man covered my eyes and told me not to look. Okay. <clears throat> Once you got to the, in the ambulance, where did you go? Um, they ended up taking me to Vanderbilt. Were they uh, able to give you any medication to assist in your pain? Uh, not really. <laughs> when I got in the ambulance, um, the man just said, it'll make you loopy. And I was like, okay, I'll take it. But I was just loopy and in pain. <laughs> and that didn't help. <laughs> um, and what about the ride to the, the rest of the ride to the hospital? Um... It was very bumpy, uh, and then every bump and turn and anything, it just hurt any type of movement in the ambulance, and they were telling me they were trying to get me there as fast as they could. What Do you know what hospital you were taken to? Uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center. And what happened when you got there? Do you, do you know? Um, I remember them rushing me out of the ambulance and they're like running with the gurney and all these nurses or doctors are surrounding me and they're ripping my clothes off and turning me over and I asked them not to turn me over because I was in so much pain but they said they had to so I ended up just screaming again while they turned me over and um, I hear the nurses talking and they're like where are we going to put her because um, they had too many trauma patients because Somebody had arrived before me, and I figured it was a key lie. And somebody else also had arrived before I arrived there. So they had no choice but to do who who was in more critical condition first. So I just laid there while they put towels and all this stuff on my leg because they couldn't get me into surgery. And were you able? Were they able to give you anything to actually alleviate the the pain you were experiencing? No. How long did you sit there in pain waiting to be able to get into surgery? Um, oh, like an hour, hour and a half. And I remember my dad getting so mad and frustrated because I was bleeding through everything they put on it. Um, once you got into surgery, um, what, do you know what the procedure was that they had to do on, on your leg? Um, I don't know the exact terms. I just know they said that I had six hours to try to get a, um, a good working blood vessel to connect my leg back or it would have to be amputated. And then for the first week, I had to um, be monitored to make sure that it didn't um, die off. Do you know if they had to bring in any specialists to, to treat you? Um, yes. Uh, later on, because my injury was too severe and uh, my surgery had failed, one of the surgeries they did had failed, they ended up um, sending in a military doctor.
You said one of the surgeries failed. How many surgeries have you had? Um, 14, 15. You've had almost 14 or 15 different surgeries? Yes. What are, what are they doing? What are, what are they having to do to your leg? Uh, complete reconstruction from skin grafts, bone grafts, um, muscle grafts, um, trying to correct um, uh, the misplacement of my leg because when the bullet hit, it exploded like a bomb. So I had things in places they didn't belong. So they were just doing their best trying to reconstruct it. Were they able to get the bullet or the bullet fragments out of your leg? Um, no, that stays in for the rest of my life. Has that caused you any difficulties? The bullet fragments remaining in your leg? Uh, not per se the bullet fragments. It's just more of like a mental knowing it's still there. Like I know I, I, I wasn't born with my leg like this and I wasn't born with those fragments in me. So it's just another memory that, you know, I have to carry with me. When you've gone through these skin graft, grafts, muscle graft, bone grafts, all of these different surgeries, um, are you able to immediately recover? No, each surgery um, doesn't happen fast. like. If I do have a surgery, um, sometimes recovery just from one surgery is six months. And then if it doesn't go well, then that recovery can be six months to eight months. So it's always prolonged. And then when you have the surgeries, um, you have weight limitations, like um, you can't put any weight on it. So you're always getting setbacks. If you learn how to you know, do something this way, then when you have surgery, now you have to learn a whole nother way to do it all over again, and the cycle just keeps happening. Okay. And I'm sorry, I, I want to ask you, you a question back to the first surgery. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the doctor said you had six hours to get a work, a good working blood vessel. Mm -hmm. um, were they telling you that if you didn't, that you might die? Yes, a uh, possibility of bleeding out and also the possibility of amputation. When I first woke up, they let me know that it was my option. If I didn't want to fight for my leg, that I could let it go. And if I chose to fight for it, it was still an option that I could still lose it. Ms. Wagner, when did you learn that Akila was deceased? Um, I didn't learn until like maybe two to three days later. They didn't immediately tell me. Um, I guess uh, the nurses thought it was too distressing. Okay. Did you? Did you see the person who shot you and killed Akila? No. Will you ever be able to walk normally again? No. Thank you. No question. I'm sure we were good. I think I'm just to for it. Mm -hmm. I should get my mask off. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Take your time. I'll get the chair for it. State calls Brennan McMurray.
So if you would bridge for right here, you just want to bridge. You saw this for affirming to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I guess I'm going to do this. I'm going to Good afternoon, Mr. McMurray. Would you please state and spell your name for the record? Brennan McMurray, B-R-E-N-N-A-N-M-C-M-U-R-R-Y. Uh, and Mr. McMurray, are you, I guess, a native of Nashville? Born and raised. Okay. Um, but do you live here currently? No, I live in Chicago. All right. Um, were you living here in April of 2018? Yes, sir, I was. Okay. Um, do you remember the evening of April 22nd, 2018? Can't forget it. And why is that? Um, I've never seen a mic I wasn't afraid of talking to. Um, it was a um, very traumatic night, not only for myself, uh, for my best friend. And honestly, we probably had it the least. Um, it's a night I'll never forget. I think about it every day. Uh, I will say that for a while, somebody else thought about it every day. As um, far as like, you know, like people seeing you out, saying, hey, I saw you. And that kind of wears on you after a while. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and you said your best friend. Who is your best friend? Uh, James Shaw Jr. You, you were pointing, is he in the courtroom here today? He is. Okay. Were you with him that night? Yes, sir, I was. What, what brought the two of you together that evening? Uh, we actually had just left a uh, party at a nine bar on Bell Road. Okay. Um, and so what were you going to do after you left the, the party? Uh, our intentional plans were to go to Taco Bell. Um, we always, it's probably like the most favorite restaurant we go to. Uh, I know that sounds really crazy, but we've been doing that since high school. Um, but when we were driving past that on Bell Road, the lights were off. So we figured that they were closed. Uh, we were actually on the phone together at the same time while driving separate cars. Um, so I, I was hungry, and I wasn't going to go home and cook. My wife was asleep, my kids were asleep. So, you know, banging pots and pans just wasn't the option. So I was like, hey, do you want to go to Waffle House? Um, so the Waffle House that we were going to was the one right there on Bell Road, uh, right off where the Thorntons is. Um, so that's where we went first. Okay. And uh, why didn't you go into the Waffle House at, next to the Thorntons? So we did, actually. So when we pulled up, the way that you turn after the Thorntons is like a driveway uh, to the Waffle House. Um, cars were parked all the way aligned there. Um, the parking lot was full. So we ended up parking on like the curb area. Um, when we were walking out of our cars to there, it was like an altercation going on in the actual parking lot. I think a lady's car had gotten hit, screaming, fussing. Um, that was sign number one, like, I don't know. We went into the restaurant. There was only two seats that were available. It was all the way in the back uh, where like the counter kind of like goes and it's like a seated like on the bar. They hadn't cleaned them off yet. And so we were like, all right, we'll take these two seats. Um, so we started to sit down, but it was just a lot of like commotion and ruckus in there. So we both looked at each other and was like, hey, you want to leave? Like it, it just didn't feel right. Um, so we ended up leaving. We never even got a menu or anything like that. Uh, James needed gas, so we got gas. Uh, and I was like, why don't we go to the Waffle House on Murfreesboro Road? They just built it. Uh, I never really seen anybody in that parking lot. Cause, I mean, I live in Antioch. Like, the woods from the back of that Waffle House touch what's within my town home. Um, so we went there. Uh, pulled up. I parked forward facing, which is kind of weird. I never do that. I always back in, but for some reason, I like pull straight into the parking spot. Uh, I do distinctly remember James backing in um, in the parking spot beside me. Now I got out the cars, walking into the Waffle House, and I, late at night, you're always observing what's going on around you, right? Like you don't really, you know, it's dark. You don't know what's going on. Um, so from there, when we were walking to the door. There was a gentleman sitting in a car. Uh, I think it was a gold Silverado, like a truck. Uh, and he was just staring at us. And it was very weird that he was staring at us. 
uh, even at that moment, I had turned to James and was like, hey, like this, this is the type of person right here that would like shoot a place up, not knowing that literally that was the type of person that would shoot a place up. Hmm. Um, well, no, let me let me pause you there for a second. Um, you said that you saw a gentleman sitting in a truck and he was staring at you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did he say anything to you? Nothing. Could you tell how he was dressed? He had it like a, a coat on or a jacket. It was kind of shimmery, but it was, like I said, it was dark. I mean, if you think about the way that that Waffle House, and I've, I try not, even when I lived here, I try not to drive past it. Um, but it's very light where the door entrance is, but in that second part of the parking lot, it's kind of dark. So you can see it, but like you could see him like staring out the window. Like, I, don't, I think the window was down, actually. Um, okay. But just staring at us, like a piercing stare. It just didn't seem right. Okay. And so as you make the comment to, to Mr. Shaw about um, the person that was sitting in the car, I guess, let me stop. Do you re recall in, from that moment independently what, could you identify who that was at the time who was sitting in the vehicle? Are you asking me, is he in the courtroom right now? Well, I'm asking, do you, would you at the time have been able to recognize him? Honestly, probably not. Okay. White man, I could tell you that. Um, not he wasn't like big or anything, like 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 big, like you know, uh -huh. big. Um, but if like you were to ask, like I, I could maybe, but I can just tell you out the gate, one hundred percent. Okay. Um. So once you walk past the truck, what do you do? Go in the Waffle House. We, we don't walk past the truck, like literally past it, but the truck's right here, the door's here. Walk into the Waffle House, uh, go to the bar. Um, we normally sit in a booth, um, but the booths are kind of full. And then there was one that was open, but it was like in between people. And like I said, we just left another Waffle House because it was packed. And so at the counter, it was pretty open. So I sat in the third seat and then, you know, guys, they don't ever sit beside each other. It's like going into a restaurant, right? And so James sat in the first seat at the end to like leave a seat so you could out and have some leg room. Um, obviously, phone keys on the table, um, and we start talking, conversing. And I distinctly remember the waiter kept stacking up plates, and he kept stacking them up extremely high to the point like I'm like he's going to drop these. I'm not going to say the word, but he's going to drop these plates. Um, so me and James were laughing about that, um, and we hadn't even gotten. He was like, "Hey, I'll be with you guys in a second." Um, and then I don't, I don't think that second ever really happened again. So, um, Did, <clears throat> and what that, do you, what do you mean that you don't think that second really happened? What, what happened? So distinctively, I remember loud commotion, boom, turn back to the left. You look, there's smoke, but it was glittery smoke. Like almost like, like somebody had shot like confetti almost in the air, but it was thin. Um, and then everyone was running. It was a complete chaos. So I look to my left, see the smoke. I look back to my right. James has jumped out of his seat immediately and take off. So what do I do? I jump out of my seat and take off. Um, and then we're going back towards the restrooms. Um, James slips, grab like the back of like his pants, roll into the back area. There was another gentleman back there. He had like braids of dreads. Uh, come find out Mike. Um, and we were trying to beat down the back door to get into the, what we thought then was the kitchen. So we're beating on the door. I'm like yanking on the door, kicking the door. And then the shots get louder and louder. And you can kind of tell they're getting closer and closer. So at that point, I was like, everyone get into the restrooms. People got into the back restrooms. At this point, I don't know where James, I thought James had gotten to the other bathroom. And then there was another one in the front. Me, Ashan, and Alexis get into that bathroom. Obviously didn't know them at the time. Um, then locked the door. They were sitting doors here. They were against this wall. Ashawn made Alexis get in the corner so she could tuck down. I sat on the other side of the wall. Me and Ashawn were looking at each other face to face. Um, and the shots just kept raining at that point. So it's just getting louder and louder. Like it was like rumbling, like getting closer. Okay. Um, when you, when you got into the back area. Yeah. And you said you're beating on the door. 
Um, was there any other exit back there for you to, to go no, out of? That that was that was the only exit that I thought was there. I mean, the other you know the bathrooms like like I said, we frequent Waffle Houses. Well, not no more, but we used to frequent Waffle Houses all the time. So there's a door that swings both ways, and there's always a men's and a women's restroom. The only other door that was available looked like a door that opened up to something, which you would think would probably be like the back area of the kitchen. Um, so that was the only door that I saw. I don't think there was no door. It's a wall back there if you walk straight. And who was back there with you in that space as you were trying to beat on the door and, and get through? Uh, Mike. Not sh Mike Garth, maybe? His okay. last name? Um, but like I said, he had braids, dreads, um, and me and him were like actively trying to get this door open. Um, while you were inside the bathroom with, uh, is, is Ishan, uh, related to Akila Da Silva? Yes. Okay. While you were in the bathroom with him and the, the other young lady, Alexis, what, what happened? What was going on? So me and Ishan had talked briefly that if he shoots the lock and we have to rush the door, and that's the only way, like he is no way he's coming straight in here. Um, and so in that point too, like we were calling 911, but it was like a, like a busy tone almost. Like it was like everyone was trying to call 911. Um, and then I, the, the automatic toilet flushes. And so at that point you're like, damn, like he's going to know we're in the bathroom. Um, and then it stops. Um, and so at that point, Ashan is like, listen, my brother's out there. I got to go out. I'm like, yo, wait. Either he's reloading or something's happening. Like, there are too many shots going on. Like, we got to wait. Um, and so it stops. Probably after, like, 10 seconds, open the door. We both peek out. It's a magazine right there. with a, Because that door opens up to the actual door that leads you into the restroom area. Um, and so the glass is shot out on that door. So we're peeking through that. Uh, at that point, you can see Tia there. There's another lady on the ground, which we now find out is the Ebony, uh, laying face down. Um, and then the staff is behind there. And then a car pulls in the parking lot. So you can see straight through that glass all the way to the other door, like other window on the other side of the Waffle House. Uh, car pulls in. I say, get back in the bathroom. We lock the door again. Why did you? Why did you? Feel the need to go back in the bathroom because I didn't know what was going on out there. Okay. I mean, literally, there's bullet shots through that glass. Loud, like a lot of rounds you could hear. You don't know, and, and like I like I've talked about before, is you don't think anybody's coming for you. Like I have no reason for them to come at me, so I'm just trying to get out the way. But also, I don't know what's going on out there. So I see somebody else pull back in the parking lot. I'm thinking, well, they nobody's finished because why would somebody pull into the parking lot if all of this just happened? So we get back in, uh, and then after a few seconds, I start hearing BJ, BJ, BJ. I open the door because it's James's voice, uh, and then I peer through the glass again because I wasn't just walking straight out. Uh, and he's standing there, like kind of like limping. Uh, and then I'm like, "Hey, are you okay?" Uh, and he's like, "Listen, you, you talking? We gotta go." Uh, so then we walk out of the Waffle House, and then that's where I see Joe laying on the ground. Um, uh, and then at that point, I'm like, I got to get my keys. My keys are still on the table. So I'm like, how am I going to drive my vehicle? At that point, I wasn't even thinking about James's truck. I'm thinking about my, my truck. So I go back in to get the keys. T is there. And she's like, please help me. I'm like, okay. We go back outside. Uh, and then that's when all like the first rep responders and everything start to show up. Okay. Um, you pause when you mentioned Joe. Did you know him before? Not at all. Okay. Um, and when you saw the Ebony, did she appear to be alive to you? No. Were you able to see um, Ishan's brother, Akila? No. After once you met with um, James Shaw, as you come outside, what could you describe what his demeanor was? He was in a rush. I'll tell you that. Um, 
I mean, thinking back on it, like, there's nothing but adrenaline had to be going through his body. He was still kind of in, like, proactive mode, like, trying to, like, even, like, when the responders came, like, he was telling them where to go when they got into the Waffle House, what to do. Like, there was somebody, he was like, there's somebody still alive in there. Like, go help them. Like, I even, like, there, like we put him on a seat outside. Uh, I was sitting on the curb. Yeah, he, he, he was still kind of in go mode. Did you ever see the person that was shooting the weapon? No. I never saw anybody at that moment with a gun in their hand. Did uh did Mr. Shaw, did James, did he have any injuries? Yes, his hand was uh extremely burnt. Um and then he had a cut on his well what I thought was a cut, but a wound on his elbow. And then like some other like glass and stuff like that around like around his hands and stuff. One moment, Your Honor, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Judge, our next witness is D'Angelo Groves. Please state your name and spell your last name for the for the court reporter. Uh, my name is D'Angelo Groves. That's D-I apostrophe capital A-N-G-E-L-O. Last name is Groves, G-R-O-V-E-S. Okay. Do you live in Nashville, sir? Not anymore. Okay. Did you grow up here? Say it again. Did you grow up here? Uh, around this area. Okay, great. Um, do you have a sister? I do. And tell me her name. D'Ebony Lachey Groves. Okay, I'm going to pass you a photograph and ask you if you can identify that. Yes. What is that a picture? Of? This is a picture of the Ebony. Okay, Judge, if we could make that exhibit number 15, introduce that into evidence and publish it to the jury. Mr. Groves, how old was your sister in April of 2018? Uh, 21. And was she in school? She was. Where was she in school? She was a student at Belmont University. How far away from graduation was she? Uh, probably like one semester away. All right, and you were also attending Belmont at the time, is that correct? Correct. And when did you graduate? So, um, the weekend of the events um, was, the next week was finals, and then I graduated May 5th, like a couple weeks later. All right. So because y'all were both in school, were you in school at Belmont as well? Right. And because y'all were not only brother and sister, but both students at Belmont at the same time, did y'all see each other frequently? We did. All right. When was the last time you communicated with your sister? So the last time I communicated with her would have been on that Saturday, the 21st. Uh, it was on Instagram. And tell me what that communication was. So she had posted a video and she had a song playing in the background and I commented and made some little witty brother joke. Right, those are not always super witty, but <laughs> right. Um, but did y'all exchange a few comments back and forth at that point? Uh, I don't know if she 
actually said anything back at that particular point because I was I was out of town, so I was like on and off my phone. So right. I just had saw that she posted something, and I made a comment on it, and and that was that. All right, so that was on April twenty first of two thousand eighteen, and then this happened on the early morning hours of April 22nd, just Correct. a few hours after that last interaction. Is that right? Correct. How did you find out that she died? Um, it was actually one of her um, sorority sisters. I had like a series of people who kept calling me because they were trying to find out what happened to her because I didn't even know she was, she was, that she was even out. And um, I kept getting people calling me, and I didn't recognize the number, so I didn't answer the phone. And then one of her sorority sisters left me a voicemail, so I called her back, and they were like, do you have any, um, we've been trying to contact her, and she was with um, a young lady who was shot, who I later found out was Sharita, because um, I didn't know her at the time, but nobody knew where she was. And so I kept calling her phone, and she didn't answer. I... Um, she was supposed to show up for work that morning and never did. So then like her boss and some employees, they were all looking for her. So I was like spending the majority of my trip home from Atlanta, like trying to call people and try to figure out where she was and how to get somebody to, you know, get in contact with just anybody who could like give me something. I think I called like three different hospitals and nobody could tell me anything. Mm -hmm. And at some point later on, on the day of the 22nd, you found out the horrible news. Correct. Right. And I actually, one of her friends uh, reached out to me on Facebook and said that they saw it online that she, I guess, had passed away. And that's literally how I found out. Okay. And uh, your parents are here today. Yes. Is that right? And, uh, but you were selected to be the representative of the family to talk about your sister. Is that right? Yes. That's all. No questions. Thank you. Our next witness. The fake next witness is Sharita Henderson. Ms. Henderson, could you please state your full name for the record? Sharita Henderson, S-H-A-R-I-T-A-H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. -E and Ms. Henderson, how old are you? I'm 28 years old. And so back in April of 2018, how old were you then? 24 years old. And what were you doing at that time? Were you in school or had you already graduated? I had already graduated and I was working at Cumulus Media. And where did you graduate from? Middle Tennessee State University. And were you the, the member of any groups or organizations while you were at MTSU? Yes, I was a part of Alpha Kappa Psi Professional Business Fraternity and then Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And how, how long had you known D'Ebony Groves? Since uh, 2016. And can you describe your relationship with Ms. Groves? She was um, my best friend, one of my best friends, and like my little sister. Uh, we knew each other through Delta and had mutual friends and found out later we had a lot more mutual friends than we even realized. Um, but we did pretty much everything together. If I wasn't with my best friend Jasmine, I was with Diebney. And so Diebney was a couple years younger than you, is that right? Yes. How often did you guys hang out together? Seemed like every other weekend since the moment we met. And that particular weekend of April 22nd, 2018, what was going on that weekend? 
Uh, we had sorority events that were going on. Tennessee State University was about to initiate a new class of girls into our sorority, and I had one that I'd been a mentor to um, that was on that line, and her mom was actually one of my math teachers um, when I was in high school, and I knew her from since she was a baby, and uh, she selected me to be her special or like her big sister who um, helped mentor her through the process. And so I was going there to pin her um, as she was being inducted to our sorority. So it was a big honor. Which if people not familiar with that, that's a very big honor, is that yes. right? So is it fair to say that that was a pretty special weekend for you guys? Yes, it was. And what events did y'all have that night? Where were you guys at? Uh, we had gone to, uh, earlier in the day, we had gone to the Delta Pinning um, for the new girls. And so I pinned um, Kia Armstrong, who was my mentee at the time. And then um, the Omegas, which are our brother fraternity, um, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, they were having their new member presentation um, right after the Delta pinning. So Debony and I went to that after. And then they also had a social event afterwards um, at the Tennessee State Fairgrounds. And we went to that party. And where did you go after you left the party? Uh, we stopped at the first Waffle House that um, is further up the road on Murfreesboro Road, right where you get to um, the split where the interstate is. Uh, and then we decided that that parking lot was too full and we looked inside and it was too full. There weren't any seats available. Um, so we said, why don't we just go to the one that's closer to my condo um, since we were gonna, she was gonna spend the night with me anyway. She had already spent Friday night and I think Thursday night too. Um, so we were gonna go to the one that was closer to my house because we were really hungry and we had been at events all day. So. Uh, we decided to go to the Waffle House where the incident occurred. Had you ever been to that Waffle House before? Once or twice um, during the daytime. Um, I think I always had somebody with me. Uh, I usually do. And can you describe going to the Waffle House? Um, we pulled into the parking lot. I was driving um, and we didn't see anything wrong. It looked less full than the one where we previously gone. Um, so we went inside and we stopped at the first booth. And I remember Dee Ebony saying like she needed to use the restroom. Um, so I went with her because in our sorority, like the cardinal rule is you never leave somebody alone. Um, so you always go with your sister to the bathroom if she leaves the room, wherever. Um, so I went with her because um, I have a phobia about public restrooms. I don't like using them. Um, so I just waited for her outside and then we both came back into that first booth and sat down. And Your Honor, at this time I would ask to publish what's been previously introduced as Exhibit 3 and specifically the video labeled number 2. Ms. Henderson, have you reviewed this video previously? Yes, this morning. And are you able to identify yourself and your friend, Dee Ebony Groves? Yes. So I'm gonna ask that the video play, and if you can just narrate and describe what you see and what you recognize. Sure. So that's me driving um, into the Waffle House parking lot, and I par um, parked in the first spot right there because the next um, I think there was one spot that was empty and then the next one was a handicapped spot. Um, and so that's D. Ebony opening the passenger side door. And then a few moments later, I opened the driver's side door. So I closed the door and um, went into the back seat to get my wallet and um, jacket. And so that's Dee Ebony and I'm walking um, towards the front entrance. And just for the record, are you wearing a red baseball cap? Yes, um, I think it had something Delta related on it. Uh, what are the Delta colors? Uh, red and white. 
So that's why we were both kind of dressed very similar. We tended to do that a lot. And that's where we kind of paused to figure out what we were going to do and where we were going to sit. And then we're walking towards the bathroom. What was the mood when you guys got there? Um, I think we were like laughing and joking and talking like we always do. Um, and then we sat down. It seemed pretty calm. There didn't seem to be any problem. And I think we um, picked up the menus, but I kind of ordered the all-star special whenever I do go to a Waffle House, which isn't that often, but um, I pretty much at any restaurant stick to the same thing. Um, and so we're laughing and joking and I think because the workers were kind of busy, um, we picked up our own menus because we pretty much were like, we're comfortable. Do you remember anything else that you guys were doing as y'all are sitting there? Um, we started singing Jesus Loves Me. Um, we're both preacher's kids. Um, so our, our, her mom and then my dad um, are ministers and so God is always around us and um, we're always singing and joking and laughing about church and we were both in choir um, growing up. And so we're like singing to each other pretty much. And at this point, does anything seem off to you? Anything at all? Um, not at the time, but I think a couple minutes, um, a couple seconds later, um, James Shaw and Brennan McMurray um, walk in and I recognize Brennan because we went to uh, middle and high school together at Martin Luther King. And uh, had you seen Brennan lately? Um, not at that time. I hadn't seen him since high school. So at first, I don't think I recognized him, but then I kind of looked around like, wait a minute, I know that guy. So that's Brennan uh, McMurray and James Shaw entering the Waffle House and um, sitting behind me. Did you notice anything at all out in the parking lot? I mean, was that even your focus? It wasn't at the time. Um, but shortly after James and Brennan entered the Waffle House, um, we started hearing the loud popping sounds. Um, I think a lot of people in the restaurant thought they were fireworks, um, which was kind of odd for that time of year. Um, but I recognized that they were gunshots and they were pretty rapid. Um, and so in a couple of seconds, you'll see me duck down with the ebony. And when you heard the gunshots, you said you ducked down. Can you describe kind of how you ducked down? Yes, um, I panic kind of set in because um, I was trying to look for an exit and I realized that we didn't have a lot of time. Um, and once the glass shattered in the window of the Waffle House, um, I slouched uh, in between the seat because I couldn't get out fast enough um, to run towards the back area. Uh, so I told Diebony to get down under the booth and then um, I placed my body on top of her hoping that um, she wouldn't be seen because I'm her big sister and it's my job to protect her. Uh, and so that's what I did was try to cover as much as, of my body as possible um, on top of her to protect her because, you know, I feel like her mom and dad knew she'd be with me or they didn't know me at the time, but they expect like her friends to take care of her and return her home in one piece. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that um, despite my best efforts. So once you've ducked down and are under the table, lying there trying to cover Diet. Ebony, what's 
what are you hearing or what what do you remember in that moment i kept hearing the gunshots um and i remembered that torian had gone outside for a smoke break um and did you know torian at the time i did not at the time but you had noticed him walk out yes because um, I remember him letting his other co-workers know that he was about to take a smoke break. Um, and I think Diabini and I kind of made a joke, like, they need more workers because <laughs> we hadn't even placed our order yet. Um, but I, I knew that he was outside. Um, I didn't see Joe at first. Um, but as I looked out the window, once the glass shattered, um, he had turned to me. I could tell, obviously, that he had been hit at least once. I didn't know how many times at the time, but he turned to me and mouth, play dead. Um, and so that's what I did. And um, then I saw him be shot in the head, um, and he died right after that. And are you hearing gunshots go off? Yes. Can you describe how you and Debony are positioned under that table? Um, she's kind of folded really awkwardly under the table because if we were in a rush and we knew like there's nowhere to run, the best thing we can do is try to not be seen or make ourselves seen. Um, and so I figured I'm bigger than her, so I would jump on top of her. Um, so my body, my lower torso, was covering most of her body. Um, and then I think her legs were like towards uh, my back. Um, and I had slouched down and one of the pictures you showed earlier was of the booth that we were in. And that's my blood um, from my arm when I was shot. And I had my head there at first. What do you remember kind of the events immediately before you were shot, and then if you can describe those moments in which you were shot. Um, right after Joe Perez was shot and then Torian was shot, I remember Torian like running, um, but I, I didn't see him at first. It was like a flash. Um, and then Travis Ranking entered the Waffle House and um, I just tried to be as still as possible because I, I felt like if I breathed, um, he would know that I was still alive. Um, and I wanted to be as still as possible and pretend like I was dead. And I figured if he thought I had already been shot, he wouldn't shoot me. Um, but as soon as he came in the door, he looked me in my eyes and he shot me immediately. Um, he shot me three times. He shot me um, in my right forearm, um, so I have a concave injury. Um, this is the entrance, and then on the front of my forearm is the exit wound. Um, that's right here, it's about this long. Um, and then I was shot in my upper bicep, and it took a chunk of my arm off, um, and the bullet fragments ended up in the soft tissue right outside of my lungs. Um, and then he also shot me in my leg, and my leg was detached. Um, it was hanging on by like tendons and skin. Um, and I remember looking at it, because I didn't see my arm at first, and I just remember looking at my leg like, God, please help me, because I, I don't think I'm gonna make it. Um, and I looked at my leg and I passed out, because uh, I think I was in such shock. Um, that I passed out for a couple of seconds. And Do you remember feeling pain at that moment? Immediately. Can you describe that pain? It was the worst pain I've ever felt. It was excruciating. Um, it was probably worse than some of the surgeries that I've had, but those were extreme as well. At any point, were you able to look at your leg? Yes. Um, Can you describe what your injury looked like? Um, the bullet had gone through the left side of my calf and entered, and it exited through the right side of my calf, and it was completely s severed. Um, both bones that are in my 
lower calf, um, my tibula and fibula, they were shattered. Um, and I remember I had army boots on because that's what um, we wear with Delta. We spray paint our boots red, um, but they're army boots we get from a surplus store. Um, and I just remember it being turned. Like if my foot's like pointed straight at you, it was turned on its side and the leg was almost completely detached. Were you able to move it? No, um, I tried, um, but I felt like I couldn't move my right arm. Um, and that's when I looked at my arm and realized how much damage had been done and that I'd been hit in the side. Um, but I tried to move it with my left and I couldn't move it at all. You said that in that moment that you kind of blacked out. Yes. Was that a permanent blackout where you no. stayed unconscious or at some point did you regain consciousness? I regained consciousness, um, I assume a couple of seconds later, um, but I definitely blacked out and things stopped breathing. And what do you remember kind of in those moments about how you were feeling, what you were seeing, what you're hearing? Um, I had what I call like a heaven experience, you know, when someone says like, don't go towards the white light, um, I did. Uh, and I just remember thinking like, God, please give me a second chance. Um, I, I don't want to die right now. Um, and that's why when I came to, um, I took a big breath and then I kind of looked at myself like in my back where we are, um, back in the Waffle House and I looked around and I remember, um, I guess James Shaw had walked past us and out of the restaurant um, and I tried to ask him for help and I think he kind of looked at me like he didn't realize that I was alive. Um, and that's when I started saying like, I'm not dead. Um, and I asked him for help and I think he was in shock and so he was like, I can't help you and he walked out the door. Um, and then a couple of moments later, the first police officer um, that arrived on scene came in and that's when I took another big gasp because at that point panic had set in and I was trying to breathe and couldn't really catch my breath. Um, so I took a big breath and gasp and said, I'm not dead because I knew the next person that came in that door was going to think I was. Um, and he looked at me and was in complete shock and then he went Towards, and you're uh, talking about that police officer? Yes, the police officer had gone towards the left, um, towards where Tia and Akila were, and checked on them. And I kept thinking, like, come back, come back, um, because I didn't know when the next person was going to come to come help us. And he did come back, and he asked some of the patrons to keep me breathing. Uh, so they got on top of the booth where we were sitting and I guess they had heard us singing um, and so in, instead of like counting um, they asked me to say Jesus because um, I guess they knew our faith and they were like if you can say that you know, it'll keep you alive um, and it did. What about Diabony? Did you ever see her? I did not see her. I um, did not see her face. Um, I like to think, fortunately for me, my last memories of her were her alive and smiling and laughing with me. Um, I like to think that her last moments weren't of the terror that we experienced. Could you hear anyone else in the Apple House? Um, I could hear some of the patrons and customers trying to call 911 and I remember them being like frustrated with the operators um, because no one knew the address and everybody kept yelling like what's the address what's the address but because it was a new one nobody knew um, and so I, I think people just hung up and they were like we have to basically do this on our own until um, someone comes to help us. Um, and then a couple moments later, 
the first set of paramedics started to come in and assess the situation and they kind of split up in teams and they came towards me and then the other team went towards um, Akila and, and Shantia. When Mr. Ryan King came inside the Waffle House, you've described that he looked right at you yes. before he shot you. Yes. Was he saying anything? He didn't say anything, but he looked at me in my eyes and he was determined. Like he knew what he was doing and what he planned to do. Um, and I'm sure my eyes looked like I was begging for mercy without saying anything. Uh, and he shot me anyway. Do you see that person in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Could you point him out? And then... He's right there. Can you and describe he's what an he's AB wearing? Blue shirt. Your Honor, if the record could reflect that this witness has identified the defendant, Travis Ryan King. Ms. Henderson, you described that the first responders finally were there and they had a gurney. Were you taken to the hospital? Yes, uh, it took a while for them to unpin me from underneath the booth. Um, and so I think one of them had crawled to the second booth to grab part of my leg so that it would stay as close to attached as possible because it was just hanging on. Um, and I just kept screaming. Um, and then they finally were able to get the board underneath me and um, they were asking about a tourniquet like did I need one or not um, and they ended up placing like two tourniquets on me and then getting me onto the gurney and I remember it being so difficult it was like five or six of them and it was so difficult to get me through those front doors because um, I'm pretty tall um, I'm 5'9", and my legs were, like, hanging off of the gurney, and they were just trying to hold it together and hold my arm on. Um, and it took them a couple of tries to try to get through the two doors to the entrance and over Joe Perez. And then they put me into the ambulance, and by that time I was more conscious than I was before, and I remember just trying to tell them everything about me, um, name, address, parents' name, phone numbers, um, whatever I could until I felt like I was going to black out again. I remember getting really sleepy. Um, and they just kept talking to me and like, tell me whatever you want to tell me um, until we can get you to the hospital. And they were trying to find uh, a vein that they could use in order to give me an IV. Um, because I had not had pain medicine, and by this time we're riding towards um, 440. Uh, Can you describe that pain? It was complete distress. Um, it was excruciating. I could literally like feel my heart pumping and trying to get blood to the rest of my body, um, and it just kept oozing and pouring. The blood? Yes. Did they give you any pain medicine before, during that trip before you got to the hospital? No, I felt every bump, every dent in the road, everything. Um, and I just kept thinking, like, please give me pain medicine. Please give me pain medicine. And they couldn't get a vein because my arm, the veins in my arm were completely shattered. Um, and so was my leg, and they just couldn't get one, and they were debating on whether they were going to put one in my neck. Um, but they thought going down the interstate as fast as we were going was too much. Uh, and so they couldn't get one. And I didn't get pain medicine until I was in the OR. How long did it take you to get into the OR, do you remember? Probably about 20 minutes, if, if not longer than that. Uh, when I first got to Vanderbilt, I came through the ER entrance. And um, one of the nurses that was there, actually, I begged her to let me make a call. Uh, I wanted to call my, my parents and tell them where I was. Uh, and so she actually went against the rules and pulled out her personal cell phone um, 
and asked me what the number was and I gave her my mom's number because I figured she would answer. Um, she usually does, especially if it's in the morning. Um, my dad's kind of a hard sleeper and <laughs> he doesn't answer for anybody unless it's me. Uh, and my mom answered and she was kind of like, what's going on? And I just said, I love you. And I said, tell daddy I love him too. And by that time they were like, okay, we have to go. Um, and so I think the nurse was, she took the phone from me and she just said like, you need to get to Vanderbilt as soon as possible. Um, there's been an accident. Um, and until the news broke, my parents didn't know um, that I had been shot. They thought it was a car accident and they thought, there she is, texting and driving. We told her don't do that. And I don't typically do it, but, um, you know, they were like, man, she's been in a car accident. We got to get there. And they're thinking, you know, I'm fine and that it's not life or death. They thought I was okay, but I wasn't. What's the next memory that you have? Um, I remember waking up the, I guess it was the next day. I'd had like an 18 hour surgery, my first surgery. Um, and I think I asked where D'Ebony was and like nobody would answer me about where she was. And every time I like tried to ask, um, they would like give me more pain medicine and pretty much put me back to sleep. Um, so I didn't find out until a couple of days later because um, I had to have another 18 hour surgery. Um, both of those were the life saving surgeries to try to um, replace the veins in my arm and leg. Um, and can you explain what you mean about life saving surgeries? Um, where they come in and they bring a team of doctors, trauma surgeons, um, plastics. Um, they had a vein doctor that I think was one of the only ones of his kind in like four states. Um, and I think he had heard it over the trauma radio and left his home and came in because he knew it was going to be needed um, based on the injuries that they had described on the radio. Um, and he came in and took a vein graft from my right inner thigh and they used it to replace um, two arteries in my arm and then one of the arteries in my leg. How many surgeries have you had since this happened? Approximately 24. And can you describe what were you able to do or what were you not able to do after this happened? In the beginning, um, I wasn't able to do anything. I needed assistance with moving. I couldn't even walk yet. Um, I couldn't sit up on my own. Uh, they had to help feed me, um, bathe me, clothe me. I couldn't use the restroom on my own. Um, I think that was the most difficult because as a young woman, you know, 24 years old, the last thing I want is somebody to have to help me use the restroom. Um, and having my parents have to learn how to do all my wound care. Um, doctors and nurses constantly coming in. Um, I had to learn how to feed myself. I was right-handed, so I couldn't use my right arm at all. Um, so I had to teach myself how to do everything with my left hand. Um, hold a spoon, hold a fork, um, open things, write my name. That probably took the longest. Um, I was an artist prior to this, so I like to paint and draw, and I did a lot of like paddles and artwork for people that were in sororities and fraternities. Um, that's probably where I made the most money, because um, I knew the most people that were in uh, our Divine Nine organizations of the National Panhellenic Council, and so they would always come to me like, hey, can you paint me a paddle with my name and our chapter and all that stuff on it? And um, that was my joy, was to do that and play tennis, and I couldn't do those things anymore. I wanna kind of go back to those first few days that you're in the hospital. Are you watching the news and on social media 
or are you kind of isolated from what's going on with all of the media attention? Completely isolated. Um, my parents did not want me watching the news. Um, I didn't have my cell phone. I think it was in police evidence. Um, and then they eventually brought it back to me. Um, I got it much later. Um, but I was completely isolated. I didn't turn the TV on. I, I think my parents probably moved it to the other side of the room, so I wouldn't even be able to get to it. Um, At some point, did the detectives come to you and talk to you about what happened, about the shooting? Yes, they did. And did they come back and see you and bring you a set of photographs? Yes, they did. And were you able to identify the person who shot you in those photographs? Yes, I was. If I can have just one moment. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask the court's permission to allow Ms. Henderson to actually show her injuries in her arm and her leg to the jury so that she can display the injuries that she's just described. Did you do that? Yes, sir. Huh? I guess, Ms. Henderson, if you could just point out to them that entrance, room, entrance wound in your right forearm and then also the other side of the exit wound. And then if you can show them also that entrance wound in your right bicep area, that part of your arm that's missing. And then if you can show them the wounds to your left leg, both sides of it. And is that the entrance wound on your outer left leg? Thank you, Ms. Henderson. I don't have any other questions, but the defense attorneys might. Ms. Henderson, you don't have to get back up here. We'll get you whatever you have up here. Good afternoon, Mr. Shaw. Would you please state your name and spell it for the record? Uh, my name is James Shaw, Jr. Uh, J-A-M-E-S-S-H-A-W-J-R. All right. Mr. Shaw, um, were you president of Waffle House on April 22nd, 2018? Yes, sir. Where were you coming from? Um, it had kind of been a long night. I got started downtown at uh, Jonathan's Grill down here. I was invited by a friend named Key. Um, it was real apprehensive going. 
Um, the whole night was kind of a cluster of different emotions that I didn't want to do or do. Um, Brendan had invited me to one of his fraternity's parties. Um, so we went to the party off of uh, Bell Road and Nine Bar. Um, and that's where we were before the Waffle House. Did y'all arrive together? Uh, we rode in different vehicles. He has a white Jeep and I have a red uh, four-door F-150 at the time. Okay. And what was your relationship with, with Brendan? Is he your friend or is he your frat brother or what? Um, he's definitely not my frat brother, but he's my, <laughs> he's my good friend. Uh, we've known each other for quite a while um, through different organizations. Okay. Um, and so while you were at this party, um, did you have anything to drink? No. I'm okay. sober. You were completely sober? Please. Yes, sir. And so when you drive to the to the Waffle, when you leave the party, where did you go? Um, so when we leave the party of Nine Bar on Bell Road, um, there's a Taco Bell that's pretty close to down the street. Um, we pull in the Taco Bell parking lot. Taco Bell is closed. Um, I think McDonald's was closed also. So we drive up the street up Bell Road and we go to um, the Waffle House that's off the Bell Road beside Thornton's gas station. Uh, the gas, um, that Waffle House parking lot is completely packed and me and BJ, because we have bigger vehicles, we just park on the curb um, and we walk down. It's a lady that has a black central, new, it still has drive out tags and somebody had just hit it at the time. Um, and so she was going through you know, what if you have to go through for um, to file a claim. Um, so we walk inside um, the Waffle House. We kind of actually walk all the way around the Waffle House. Uh, we get a seat, um, and we're like, it's a little ratchet in here. So we determined not to sit down at that particular Waffle House. <laughs> um, so we get up, and I had been to that Waffle House, the new Waffle House that we were going to go to off of Murfreesville Pike, the weekend or two weekends before. Um, and I knew it was pretty new and I knew nobody had been there. So uh, we stopped at the Thorntons and we made our way to the Waffle House off of Murphy Grove Pike. And Mr. Shaw, about what time are you leaving Thorntons to go to the to the new Waffle House on Murphy's Grove Pike? I say we would leave about 3.15, 3.12. I think we made it to the other Waffle House about 3.18. Okay. Um, and when you got to the to the new Waffle House, what uh, what did you do when you got there? Um, immediately, what we did was uh, we pulled in in the far north entrance of the Waffle House. Um, then we made our way to the south end of the Waffle House. Uh, BJ pulled in. We left a space in between us, and I backed in. Okay. And did you get out of the car? Out of your truck, rather? Yes. BJ got out of his car, and I got out of my truck, um, and we made kind of a diagonal walk towards the Waffle House. What was y'all's kind of mood or vibe at the time? Um, I was honestly kind of annoyed because of what was going on with the party, and I actually didn't want to really be out. I actually just wanted to stay in the house, but um, it was him and his fraternity, so I thought I should just go support, um, be a good friend, and then I just thought, I'd, you know, just go out. Um, but nonetheless, when we got at the Waffle House, we were, um, we were fine. We had fun. We were laughing. Um, and then we proceeded to walk in. Did you see a, a, a goldish, tannish pickup truck sitting near the, close by the entrance of the Waffle House? Yes, it was a Shelly Silverado extended cab. And, um, did you see anyone inside of that truck? Yes, I did. You kind of looking over to your left. Um, are you seeing the person that you saw inside the truck in this courtroom? He's giving me the same look he did that night. And what was that look? Looked like he didn't care. Did uh, either of you say anything? Mention that look, the way that he was looking. You, so, you are Mr. McMurray. So Brennan gave you the PG thirteen version. Brennan said to me. Look at this crazy motherfucker. Go shoot up the place. When we walked in. And if you look at the video, I turn around. And I look back at him. And he's still staring at us. Um, when we're walking in. Because he was sizing us up. 
What did you do as you got inside? Uh, as we got inside, BJ sat in the third seat at the bar um, at the countertop, and I sat in the first seat when we had a seat in between us. Why did you feel like that? Uh, BJ's 5'10", 260. I'm 6'2", 214. We just wanted some space in between us. Just man code? Absolutely. Gotcha. Um, and was there anything about sitting with your back to the windows that gave you any concern? Well, usually, um, I don't ever sit with my back to the window. Um, BJ sat down first, and then I had the first seat. Um, there was two ladies beside us in the booth, and then it was a skip booth, then it was Trey and Mike Garth. Um, I could see D'Agney's face, and then I could see Sharita's back of her head. Um, as I glanced and looked around the whole place, uh, I could see D'Agney, and like I said, I could see Mike Garth and everybody else, but... Um, I was thinking nothing was going to happen. Okay, so you're saying that to your right there were individuals sitting in the in those booths to the right of you? Yes, sir. Did you know them before April 22nd, 2018? No, sir. Okay. Where were Mike Garf, who you've described, and Trey seated? Um, they were seated across from each other in the booth, in the very back booth beside the bathroom entry door. Okay. Um, and then Sharita and the Ebony? Um, they were pretty much right beside us at the booth, right beside us. And I think it was a young lady, not, now who I know is Kayla Shaw, uh, was sitting kind of close to BJ. Okay. And so because you, you say you didn't know her at the time, is she related to you? Not at all. Okay. Um, and did you see any other individuals inside of the Waffle House? Um, we, we heard Torin, um, Sanderlin. Um, he said he was going to go on his 15-minute smoke break. He'd be right back. Um, and we saw, I mean, you see the shapes and sides of people's, but um, at the time I didn't really know them. Um, but I, you know, like I said, looked around and checked my surroundings. Understood. Um, as you were seated at the bar area waiting, I guess, either to order or to eat, what what is, uh, are you guys having any conversation? Are you... Um, um, so we're talking about the cook, um, and the cook is the other cook, um, after Torrance stepped out, um, the other cook is washing dishes, and as he's washing these dishes, we're just looking at him because he's stacking them up on the shelf, and he keeps stacking them and stacking them, um, and I guess they had to be at least 12 or 15 plates high, and we're like, those plates are going to come down, they're going to crash to the ground, so we have a small little joke about that, mind you, my phone is on the countertop of the um, of the bar. Um, no sooner do we start joking and laughing about that, you know, you kind of hear a noise. I didn't really pay attention, and I kind of turn over my left hand shoulder, and you can see this figure kind of falling. Um, now that I know that's Joe Perez, and then the windows are shot out. It looks like. Um, a silver glitter is going through the air. Um, all in one turn, I made a step to my right towards Mike Garth um, and Trey Sneed and went towards the bathroom area. Why did you go that way? I'm um, shocked were coming over my left, my left shoulder. Okay, so you were trying to get away from the gunshots. Well, I want to survey and get away from the gunshots. Understood. And where did you go? Um, immediately, I just went to the right. Um, when I fell, BJ picked me up and he went into the bathroom before me. So that's how he got in there before me. Um, I was actually going to step on the booth, the empty booth, and jump over and try to run out. But something told me, no, don't do that. And they were in the back, and we all went through the swivel door. Um, and this is when I just stopped behind the, the door and looked through the eyelid glass window. Um, and then he, he turned the gun towards me, and he let off around. Okay. And Your Honor, I'm gonna. I'd like to 
show five uh, Mr. Shaw a copy of what has previously been admitted, a copy of what's previously been admitted as Exhibit 5A. -A. Oh, yeah. That's Sorry. Wrong picture. No, it's the right picture. I just need to show it to over the, on the overhead. So that was my mistake. Okay. okay. Yes. Now that you've seen that that image, though, what is Exhibit Five AA? Is that is that the area where you were standing behind that door? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm gonna show it to you a little bit better. What are, this image, what is it looking at? What is it showing? Um, the image is showing the doorway to the bathroom area. And who else was behind that door with you? Just in this area or in the bathrooms also? Both. Uh, Mike Garth and Trey Sneed are actually in the hallway with me. Um, Brittany McMurray, uh, Adiba, um, Alex, his girlfriend, Alexis, Alexis, um, at the time, uh, I didn't mean to mispronounce her name. Um, they were in, I think the closest bathroom to my left at the time. And I think it was, um, Amaya Forrest was in the boys bathroom, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. As, um, as you're hearing gunshots, are you standing or are you on the ground? Uh, I would be, <laughs> I would be standing like here. And I'm looking through the window, but um, I'm also listening to the gun and it's not a handgun. It's more rapid fires. Ta -ta -ta -ta. It's how not pow, 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 it's ta -ta 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 -ta. And, and so how, how could you tell that that wasn't a handgun? Uh, it, was, it was a lot more deafening than what a handgun is. And it was, a, like I said, it was more rapid fire than it was finger pull trigger one at a time. So as you were standing behind the door, what were Mike Garth and Trace Need doing? I'm not sure they were behind me. They were, I'm assuming, taking cover. Did you ever hear any gunshots come through the door into your space? Yes. Describe uh, that. Uh, it was more of a whistle. And um, come to find out it struck me later um, in my arm. Um, it just was a graze, but um, I didn't know that until I was completely uh, outside. Um, the one of the cops in BJ had brought me up a chair and they were like, are you okay? Look at your arm. I was actually didn't know it at the time. Okay. And did the did you suffer any injuries that to your arm? Um, I mean, I still have um, the gunshot wound, um, the keloided. Um, I have a scrape on my elbow. I have a scrape on my knee. A couple scratches um, on my face from. We had an altercation and struggle over the gun. Um, nothing cocoa butter couldn't fix. <laughs> Understood. Um, you took it down for me. Thank you. What, if anything, did you do? I'm sorry. Was there ever a pause in the gunshots? Yes, it was. What What did you do when you heard the pause? I acted. What do you mean by that? Um, there was a voice that told me to do it. Do it now. And I acted upon that voice because um, I didn't see any other way. That's why I didn't go in the bathroom because I told myself that's like shooting, shooting fish in a, in a barrel, literally. Um, so I wanted to stay outside that door, um, try to keep eye on him and just try to find my moment, just try to find my opportunity. Um, and it presented itself. 
And what did you do when you when you found your moment? Um, I ran through the door as fast as I could. Um, in such a short corridor, um, there's really only two steps that I took behind the door. And I just ran through the door thinking, it's either it's going to be me or him or it's going to be, you know, death. We'll see what happens. What did you hit the door with? My left shoulder. All my whole body. Everything that I could to put through the door, to put in him. Did you see Mr. Ranking point the gun down before you rushed the door? Absolutely. And what did you think he was doing? Reloading. Put another magazine in. Once you rushed the door, what happened? Um, so I had to... I had to think while we were literally fighting. I had to think of what I could do and not get injured at the same time and get away. So giving up my hand was the only thing I could do. You're going to have to grab the barrel, James. You're going to have to push it down. That's the conversation you're having with yourself in your mind? Say yes. Yes, sir. Did the two of you have to struggle over the, the weapon? Yes, sir. And um, go ahead. ahead. Um, so when I first run through the door, um, knocks him off balance, gets up. Um, I didn't grab the gun with my right hand, the barrel, and I point the barrel down because I know if the barrel's pointed down to the ground, it can't hurt me. Um, it can't really hurt anybody if it's pointed down to the ground. Um, and so I take him and I'm kind of choking him with my left hand and I'm pushing him and I'm pushing him out the way and he kind of goes for my left hand and as he goes for my left hand I take my right hand off the, I take, I, you still use my right hand I take my left hand off of him and I'm just pulling up, pulling up and pulling up and I finally get the gun and I throw it and I watch the gun look like it in the in the in the in the air for days, and I just watched it glide and glide and glide, and it finally went over the bar. And then I wanted to get to safety, and he was in the way, so I moved him out the way. And and when you say you moved him out of the way, what where did you move him? I moved him out of the way. I moved him out of my way. My way to safety was outside, and he was standing in front of it. So, at that point, I didn't care if it was Shaq or anybody. He was in my way. Get out my way. So I pushed him out my way. I manhandled him out my way. I overpowered him out my way. Which, what did he do once he got outside? Um, he then moved. Um, we made kind of a V-shape because he walked on the further side of in between me and BJ's car and he kind of trotted away. When I came out, I was running um, and I made a right turn and I went around the south end of the building and I made a turn and I slipped and fell. That's when I scratched my, that's when I scratched my knee. Um, and I'm still watching him because I thought he was behind me following me, but he um, went towards, I think it's Pinhook. Um, he went down Murfreesboro Pike and Pinhook is to the left and I think it's Summit. And he just went down Murfreesboro Pike. Um, so after a little while, I made sure he was gone. Um, I kind of looked, looked, he was gone. Um, jumped in my truck um, on my truck at that time I could have I could have just typed in a pin code and get my truck and I kind of took off and stopped and realized I need to get BJ um, so I stopped off my door I'm screaming BJ 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 um, he doesn't come but I'm still kind of I don't know where he is um, so I take off and then I say, I need to call 911. 
while my phone's face down on the countertop and I'm checking and I don't have anything to call. Um, so I stop an Uber driver and I stop this girl and I tell him to call the police. Um, I was in the Easeway slash intersection of uh, Murfreesboro Pike and the Waffle House. Um, they stop and call. Um, I turn my truck around and my truck is pointing with the nose towards Waffle House. Um, and then I take it upon myself because I'm, I'm BJ's son's son and daughter. I'm their godfather. So I just have to, I, I got to go find them. Um, Mr. Shaw, I want to, I want to stop you. I want to stop you there. I want to go back to the struggle that you had with the defendant. While you're inside the Waffle House, did you hear him saying anything? Um, he was more so like <laughs> inside the Waffle House? Inside. It might have been some, some curse words he might have let out. 100% um, was focused on getting the gun away from him. And once you got outside the Waffle House, did you hear him say anything to you? Yes. And what did he say? It's like some along the lines of this nigger disarm me. Now, Mr. Shaw, will you, you describe for us how you were able to disarm him, uh, Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'd like um, to have Mr. Shaw um, show using exhibit number 13, where he touched the, where he had to touch the firearm. All right. And if he could be allowed to step down from the. And he, Mr. Shaw will need to put some gloves on before he touches the weapon. Mr. Shaw, did the barrel burn your hand? Which hand? You were saying you were trying to do anything you could to win to get the gun from him? And about how long did it take you to, to, to win? Them to, I don't want the, the barrel to get pointed at anybody out of concern.
Uh, Mr. Shaw, have you have you seen any su surveillance video of the of what occurred inside the Waffle House? Yes, sir. And was that surveillance video a, a fair and accurate depiction of what occurred? Yes, sir. And Your Honor, I'd ask to be able to publish what has previously been admitted as Exhibit Three, and this video is contained on the disc. Uh, with the title video three. Right. Sorry. I don't know how we got the wrong thing. No. Do we do intend to admit that image at, at eventually, so my apologies, just out of order. Okay. Mr. Shaw, whose vehicles are those moving through the parking lot? The white, the white Jeep is Brennan McMurray's, and the um, red F-150 is my truck. Um, the gold, the gold truck. Sure. Oh, uh, the gold truck is Mr. Ryan King's truck. Okay. And so, what are what are the two of you doing now? You and Mr. McMurray. Uh, we're walking, like I said, at that angle to try to um get into the Waffle House. Um, BJ's wearing the white pants, brown shirt. I'm wearing all gray, um, with brown boots. Now, um, can you tell me what it appears BJ is doing right there? Um, to me, it seems like BJ is uh, actually looking towards um, Mr. Ryan King. And what about now? He sees him. Okay. And what about what are you doing? Um, right now, I'm not looking at him. Right now. Did and. Did you see whether or not you looked at him? Probably right there. Well, it's kind of choppy. But definitely right here. Right here, where I'm looking back. Took that step back. It was just his, you know how you go in somebody's house and the picture is not square? Yes. What that's do you mean by that? That's the kind of energy he was giving me. He, his energy wasn't, his energy wasn't right. You could just, I could just feel it. It was just, then when we entered, that was the reason I turned around like that. That's when BJ said what he said. Okay. <clears throat> the individuals who are sitting at this booth back here, who, who are they? Can you see? Uh, Mike Garth and Trey Sneed. What what is you and Mr. McMurray doing at this moment? Um, I think we're both um, kind of texting right now on our phones. Uh, I think we started talking about um, the cook washing dishes. Um, as you can see on the on the shelf back there, the dishes are quite hot. Um, we're just kind of I think we're just now just looking at the menu. Do you remember that moment right there? The first, the first shot fired into the building. Yes. Yes. Um, for me, that first moment was to take cover. Who is this individual now walking through the store? Travis Ryan King. And who 
is the individual now running out of the restaurant? Uh, Travis Ryan King. And had you already run out of the restaurant? Um, yes, it kind of cuts it off, but I was, I was kind of tight to the building. I'm more so in the grass area. Okay. <clears throat> and who is this right here? Uh, Joe Perez. So that's me coming back in frame. I was trying to make sure he was gone. What are you doing now? Um, this is me calling for BJ. Um, still don't know where uh, Mr. Ryan King is, um, but I wanted to get BJ um, or let him know that I was out there because I had, I had seen what was going on. And I'm trying to tell people not to pull in, um, and not not to stop, but um, I'm kind of frantic kind of in problem solver mode right now. Mr. Shaw, did you ever go back inside the Waffle House that evening? Yes, sir. What did you see when you walked back in? So... I saw everybody that was either shot or passed that night. Um, when I came back down and had my nose facing, had my truck nose facing the Waffle House, I had to see Torrance Sandlin. Um, he was missing part of his dreadlocks because the back of his head was gone. And he was laying in such a way that I knew he wasn't alive. Um, it was not, it, if you went in the Waffle House, it was not a way that you couldn't see Joe Perez. He was just that close to the door. Um, his head was disfigured. He had on white wash jeans. He had on Air Max, he had on Air Max Nike's 270s. They had a pink bubble on the back of them. Um, I think he had a gray jacket on and a cap, but the cap was blown off, obviously. His head was disfigured, and his eyes was like a milky gray. Um, and he was in... He was not laying in a way that looked comfortable to lay, other than being dead. Um, neither one of them were making any kind of any kind of movement at all. No chest compressions up and down, no nothing. Um, so I proceeded to walk on the inside and I said, BJ, BJ. Um, and a young lady says, this him over here. And I think it might have been Kayla Shaw, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, and I kept saying BJ and I had to step over Kilo. Um, And I had to step back after I went to the left. I had to come back right because I remember BJ went to the bathroom. So when I go back to the right, I see BJ. I know he's fair skinned, it, but BJ was almost as white as his cup up here because um, he didn't know what happened. And I did know what happened. And I was trying to tell him to come on. And he just told me about his keys. I got to get my keys. He kept telling me about his keys. And I was frustrated because I was telling him, like, look, I already fought, dude. I already know what's going on. We need to go. Um, and then I can kind of know. I mean, it's it's quiet. It's, it's an eerie quiet. There's no screaming. It's dead silence 
and I can still see people huddled down and I'm telling people everybody needs to leave. Um, everybody needs to get out because at the time the cook was trying to tell everybody to take cover. And I see Sharita. And when I see her, the first thing that comes to my mind is how can I move her? She asked me for help, but I'm thinking, how can I move her? I can't, in my mind, it's just, I can't move her. And why, why did you feel like you could not move her? The best example I can give you is her leg looked like a banana peel with no banana in it. It was just hanging there. And I saw it, and I saw the ebony up under the table laying in such a way that you know, I knew she wasn't alive anymore. And when I seen Sharita, it was just, I, I couldn't help her. I, I wanted to, but I, her, her, I mean, I can see it now. I've, I've been seeing it for 1,380 days. Did you just do that math today? No, I've been keeping, I, I kept, I keep it. <laughs> I've just been keeping it. Did you see Akila and, and uh, Shantia? Shantia also asked for help, and her leg was pretty much the same way, and I regrettably had to tell her that I couldn't help her either. I just tried to get everybody out. That was my, my goal, my mission. Um, Mr. Shahid, you do you have any experience in assist? Uh, I guess law enforcement, being a paramedic, EMT, anything like that, military? <laughs> no, sir. Okay. Um. So, as you're trying to help people, what I guess, what do you, what? led you to be able to assist people that, that day? Hmm. I was favored. I was blessed. And and, and Mr. Shaw, you've obviously been called a hero by many people. Would you say that you were acting uh, out, of, out of altruism? Sure. I mean, I, you know, in a moment it's kind of, it's real rough to, to put a label on it, right? After you've seen what I've seen and you had to tell these two ladies, I, I can't help you. But truth and honesty was, I, I really couldn't move you. I would love to help you, but I couldn't help you. Your Honor, the last thing I'd like to do is, is pass up the uh, two images which I've shown and provided a copy to Mr. Sh to defense counsel. These are new, Your Honor. I just look at and, and Mr. Shaw, do you recognize those images? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that they've been pre marked as A and B. Uh, what, could you tell me, are they, what are they? Um, this first image here is um, me at the hospital. When we went to the hospital, um, we were at the hospital and uh, they had wrapped my hands up. I went to uh, Southern Southern Hills. Um, um, they wrapped my hand up and they determined I have second degree burns from grabbing the gun. Um, the mark on my elbow right here is from when I ran around the building and fell. Um, right here is where the the gun, where the bullet grazed my my, I guess you could say elbow area, yeah, forearm area. Rather than describing all this 
Tell them whether or not you can identify them. Let me put it on oh. the screen. Yeah, yeah, identify, brother. Thank you, Josh. Yeah. And I like that's what you're about right That now. is, okay. so yes. I'd ask that that be made the next exhibit. I have a... So 16, yes, I'm, I'm going to put it on the computer. Okay. This is 16A um, for the record. And you were just saying, uh, describing the injuries, Mr. Shaw, where, where is the injury to your hand, uh, the burn injury to your hand? Uh, the burn injury to my hand was from um, the web of my thumb, probably up to my index. And then it was on all four of my regular fingers while burned from um, grabbing the barrel of the gun and wrapping my hands around the barrel. Okay. And what is this injury right here? Um, that's from when I fell um, and slid on my elbow when I ran around the side of the Waffle House. Okay. And th is there another injury to your arm in this picture? Yeah, right here is where the bullet grazed me. It is kind of off, off, the, off the frame, but... Okay. And then I'd like to show 16B. And uh, what does this image show? Um, I'm at my church, um, and that's me um, with some galls on my hands. And as you can see here, my fingers got burrs and blood and glass in it, and same thing right here. And my hand was pretty much burnt in this general area. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. And Thank you for what you did. Good evening, Mr. Shaw. Just a few questions for you. Going back to, uh, we watched the video of it, but going back to the time you engage with Mr. Ryan King and take the gun from him and you throw it over the counter. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I think what you said was that uh, at that point in time, you just wanted to leave and get outside, correct? Mm -hmm. And I think you said something to the effect that you pushed him to the, out of the way or got him out of the way, moved him out of the way. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And when you moved him out of the way, were you still inside the Waffle House? When what you're saying, move him out of the way, were you still inside the Waffle House at that point? No, sir. Okay, so once you got the gun and you, you made a motion where you throw the gun over the counter, what is Mr. Ryan King doing at that point? Still trying to fight me. Okay, and you're, but my understanding though, you're already in the Waffle House next to the tables when this is happening, right? Can we just pull the video back up? I'm just asking you if you remember when you engaged with him with the rifle, were you inside the Waffle House? Yes, we were inside the Waffle House. Okay. Once you obtained the right, you got the rifle from him and you threw it over the counter at that point. Is that when you went to leave to exit the Waffle House or did you stay in there for a longer period of time? No, I wanted to leave. Okay. And so did you immediately go to leave at that point? I tried, but he was in the way. Okay. And when you say he was in the way, were y'all still inside the Waffle House? Yes. Okay. And at that point in time is when you said you moved him, pushed him, however you want to describe it, but basically you moved him out of the way. Is that right? Yes, sir. And that would have been, if you're trying to exit the Waffle House, that would have been to your right. Well, it's two doors. We were together through the first door, the first breezeway door, and then the second door is the one we pushed apart, but we were still in. Okay. Was he already out that first door when you were trying to, to leave, or did... No, he was not out the first door. Were y'all still engaged together? Yes, sir. We were engaged all the way through till we broke through outside, pretty much. Okay, and then once you, you broke apart and went outside, and I think you went to the left. Is that correct? Well, I'm staying tight to the building. I'm not in the side. I'm not in the side. Oh, he... he was in the sidewalk because his coat came off. He tried to put his coat back on. Okay, but what I'm asking you is when you exited the 
the Waffle House. You went, went out to the, the right. What I call the second door. I went to the right. Did you, you, your vehicle was to the right and you went to the right, which is exactly where he was, right? Yes, sir. And was, were you in front of him? Did you get out before he did or did he get out before you did? I got out before he did. Okay. And you basically took off running at that point away from the door, correct? Yes, sir. And he was behind you, correct? Yes, sir. All right. And were you turning around and looking at him? Yes, sir. Okay. And I think, and so he, you were in front of him running away and he was behind you. And I think the way that you previously described it, you said that he was trotting away, I think is the term you used earlier today? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, after that, you went to the Southern Hills Hospital, correct? Yes, sir. And I believe it was a detective, Summerall, and a detective, Claire, that interviewed you there? I can't remember. 1,380 days ago. Okay. Well, were you interviewed by law enforcement there? Yes, sir. Okay. And you hadn't been drinking that night, so I imagine your mind's pretty clear when you're telling them what happened, right? As clear as can be after seeing what I saw. All right. Was there one or two detectives, if you recall, that interviewed you? Two. Okay. And when they interviewed you, um, you basically, one of the things that you told them was that he was, um, I think the wording was, that he had let that the suspect had left on foot he was not running but just walking at a fast pace and is that what you mean when you're saying trotting. trotting away okay now i'd also think that evening um they basically were asking you what happened and there came a point in time mr shaw didn't it when they asked you did the suspect say anything racial whatsoever you recall mm -hmm. being asked that no sir you don't recall them asking you what that night whether that the suspect had said anything that was racial in nature. No, sir. All right. Do you recall telling them uh, that you never heard anything racial in nature? You know, I asked that, sir. Oh. Okay. All right. Would you agree that you did not tell them? You, you gave a statement in this courtroom just not that long ago that was um, racial in nature. You recall it? Yes, sir. Okay. You never told the detectives that when they first met with you, right? Uh, I'm not sure, sir. You're not sure? Not sure, okay. sir. In fact, you've never told law enforcement that, have you? Oh, uh, sure, sir. We, did, we Pardon? Okay. I didn't understand you. I said I'm not sure, sir. Okay. One second. Mr. Shaw, um, were you interviewed a few days later after the incident at the police department? Yes, sir. Okay. And was that the same? Do you know, recall whether or not those were the same officers that interviewed you at the hospital? I don't know if they were the same officers or not, sir. Okay. Were there two detectives that interviewed you at the police department? Yes, sir. North, Pre North Precinct? I'm not sure which police department. I just know it was at a police department. Oh, well, I, yes, sir. I don't know. Uh, okay. Okay. And at that time, do you recall them specifically asking you, was there anything racially said by the suspect? I don't know if it was worded as racial. I remember them saying something. Did you hear anything? Okay. And you told them, no, you had not heard anything that was racial in nature. Isn't that correct? I said, they said, did you hear anything? And I said, I'm not sure. But you didn't tell them you heard anything racial. Correct? Because I wasn't sure at the time, sir.
question. Redirect. Just, yes, Sean. Mr. Shaw, to be clear, your testimony today is based on your recollection and your recollection al alone. Correct. Okay. No one has told you to add any extra phrases or no, things sir. to your testimony. No, sir. That's it. Mr. Oldman is acting like none of, nobody's tired and wants to get out of here. I'm joking. We just wanted to make sure that we were stopping for the evening. Sometimes I tend not to hop the stop. But we are going to recess for this evening. Uh, before we do that, I don't think we have to worry about it. Let me put it this way. If there's any news coverage that you bump into, Please report it to me so I can get me a new staff to start with. <laughs> uh, and secondly, get away from it. Do not pay it any attention. Again, whatever verdict you render in this case has to be based solely on the evidence you hear in this courtroom and the law that applies to the evidence. You cannot allow any outside information to influence you or otherwise uh, become involved in your deliberation process. If anybody should attempt to communicate with you about the trial case, please advise my staff immediately. Uh, they pointed out uh, they're at each end of the hallway where you are, uh, acting as monitors so you can't sneak out like teenagers in the night. Now, did they do a good job last night or did any of you get away? <laughs> Is it taking the Fifth Amendment on that one? <laughs> But in any event, if anything should arise that you need anything from, make sure you come, uh, my staff is there to make sure that you're taken care of and to keep everybody away from you. Must remain open-minded. You can't have any discussions when you go back to the hotel tonight, when you're having dinner, whatever the case may be, about this trial or anything related to this trial. I mean, nothing. Can't talk about the way everybody's dressed or whatever the case may be. Zero communications about anything that's transpired in this courtroom. You must keep your thoughts to yourself, remain open-minded. Then we'll start back again at 8.30 in the morning, or as close there to as possible. All right, anything else from the state? Yeah. Anything from the defense? Yeah. All right, uh, go have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you back here in the morning.